So hey guys welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if Naruto has a dragon bloodline alive Kashina. Part 1. If you guys enjoy this, what if? And if you want to part 2. Comment down below. And let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And also share this video with your friends. And check out the description. And check out my playlist. So let's start the video. Chapter 1. The Return of the True Heir and Reunion October 10th Kikbi Festiva It was dark in the village of Kanoha. The streets were lighting up and the villagers were celebrating the day the Kikbi was defeated. A group of ninja wearing black hooded cloaks with a white dragon on the back of them were walking through the busy streets. Three however had their hoods down revealing their faces. One was a man who was 6-0. He had long brown hair that was tied into a ponytail, deep green eyes, and a tan-like complexion. He also had a scar on his left cheek. He was Joe Hayabusa, the Shiroi Rick, White Dragon, of the Hayabusa village, and leader of the second Dragon Clan branch. He's ranked as an S-class nin with a flea on side order, and was the only ninja capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a yellow flash, and lived to tell about it. The man was calm, wise, loyal, trustworthy, and powerful. Walking beside him was his wife, Shizur Hayabusa, the Kuroi Tenshi, Black Angel, of the Hayabusa village. She was 5'8 and without a doubt the most beautiful woman ever to be seen. She had long flowing black hair that stopped to the middle of her back, deep blue eyes, the face of an angel, and flawless ivory-colored skin that seemed to glow in the moonlight, giving her the appearance of a goddess. Holding her hand was her six-year-old son Ryu Hayabusa. He appeared to be a younger version of his father, only his hair was in a shorter ponytail and had a tan complexion. He was wearing a black ninja guy outfit with a dragon at the location of where his heart is. They were heading to the Hokage Tower to discuss the new treaty. As they passed an alley a scream was heard. Dusan Kasan what was that? Young Ryu asked. Joe looked into the dark alley only to see a mob made up of civilians and shinobi that were in beating on a blonde haired boy who wore a dirty white t-shirt and blue shorts with bats, clubs, beer bottles, and to his shock kunai while screaming kill the demon and avenge the yondame. Shizur's eyes widened in horror when she saw this. What kind of monsters do this to a child? She thought and saw a katana in the air while grinning like a madman. Die kick me bread. He yelled as he started to bring the blade down while everyone cheered. Yokun stops him. She cried. Joe's eyes become slanted and he vanishes and appears between the and the blonde boy who was trying to protect himself with his bleeding arms. Joe then punches the shocked heart in the stomach, breaking a few of his ribs, and sends him flying out of the alley and into an ice cream cart. Shizur orders one of the hooded nin to take Ryu away from this and he nods, taking the young dragon with him while the others deal with the mob. Said mob was backing away while the other hooded dragon nin appeared behind Joe and around the blonde boy with their backs turned at the boy who was whimpering and trembling in fear while having their swords drawn. Shizur then appears in front of the blonde and kneels down. The blonde boy had tears falling from his blue eyes and his lip was quivering. He don't hurt me. Please I I was only hungry and wanted some food. He said. Shizur's eyes soften and she smiles at him. It's okay child, I'm not here to hurt you. She says and her hands glow white and she places them on his small arms. He finches a little from the contact but relaxes while she treats his injuries. Joe watched this from the corner of his eye and smiled. He turns his eyes back to the villagers and releases a huge amount of murderous intent on them. What do you fools think you're doing? He roared while they sweated heavily from the murderous intent this man was releasing. That's when one idiot civilian spoke up. W we were trying to avenge our leader by killing the demon brat. He answered. Joe's eyes narrowed and looked back at the boy. Then he looked at the villagers who were hoping he would understand the reason and kill the boy. Wow what a bunch of fools. I see no demon. All I see are a bunch of short-minded fools. Now leave before I kill you all. He growled in a deep dark voice while they backed away. He but the demon. I said only to have three shuriken enter his skull and hit the ground dead. Joe was the one who threw them and his eyes glowed. I won't tell you again. Leave while you have your limbs intact. He said in a dark tone making them run away. Joe's eyes return to normal once they're gone and he doesn't sense any nin around. The dragon nin that were protecting Shizur and the blonde boy relaxed and sheathed their swords. Shizur just finished healing his legs and asked him to take off his shirt. He was reluctant at first, but he did and a gasp escaped her mouth. Oh my kami. She whispers. The boy was so skinny he could see his bones and ribs outlined. He also had cuts, bruises, burns all over. Joe and the other dragon nin saw this and couldn't help but feel sorry for the poor boy. After treating those injuries, she turns him around to heal his back and notices a red mark that was hidden under his blonde hair. She blinks in confusion and pushes it up and her eyes widened. I don't believe it. Kishina-sama's son has been alive this whole time. But the Sandame said that he died when Minato-kun sealed the Kikbi no Kitsune into him. He lied. That old monkey lied to her. 
When Kashina finds out this village will be done for. She'll see to it personally. Dokun, could you come here please? She asks her husband. Joe nods and walks over to where she and the boy are. He kneels down and looks at the back of his head and his eyes widen in shock. Shai Shizer Chan, that's. He started to say and she nodded while her eyes became cold. That fool lied to her. How could he do this? After all Minato and our clan has done for this village. He told her he died during the sealing. Does he have any idea what he's done? When she finds out that he's alive, Kanoha will be finished. She whispers to him. Joe grunted in agreement. He may be strong, but Kishina was not someone you'd want to have as an enemy or piss off. He then pulls out a scroll and hands it to her. Bet him out of those rags and have him put the clothes that are in this scroll on. He then stands up and looks at the headed ninja. Henji. Ayashi. Shira. He said while well, three of them appeared before him on one knee. They removed their hoods revealing two males and a female. Henji had reddish orange hair that was in a ponytail and violet eyes. Ayashi had shoulder length bluish black hair and gray colored eyes. Shira had violet colored hair and red eyes. Sir. They said in unison. You three are coming with me to the Hokage Tower. The rest of you stay with my wife, son and the boy. If anyone tries to harm the blonde boy, kill them. He commanded while the ones in the hooded cloaks nodded. Let's go. He said to Kenji, Ayashi, and Shira who nodded and they vanished from the alley. Shizer bites her thumb, drawing blood from it, and smears it on the scroll. The seal glows a little and in a puff of smoke, a dark blue guy that was similar to Rai's appeared. She then turns to the blonde child who blinked at her confusingly. Dear young one, put this on. You don't want to get sick now do you? She asks in a soothing tone. The blonde nods and takes off the shorts and puts on the guy. She smiles at him and asks. What is your name, young one? Naruto Yuzumaki, miss. He says and she answers. Shizer Hayabusa. It's a pleasure to meet you, Naruto-kun. She says. Naruto looks down at the ground which causes her to give him a concerned look. Are you okay, Naruto-kun? She asked while Naruto shifted his feet nervously. Why are you being so nice to me? Almost everyone in this village hates me, beats me, or they say I'm a monster who kills innocent people. He said quietly. She frowns but places her hands on his shoulders. You're not a monster, Naruto-kun. These people are just a bunch of fools who can't tell the difference between one and the other. Would you like to meet my son, Ryu? She asks and he nods. Come on then. Let's get out of this dirty alley. She says and gets up. She then holds out her hand to him and he takes it, making her smile as she leads him out of the place and to the village. The hooded ninja follows her from behind. They notice the villagers were glaring at Naruto and calling him a demon brat and that the Hokage should have killed the creature when he was born. The hooded nin twitched their fingers as they heard this. Naruto held Shizer's hand a little tighter. She notices this and sees the looks the villagers were giving him and releases her own murderous intent at them, making the fool stop and tremble at her icy gaze. They then find themselves in the park where Rai was practicing some hand seals the hooded dragon nin was showing him. He saw his mother and the other nin approaching with a blonde nin and ran up to her. Kas and I finally got three seals down. Where's Tusan and who is he? He asked, looking at Naruto with curiosity in his eyes, while said blonde was looking at him nervously. Shizer looks down at her son and smiles. Ryukun, this is Naruto-kun. Naruto-kun is Ryukun, my Sachi. She answers. Ryu holds his hand out for a handshake and smiles. Nice to meet you Naruto. I'm Ryu Hayabusa. He replies. Naruto decides to do the same and shakes Ryu's hand. It's nice to meet you Ryu. He said with a small smile on his face. Shizer couldn't help but smile. They've only met for a few seconds and they're already bonding. She thought while she watched Ryu lead Naruto to a sakura tree and talk. At the Hokage Tower, there is in Saratobi was sitting in his chair doing some paperwork while wondering if Naruto was doing okay. He hated the fact that he had to lie to Kishina about her son, but Naruto was a Jinchuriki of Konoha and the last Namikas, and he had to stay no matter what. It's what Minato would want, can you say retard? He continued to do his paperwork until the door was knocked off its hinges, shocking the professor, and from the other side came Johei Abusa, along with Kenji, Ayashi, and Shira, and the man was not happy. Johei Abusa, what can I do for you? Hiruzen asked while the man's frown grew. You can start by explaining. He said in a low tone. Siratobi raised an eyebrow at the dragon nin. I'm not sure I understand your meaning Jo-san. Explain what? He asked only to feel murderous intent coming from the man. You can explain why the true heir of the Hayabusa is in the village being treated like a dog and why you lied to Kishina-sama about her son being dead. He yelled at the last second while his eyes became slitted and glowed. Hiruzen's eyes widened in shock and a bead of sweat fell from the side of his head. Oh no, how did he find out? I must do something or the village will lose the last Namikas. He thought. I'm afraid I don't know what you're talking about he started to say but was cut off when Joe smashed the desk, leaving an imprint of his fist in it. 
Don't lie to me, old monkey. That boy is Kashina and Minato's son, because he had the mark of a red dragon on him, and he looks just like Minato, if you take away the whisker marks. Do you have any idea what Kashina will do when I tell her the truth about her son? He says making the old man gulp a little. Do you have any idea what the Rick Nin, or Dragon Nin, will do when they find out that their future leader was hidden from them by the very village they've been allies with since the founding, and that he's been beaten near death, they will raise this place to the ground and kill every single person in this village if Kashina-sama doesn't, she'll do it herself. He yelled. Please Joe-san you have to understand, he's the last Namikas in the village, and his father wanted him to be recognized as a hero to the village. I can't just let you take the boy. He's a citizen of Kanoha and falls under the village's jurisdiction. He said hoping this would work, but only made the man more furious. I see. Perhaps I should send a letter to the fire daimyo and Kishina-sama about this and let them solve the problem when they get here. I'm sure you'd love to explain to the ruler of fire country and to one of the most dangerous Kanoichi in the world why Kanoha is going to war with an ally due to the fact that you not only interfered in foreign ninja clan affairs but lied to said clan leader and cage about her child's so-called demise and kept him here to be beaten like a dog. He replied in a deep dark tone that made Suratobi pale and inwardly sweat. We still haven't fully recovered from the Kikbi attack, and the Rek Ninja are well known and feared throughout the elemental nations. They are even hired bodyguards for the daimyo. If they remove their nin from his ranks because of our actions then we'll be finished, but Naruto is the last Namikas of the village, and we can't just give him up. What do I do? He ranted in his mind as he tried to think of an alternative. Seeing no other choice, he sighs in defeat. Very well, Joe-san. I will hand Naruto over to you. He starts to say until Joe interrupts him. And his father's inheritance and as well as the forbidden scroll that Minato created. He said, getting a shocked look from Suratobi. I can't do that Joe-san because. I am well aware of Iwa, but you forget that Minato left everything he owned to Kishina-sama and any children they have, and if you don't then consider our alliance with the Fire Country finished. He replied but was getting to the point where he'll kill Hiruzen who let out another sigh. Fine. Just let me get everything. He then gets up and heads to the Hokage's vault. He returns with three large scrolls, one contained the Namika's clan's currency, the other one contained all they ever created and their fighting style, and the last one was the forbidden scroll of sealing. This is everything Joe-san, is there anything else? He asked. No, you've done enough already. You and this village have caused nothing but trouble and pray that I can convince Kishina-sama not to declare war on Konoha due to the stupidity of the leader and his followers. He said with anger etching off his voice. Saratobi flinched from those words and looked down in shame while Joe and his ninjas left the tower. Hiruzen then looked at the picture frame that held Minato's picture in it. It was like he was glaring at the old man for failing to protect his son. Minato. I'm sorry I couldn't protect Naruto. He thought while looking at the destroyed door and had the secretary send a maintenance worker to fix it. Kanoha Park, Shizer had a smile on her face when she saw Ryu showing Naruto how to perform hand seals which he mimicked. Ryu also told him about the Hayabusa village and that it was a village on the other side of the world. She then saw her husband and his three nin walking towards them with three large scrolls. She walks over to him and looks up at her koi, lover. So how did it go, Joe kun She asked while he smiled at her. It went well with Shizu-chan. Naruto will be coming back with us. He won't have to stay in this godforsaken place ever again. I just hope I can convince Kishina-sama not to destroy Konoha after this. I wouldn't wish her wrath on even my worst enemy. He replied while his brow twitched at the thought of an angry Kishina. Whenever he sees her angry or pissed he ends up seeing the form of the Shinigami hovering over her head and pointing at her victim. Chuser giggled when she saw him shake his head and looked over her shoulder to see Ryu and Naruto doing hand seals and smiles. I see Naruto and Ryu have developed a bond already. He said while his wife looked at the two and nodded. Yes it appears so. Naruto-kun, Ryu-chan, come over here please. She spoke out and the two six-year-olds ran up to her. Naruto-kun is my husband Joe Hayabusa. He's the leader of the Hayabusa clan. She said Naruto looked at the man and bowed. Thank you for saving me Joe-san. He said while the leader smiled and nodded. You are welcome Naruto. He said and paused for a few minutes and asked. Naruto, how would you like to come back with us to the Hayabusa village? He asked a young boy who looked up at the man with a surprised look. You won't have to worry about being treated badly or glared at. Unlike this village, ours doesn't judge a book by its cover. You'll also be able to make friends there as well as hang out with Ryu here as long as you want. So what do you call Naruto Uzumaki? Would you like to join our village and maybe be a ninja for the village? He asked. Naruto just looks at him in shock. He can finally be happy and be in a place where he won't get beaten or glared at. He did have a few after all. He then nods while wiping away his eyes. Joe smiles at him. Okay. We have to leave now. Naruto, is there anything you need to get before we go? Joe asks while Naruto just shakes his head. 
Alright then, let's go everyone. He orders and they nod. Shizer took Naruto and Ryu's hands in hers and they left the village. During the trip back home on the boat, Joe talked to Naruto and told him everything. About his inheritance, how his father Minato Namaka sacrificed his life to seal the fox into him, how the old man lied to his mother, saying that he died during the sealing, and that he was the true heir of the Hayabusa clan, and he had a twin sister who looked like her mother. Naruto was an emotional wreck when he was told this and hated Sarutobi for lying to him whenever he asked about his family and letting those people in Kanoha treat him like trash. Shizer managed to calm the poor boy down and told him that he won't have to go through that anymore. But when he realized that he had a mother and sister he was happy yet worried that she'd reject him. Shizer saw this and said, Naruto-kun I highly doubt Kashina would abandon you even if you're the container for the kickbee. Naruto looked at and nodded but still couldn't help but hope she was right. Then Joe spoke up. What surprises me is why she would attack the village in the first place. Kikbi is normally neutral when it comes to human affairs and she wouldn't attack a village unless said ninja from the village provoked her into attacking or that she was being controlled or she was trying to get rid of an evil threat. Joe replied, getting a shocked look from Naruto. But I thought Kikbi was an evil demon. Naruto said, but Joe shook his head. I'm afraid that's not true Naruto. Kikbi is a spirit of nature. A guardian of the mortal realm and only appears when a great evil threatens the earth. She's also well known to the Rick, Dragon, Ninja, and was around to assist our ancestors in defeating the Dark Dragon, but that's for another time. He answers and sees a massive land from the boat. Ah, it appears we'll be porting soon. He said as the boat headed for a dock. After the ship stopped at the docks, Joe had the three scrolls strapped to his back and moved forward into the forest, with the Dragon Nin flanking him, Shizer, Naruto and Ryu. So, Ryu, what's Hayabusa Village like? The blonde asked while Ryu thought about it and answered. Well for one thing it's big. We don't have a large gate that surrounds it like the other hidden villages do because we're not a hidden village. We also have ninja that are ranked like the ones in the elements. We also use ninjutsu, tojutsu, and but we mostly excel in stealth, espionage, assassination, and interrogation. He said. Wow. So does the village have a ninja academy? Naruto asked and that's when Joe answered. No we don't, Naruto, we prefer to train our ninjas separately, but we do set them up in squads and a leader by their skills, and not through meaningless titles like Rookie of the Year or Kanoichi of the Year or Dead Last, because that is insulting and ruins the way a squad cooperates. We also have a shinobi and civilian council that is separate and not joined. Also the Rickage, Dragon Shadow, who your mother is, has the final say in anything. The answered while well, Naruto nodded. When they entered the village, Naruto couldn't believe what he was seeing. The village was huge. The buildings were larger than the ones in Kanoha, and the streets were filled with civilians and ninja. As they walked through the village, Naruto noticed that when the civilians and shinobi looked at them, they either smiled or bowed. There was not even one glare from them. They also saw shinobi parents training their children in the ninja arts. They continued to walk until they came to a large Japanese castle that was surrounded by compounds. The place was bigger than the tower. On top of the castle was the statue of a red dragon with golden eyes, ruby red scales, a golden underbelly, spines, claws, and horns, and it had its head raised and its maw open, revealing a row of ivory white teeth. It appeared to be roaring at the sky. Naruto said only one thing. Wow. He said looking at the dragon while Joe chuckled. Yes, even now I can't help but be amazed by the appearance of the statue that represents our village. He said as they continued to walk into the compound district. Once they reached the Yuzumaki compound Joe dismissed the dragon nin, while Shizer took Ryu with her to the Hayabusa compound to get some rest. Joe and Naruto approached the door of the Yuzumaki compound, but Naruto was a little nervous and scared. He was going to meet his mother and sister for the first time. Joe looked at Naruto who was fidgeting and placed a hand on the boy's shoulders to calm him down. Relax Naruto. Your mother is a kind person and is respected and loved by everyone in the village. He said softly. Naruto lets out a sigh as Joe opens the slide door and they walk in. The inside was decorated with paintings of dragons and weapons. There were also statues of dragons lined up through the hallways. As they walked through the hallways, they came to a stop at a door that had a red swirl on one side and a dragon on the other. Naruto, get behind me. I want to surprise your mother. He whispered to him. He nods and gets behind him as he knocks on the door carefully. Enter. A voice said that Naruto thought sounded like an angel. Joe then opens the door and enters the room with Naruto behind him. It appeared to be a meditation room since it was plain, but did have plant life and a small water fountain in it. In the middle of the room was a woman who seemed to be 5'8". She had long flowing red hair, ivory-colored skin, and the figure of a goddess. She was wearing a crimson-colored ninja training guy with a coiling golden dragon on the back. She was sitting in a lotus position with her back turned to Joe. Kishina-sama. Joe said with a bow making the woman sigh. Joe, how many times do I have to tell you to only call me that during meetings? She asks without looking at him while he chuckles. 
old habits die hard Kashina. He says with a smile, but then gets serious. Kashina, I have some very important news to tell you, and it's regarding your son. He said, causing Kashina's eyes to open up instantly. She then gets up and looks at Joe with a serious look. Joe, we both know that my Sachi died along with Minato Koi, so why would you bring this subject up knowing how I feel about it? She asks with eyes full of sorrow. Because he didn't die with his father, Kashina. Saratobi lied to you, and he's been living in that village for the last six years. He answered, saying village with venom in his voice. Kashina's eyes were wide and her mouth was open, but no words came out of it. I took him out of the village and also got the clan scrolls that belonged to Minato, including the one that contains the Horatian and the forbidden scroll that he created. He says pulling the three scrolls from his back and placing them on the floor. Your son is right behind me too. Come on out Naruto. He said a six-year-old blonde who looked like a miniature version of Minato, walked out in front of Joe and looked up at his mother. Kashina looked down at Naruto, while her eyes became moist and tears formed in her eyes. And Naruto-chan. She replied while Naruto smiled at her and walked up to Kashina grabbing her hand. Hasan. Was all he could say because she scooped him up in her arms and hugged him to her body while sobbing uncontrollably. And my baby, my baby's still alive. I'm so sorry Naruto-chan. I'm so sorry for not looking for you. Please forgive me she said as she held even closer. Naruto wrapped his arms around his mother's neck and laid his head on her chest while he cried silently. Kashina was crying tears of joy muttering my baby over and over. Yo smiled at the scene and left Kashina and her son alone so that they could catch up. After that little scene, Kashina wipes her tears away with her arm and takes a good look at her son. You look just like your father, Neri-chan. She said while Naruto blushed and then looked at her. Ah-san, Joe-san said that the Kikbi was sealed into me by Tu-san, but told me that he wasn't an evil demon. Why did he attack Konoha then? Naruto asked. He asked while Kishina frowned and thought about it. Honestly Sachi, I don't know. Kikbi is a spirit of nature and wouldn't attack the village unless he had a reason to. So tell me how was your life in Konoha for the last six years? She asked but noticed the frown on his face, and he started to tell her everything. How the adults would beat him on his birthday and make their children stay away from him, how he had to eat out of garbage cans and only eat at a raiment stand, and that he was overcharged for clothes and food, and that he was kicked out of the orphanage when he was four. The say Kashina was pissed would be an understatement. She was beyond livid or pissed. Her eyes went from blue to a golden yellowish orange color, with a tint of red on them, and her pupils became slitted. She growled, baring her teeth, and the top ones extended into fangs. Those bastards. I'll kill them. I'll raise that damn village to the ground and rip Siratobi apart with my bare hands. The rickage said in a dark tone that'll make Arachimaru run away crying like a little girl. Naruto noticed this and placed a hand on her cheek to try and calm her down. Don't let them get to you Kasan. They're not worth it. They didn't honor you fan's dying wish. Naruto said which caused Kashina to calm down and her eyes and teeth returned to normal and looked down at her son who smiled at her she does the same but sighs. You're right Nirichan they're not. I'm sorry if I scared you. She said while she sat down Indian style with her son on her lap. Scared me? That was cool what you did. Will I be able to do that? He asked with a huge smile on his face. Kashina couldn't help but laugh at her son. Yeah you will once you activate our family's Keke Genkai, bloodline limit. She said getting a confused look from her son. Heka what? He asked while she had to hold in a laugh by biting her lower lip as Naruto blinked a few times and tilted his head to the left. Hawaii. He looked so cute when he's confused. She squealed in her mind as a chibi form of her jumped up and down squealing. Kashina was about to say something, but the door opened and a six-year-old girl with red hair and an ivory complexion like her mother walked in. She also had blue eyes and wore a red guy like her mother's. She saw her mother holding a blonde boy in her arms and blinked in confusion. Kasan, who is that boy you're holding? The Redita girl asked. Kashina and Naruto looked at her and Naruto's eyes widened. That was his twin sister and she looked just like Kashina. Kashina smiled and motioned for her to come over, and she did while staring at the blonde boy. Tsuki-chan, this is Naruto, your twin brother. He's been alive this whole time and was brought back by Joe. She replied. Tsuki's eyes went wide when she saw her brother who was rubbing the back of his head nervously. She went from shock to having a huge grin on her face. Naruto Nai. She squealed and tackled her brother and mother to the ground. Kashina managed to get back up only to see Tsuki hugging or squeezing her older twin, who went from his tan color to blue. And Ni Chan. I can't breathe. He struggled to say while Kashina giggled and then laughed at her children. Chapter 2. Dragons, Foxes, and Training. The sun's rays shined down on Naruto's face, which caused him to squint a few times. He turned in his bed and blinked a few times before opening his eyes. He woke up to see that he was in a large room that had different kinds of things in it. 
There were some pictures of his mother and father when they got married and some where they were teenagers. There were some of his mother and her side of the family in Whirlpool before it was destroyed, even Kano had dishonored the Uzumaki clan. On the walls were paintings of different colored dragons, each shooting different colored fire or another element. There were also statues of golden dragons lining up the walls. He also had toys and plastic weapons like shuriken, kunai, and ninjutens that were in a black wooden box, and next to his bed was a small dresser drawer that had a stuffed red dragon on it. Naruto started to rub the sleep out of his eyes and went to his closet. It was in a sense huge, having not only training GI and sandals, but other things like different colored shirts, shorts, pants and shoes he's never seen before. Wow. I can't believe that this is all my stuff. He said admitted until he was tackled to the by a red blur. They both tumble on the ground for a while until they finally come to a stop with Tsuki sitting on top of Naruto, grinning. She then got up and started to hug the life out of her twin brother. Morning Naruto Nai. She said while Naruto was struggling to breathe. See can't breath, Tsuki-chan. He said trying to get out of her vice grip. Tsuki lets go while Naruto gains his breath back. He, sorry Nai-san. I'm just happy to have my big brother with me. She said and hugs Naruto normally who smiles and returns the hug. Is Kasan still asleep? Naruto asked Tsuki who she nodded. Mom, let's go wake her up. She grabs Naruto's arm and leads him out of the room into Kashina's. Kashina was in her room sleeping when Naruto and Tsuki sneak in quietly. Tsuki told Naruto to go to the other side while she went to the other. She sees her mother who was snoring quietly while drool was hanging out of her mouth. And. Lol. No wonder where Naruto didn't sleep properly because of the snoring. Well, maybe. Tsuki put her hand over her mouth to hold in a giggle. She then climbs the bed as does Naruto. They look at each other and grin. They both breathe air into their lungs and pause for a while and then yell out. Ha-san. Hashina instantly bolts up with her eyes open wide and screams. As she blinks for a while and looks down to see her son and daughter grinning at her. She then smiles at them and pulls them onto her lap. How are my Kodomo children doing this morning? She asked. Fine. They replied at the same time while she kissed them both on the forehead. She then looks at the clock and sighs. It was 10.30 a.m. So she gets up with her children in her arms. Come on you two. Once we ate breakfast. I'm gonna take you two over to Shizzers because I have a busy schedule today. She says while walking out the room with them. Asan, are you the cage of this village? Naruto asks her and she nods. Yes I am. I'm the god Aim Rikage, fifth dragon shadow. She answered and Naruto's mouth was opened. So you and Tusan were cages. That is so cool. He exclaimed with a grin on his face while Tsuki grins too. Yes, it is cool, but it's also a very tough job. I'm not only in charge of the ninja of our village, but I'm also in charge of how things operate in our village. Kishina replied with an explanation, but then cried inwardly. Not to mention all that paperwork. How did Minamoto-kun get it done so fast? Then her chibi form ran crying and I'm tears while doing mountain loads of paperwork. Meanwhile Kishina's eyebrow twitched, but it was noticed by Tsuki who giggled. Naruto saw this and asked. What's so funny, Tsuki-chan? He asked his Amado with wonder, while his sister pointed to Kishina. Ah-san's eyebrow was twitching, meaning she's going nuts about paperwork, but doesn't show it. Tsuki explained while Naruto blinks. Is it that bad? Naruto asked while Tsuki's grin grew about their mother's or cage's worst nightmare, an arch nemesis of all cages. She almost killed Joe Oji, uncle, when he accidentally slammed the door, causing all the paperwork that she finished to scatter all over her office, and it took 15 Anbu to restrain her. She answered while Kishina blushed in embarrassment. If only I can find one that finishes the paperwork. Kishina mumbles while Naruto rubs her back. Don't worry, Kasan. I'll help you to find a way to get rid of that evil paperwork. Naruto says while he puffs his chest out getting a light laugh from his mom. If you do that for me, then I'll be forever in your debt she said, kissing the top of his head. Ha-san. Naruto whined while she and Tsuki laughed at him. So once they had breakfast, they got changed and Kishina, Naruto, and Tsuki were heading for the Hayabusa compound. Naruto wore a dark blue long-sleeved kimono and Hakama pants that had white dragons and white flames licking the bottom of the pants and the sleeves. He also wore dark blue socks and black sandals. Tsuki was wearing a red kimono with sakura petals and blue birds on them. She also wore white socks and red sandals. Kishina was wearing her cage robes which were white and black and wore a cage hat that was also black and white and had the kanji, dragon, on the front under them, she wore a red and black ninja outfit with arm guards and a black collared flak jacket with black sandals. She was wearing the cage hat on her head so that the sun wouldn't get in her eyes and she was holding both her son and daughter's hands while being flanked by four anbu who were wearing dragon masks with markings on them but the markings were different colors. The captain wore a hooded white cloak that had a black dragon on the back, while the subordinates wore black cloaks with white dragons on them. 
Under the cloaks they wore dark blue uniforms and strapped to their backs were katanas. As they walked through the village, Naruto saw the civilians and shinobi either smiling or bowing to Kishina and her children when they walked by. Kishina smiled and waved at the civilians and shinobi as did Tsuki and Naruto. Naruto knew they respected him and his family because of their clan and their mother being the cage, but he wanted to earn their respect just like his mother and father did. When they reached the compound, guarding the gates were two ninja wearing masks that covered half of their faces, black shirts and pants, dark blue collared flak jackets, and black headbands with the symbol of a dragon on them. They noticed Kashina, her children, and the dragon Anbu coming towards the compound. When they stopped at the gate the two guards bowed. Greetings Rikage sama what brings you to the Hayabusa compound? One guard asked while she smiled. You may raise your heads, Jinins. I'm just here to drop my children off since I'll be really busy today. Is Shizur and Ryu-chan here? She asked while they raised their heads. Yes, they are here. Joe-sama already left for the meeting you called. You also said children, Rikage sama I could have sworn you had only Tsuki-san. The second guard asks while Kishina sighed about it. To make a long story short, I just found out that my son was still alive for the last six years. Everything else will be explained at the meeting. Kishina answered while the guards looked at Naruto for a while and then back at Kishina. We understand Rikage sama Would you like for us to escort your children into the compound? The first guard asked for a nod from their leader. Yes, I must be going now. The Rikage sat and kneeled down to hug her children. Stay on your best behavior, you two. I'll see you both later. Naruto and Tsuki hug her back. Okay Ka-san, come on Naruto Nai. Tsuki said and led Naruto past the gate and towards the compound while one of the guards walked behind them. Ashina got back up and then looked at the Anbu. Let's go. She said in an authority tone while they nod and the five of them shunched into the dragon tower. Meanwhile, the guard escorted them into the compound which was similar to theirs but was a little smaller. As they walked through the compound, they saw Shizur teaching Ryu some new hand seals and how to chant incantations. The guard did a small cough getting their attention and they saw Naruto and Tsuki grinning. Shizur motions the guard to leave who nods and shushions away. Tsuki runs over to Shizur and hugs her while she smiles and returns it. Hi Shizur Abison. Tsuki greets while the woman laughs lightly as they release each other. Hello Tsuki-chan. She greets back and notices Naruto who looked nervous, making her smile grow. Don't be shy Naruto-kun, come give me a hug. She insisted in a sweet tone. Naruto walks over to her with a small blush on his face, and she gives him a hug. Tsuki sees Ryu who had a small blush on his face, ran over to Ryu and hugged him, making the young dragon turn red from the contact. Shizu releases Naruto who was smiling at her, and she looks over to see Ryu red from Tsuki's hug. A.W. How cute, Ryu's already formed a crush on Tsuki. I can't wait till he's older. The teasing that I'll do to him and her will be priceless. She thought while Naruto saw this and asked. Ano sa, Shizu Abasan, why is Ryu red? Is he sick or something? Shizur looks at the confused look on his face and couldn't help but sigh inwardly. Just like his father, as well as with Kishina. Ryu's fine Naruto. He's just a little embarrassed from the hug Tsuki-chan gave him. She answered while Naruto looked at Tsuki who was leading Ryu out their backyard by the hand while Ryu was redder than a tomato. So, he's shy. Naruto asked as they went to join them while Shizur nodded. You could say that, now let's go join your sister and Ryu. Shizur replies. Dragon Tower Council Chambers. Ashina was now sitting in a chair in the council chamber. On her right was Joe Hayabusa, and on her left was the Captain Commander, Smtachin, of the Dragon Anbu, Arashi Kazama. He was 5'11 and wore his mask on the side of his face revealing his face. His eyes were light grey, and he had jet black hair that stopped to his shoulders. There were also the elders who gave Kishina suggestive advice, and the shinobi and civilian council. Rikijama, is there a reason why you summoned us here? One of the elders asked. Kishina looks at him and nods. Yes there is, and the reason why I summoned you all here is because the true heir of the dragon clan has returned. She answered with shocked looks from all of them when one of the civilians spoke up. Pardon me for saying this Rikage sama But I thought your daughter was the true heir. The civilian merchant asked and Joe spoke up. That would have been the case however, when me and my group went to Kanoha to get more supplies, we found her firstborn being beaten by civilians and shinobi. He answered. Kishina had to suppress the murderous intent she wanted to release after hearing that while the members of the council's eyes widened. Would you be so kind as to start from the beginning, Joe-san? A shinobi member asked and he did. After hearing the story to say they were pissed would be an understatement. That was when one of the shinobi members spoke up. Those bastards. How dare they. Yeah. Who does that fool of a cage think he is lying to our leader about her son's so-called demise? Lying to a cage, interfering in a foreign clan's affairs, and denying the boy his true inheritance, those actions are considered acts of war. After all the things our village has done to help them, they do this something must be done, and they must pay for this. Another elder yelled out. 
This kept on for 10 more minutes until Kashina slammed her fist into the desk. Silence. She roared and they went quiet. She then breathes out a sigh and starts talking. I understand how you all feel. Believe me when I say that I too am pissed at what Kanoha has done to my family, and I assure you Kanoha will pay for their actions. She stated, before continuing. But the question is how. I will leave that up to you because right now, I am tempted to go to that village personally and raise it to the ground. As her eyes flashed a golden yellow color which made everyone in the tower including the hidden Anbu shivered. That's when one of the business members spoke up. I suggest we punish them financially by increasing the amount of exports and technology we send to them and the other villages in the fire country and double their profits. He said while tilting his glasses up with his index finger. Kashina nodded at his request and looked around. Anyone else have suggestions? She asked and a shinobi member who was a Kanoichi spoke up. The high-ranking missions they trade for ours should be temporarily null and voided until you decide to drop it. The same with the bodyguards for the fire daimyo stating that he can only request a minimum amount of our ninja, and if he asks tell him to have Kanoha explain. I'm sure they would be more than happy to explain why half of his bodyguards are being sent back to us, and I'm positive our daimyo would agree to your reasons, since you two are good friends Rikijsama, and will demand why Kanoha lied to you about your son. She replied with a sick smile on her face. Another shinobi member looked at her with wide eyes. Akira, that is so evil and underhanded. I like it. He said with a grin on his face, and she rubbed her nose with her finger. Thanks Kaiser. Akira replied while a dark smile appeared on Kashina's face. I like that idea too, Akira-san. Kashina says and that's when another elder spoke up. If I may ask, Kashina-sama. Since your son is one of the few survivors in your family's clan and has the dragon bloodline, wouldn't he fall under the village's CRA? He asked before continuing with an explanation. I mean, it's a fact that you can't have any more children due to the fact that you had some complications when giving birth to your daughter and son. Well Kishina looks at him. We're not trying to force him into any marriages or anything like that, but since he is the only male in the village who possesses the true dragon bloodline, he falls under that law. No one will interfere with who he wants in the clan. I only request that he has at least three or more future wives before he turns 18. How does that sound? The elder asked insisted. Ashina looks around the room and lets out a sigh and replies. Fine, I will agree with this, but Naruto gets to choose his own wives. How does that sound? Kishina asks and gets a nod from them. Before she adds in her finishing sentence. But I did find one. Before Neri-chan told me about her. All the council was curious, as one of them spoke. So. Who is she? Well. A daughter of a friend of mine in Kanoha. Kishina answered, which surprised the council. Boo. Ashina smiled for the answer. She is the first friend Neri-chan made. Before her mother took her away from him for protection before I told him. And we even keep in touch to make sure. Until Joe was shocked and surprised he started to remember the conversation. Kashina sama You mean. Are you talking about. Yup. She is. Kashina replied and smiled more. So during the rest of the meeting they discussed about the Kikbi who was sealed inside her son and why she attacked Kanoha. After that, Kishina had an ambassador along with five Anbu sent to Kanoha to deal with the trade and business deals and inform the dragon daimyo about her son still being alive and what Kanoha has done to him. Needless to say the man was not happy and said that he would be informing the fire daimyo about this and sending back most of the dragon nin he hired as bodyguards and back into the Hayabusa village ninja's ranks to teach the country a lesson on what happens when they mess with the dragon lord's family. Naruto got a chance to visit the man and his family, and the daimyo couldn't help but be impressed with Naruto's strong will. He would definitely become a great dragon ninja in the future. Uzumaki compound, it was night and Naruto was currently in his bed asleep. Naruto felt a small pull into his mind and found himself in front of a large cage, which had a paper on it that said seal. Naruto walked up to it and when he was close enough he heard an angelic voice. Hello Kit. The voice said which made Naruto freak out. Hey Kikbi. The blonde Namikaze asks and sees a pair of red slitted eyes appear from the other side of the cage. When the figure revealed itself Naruto couldn't help but blush at the sight. She was 5'8 and wore a red kimono that hugged her hergless figure and had flawless ivory skin that gave her the appearance of a goddess. She wore ruby red lipstick on her lips and her hair was crimson and stopped to her mid-back. Anines jutted from her upper lip and she wore ruby red nail polish on her nails and toenails. What really shocked him was the fox ears on her head and nine red tails that swayed behind her. Naruto just walked closer to her and looked up at her angelic face. She looked down at him and couldn't help but see how cute he was. She knelt down to meet his eye level and smiled. Hello Kit. We finally met. I'm sorry if I haven't contacted you sooner, but I had just woken up after being sealed into you and I saw what your life was like for the past six years and I have to say that I'm sorry for what has happened to you. No one should have to suffer like you did and I hope that you can forgive me. 
she said in a downcast voice. Naruto looked at her and saw the sorrow she had in her eyes. He reaches his hands out at the cage and grabs her right hand. She looks up at him with a surprised expression on her face as he rubs his hands into hers. It's okay Kayu. I know you must have had a reason for attacking the village and I know you're not a bloodthirsty demon who destroys everything. He said while she pulls him into the cage and hugs him. Thanks kid, but you call me Kurumi and yes I did have a reason for attacking your village. You see I sensed an evil presence that was very powerful. I don't exactly know its true location, but while I was searching for it, a man wearing an orange mask and a cloak with red clouds on it used the power of his eyes, which were red with three tomatoes on it, to cast a powerful on me, which caused me to go berserk and attack the closest thing that was in my sight. That was your village your former village. Your father the fourth Hokage used the Shikifkin, Dead Reaper seal, on me and sealed me into you. I've been in a deep sleep for the past six years and woke up when I felt my yaokai healing your body. She explained while Naruto digested the information into his brain. I see. Say, Ka-san said that I had a bloodline based on the dragons. What does that mean? He asked. Kaiubi thought about it for a while and then looked at him. Well kid that is true, but it won't activate until you turn 7. You have three forms of this bloodline, body, chakra. When you gain all three forms you'll be half human and half dragon, meaning your speed, strength, stamina, five senses, and intellect will increase when you get older and you stop aging at the age of 20. I'll explain the rest when you're older. Now off you go kid, you have to get some sleep. She says and he is pushed out of his mind. Naruto smiles and snuggles into his pillow. Good night Karami Naijin. He whispers to himself and hears a good night kid from the fox. The next day Naruto was eating bacon, eggs, and pancakes with his mother and sister. They kept eating until Naruto spoke up. Hey Ka-san. Yes Sachi what is it? Kishina asked. I just talked to Kikbi last night. The blonde answers and she looks up at him. Really? What did you talk about? She asked curiously and listened to her son explain everything. After that, she stopped eating and had a thoughtful expression on her face. I see. So, she was searching for an evil presence that was somewhere near Konoha, but ended up being put into a position by a masked man wearing a cloak with red clouds on them and had red eyes with three spinning tomatoes in them. Sounds like the Sharingan, copy we lie. It figures that the Ichiha clan would be behind this. She thought while Tsuki and Naruto looked at her and she looked back at them. Listen up you two. I'll be training you after breakfast, Joe and Rai will be joining us. Kishina said while the servants came and removed the dishes from the table. Then she gets up and they follow her to the training dojo. She goes into a closet and pulls out two training guys. One was red while the other was dark blue. She hands the red one to Tsuki and the other to Naruto is dark blue. Go and put those on and meet me outside the compound. She said while they left the dojo. Naruto and Tsuki were out of the compound to see Kashina wearing her red training guy, Joe was wearing a white guy, and Rai was wearing black. Alright, now that Naruto and Tsuki are here we'll start out by doing 5 laps around the village, and after that we'll take a 5 minute break for water. Once we're done with it we'll go to the wilderness and practice on stealth and hand to hand combat. You'll be learning the katas from our clan's fighting style. Naruto I'll help you with them since Tsuki already knows most of them. She said, getting a nod from her son. When we do that for two hours, we'll take a lunch break which will consist of vegetables, fruit, and meat. Next, we'll be doing weapons training and chakra control. You'll learn how to climb trees without using your hands, water walking, and kunai balancing. Once that is finished we'll head back to the compound and you'll start on your studies, meaning you'll be learning geography, maths, science, and history. By next year, you'll be learning the basics of human anatomy, how to make your own medicines with herbs and other plants, and you'll be doing some survival training afterwards. She says and pulls a scroll out of her guy and unrolls it. And unseal a pair of ankle and arm weights via poof in front of Ryu, Tsuki and Naruto. Put those on and keep them on so that you can get used to the weight. Kishina orders and they do that. Okay are you all ready? They nod for understanding. Good. Naruto sticks with Ryu and Tsuki since they know their way around the village. Hi Kasan. Naruto says and they run off with Ryu taking the lead. The sun was rising over the mountain, and Naruto, Ryu, and Tsuki were returning back to the compound with a sweaty Naruto carrying a panting Tsuki on his back. Ashina saw this and ran up to her children, while Joe approached Ryu, whose guy was soaked in sweat. Joe gave him a white towel and a glass of water which Ryu took and gulped down, and then took the towel and wiped the sweat and dirt off his face and hair. Are you okay, Tsuki-chan? Kishina asks as she removes her daughter from Naruto's back and sets her down and gives her a glass of water. Tsuki nods and gulps the cool liquid down. Kishina then gives Naruto one, and he drinks it also. After the five-minute break, Kishina takes Naruto to one of the sparring mats, while Joe takes Ryu and Tsuki to the other sparring mat. Okay Sachi, this is a fighting style that's been in our clan since the founding of the villages. 
It's an ancient and powerful style that only the Yuzumaki and the Hayabusa clan can use. It is called the Tenkan no Ryuji and apostrophe Heavenly Fist of the Dragon God. Kishina began to explain. The Tenkan no Raijin has four forms. The first form is based on evasion and counter-attacking. It's basically a defensive style where you use your opponent's strength against them and is used to disable and not kill. Grapple and submission holds are used in it, as well as palm strikes. High-level reflexes and senses are needed for it to work. We also call it the Hishmarek, Soaring Dragon. The second form is based on breaking the opponent's bones and causing external damage. Power and speed are needed for it to work, and it too disables but rarely kills unless you go for the neck bone, nose cartilage, skull, or backbone which is also the spinal cord. The knees, elbows, fists, and feet are used in this form, and it's called the Kabatsu Ryu, Striking Dragon. The third one is the most deadly form of the Tenkan no Ryujin. It's an assassination form that is based on killing the opponents by striking any of the eight vital parts of the human body. They are the lungs, liver, jugular vein, clavicle vein, brain, kidneys, spinal cord, and heart. It can cause both internal and external damage to the person and also shatter bone and destroy internal organs in an instant. It's called the Satsujin no Ryu, murderous dragon. The final and most powerful form is called Daigurin no Ryujin, great crimson lotus of the dragon god. It is a combination of the first three forms put into one, and only someone who has mastered every form can use it. She finished explaining. Have you mastered every form, Kasan? Naruto asked while she nodded. Yes I have. I was 18 by the time I fully mastered it. She said getting an awful look from her son. Now we'll begin with the Hishu Ryu and Kibatsu Ryu. I want you to mock my form and movements. She said and performed the katas for the Hishu Ryu. Naruto watches and copies her movements. Remember Sachi. This is a push and pull style. Keep your muscles relaxed and your senses calm and your breathing steady. You want your movements and energy to flow when you're fighting. She says while pulling her arms and fists back and then pushing them forward into a double palm strike and Naruto does the same. Like a river? He asked while his mother nodded. Yes, Sachi, like a river. Now I'm gonna make my movements a little faster and I want you to try to keep up. She says getting a nod from her son and they increase the speed of their movements. Kishina however couldn't help but be impressed with how fast her son was improving. Incredible. He's only seen the first form for only a couple of seconds and he already understands its principles. It took Suki two days to understand it. If only you were here Minato-kun. You'd be proud of both of your children. She felt impressed about her son's great knowledge. Suki, Ryu, and Joe were watching this and couldn't help but be amazed. Suki was happy but was a little jealous of her brother. He understands it in only a few seconds while it took me two days. She comments with a pout while Joe chuckles. No need to be jealous, Suki-chan. It's probably his way of learning. The white dragon replies while Ryu nods. I agreed, even though it took me four days to understand the first form. Ryu said jokingly while Tsuki playfully punched him in the shoulder. Quiet you. She says while he rubs his shoulder. They trained like this for the rest of the week and Naruto started to improve until he was at Tsuki's and Ryu's level and started to spar with them. Ishina was very proud of how well they were progressing and couldn't help but think about how strong they will become when they're older. Only time will tell. Chapter 3. The Awakening The Blood of the Dragon Two years have passed since Naruto reunited with his mother and twin sister. He's also become good friends with Ryu. They would always talk about being the strongest ninja in their village and would practice their katas in the Yuzumaki Dojo. Kishina helps Naruto improve on his writing, mass, geography, and history. They knew both tree walking and water walking and were also good with kunai and shuriken and knew a few C rank that Kishina and Joe taught them. They also learned the basic sword katas for the Haiden Mitsurugi and learned the basic forms of the Tenkan no Ryujin. They're also learning archery and how to use other weapons like the bow staff, kusurigama, scythe, and other weapons. And. I will update Haiden Mitsurugi from one of my favorite stories. Right now the three were in the backyard practicing their shuriken and kunai throwing on a dummy who was the target. Gil was watching their progress while Kishina was at the tower working on some paperwork. When word got out to the villagers that Kishina's son was still alive and how he was treated in Kanoha, they were furious and demanded retribution from Kanoha. Some even wanted to declare war on the village of Kanoha, but Kishina informed them that Kanoha will be paying for their actions and that she and the daimyo will be dealing with this. While Joe was watching this an Anbu with a black dragon mask appeared kneeling behind the man. What is Anbu? Joe asked and the Anbu looked up. Sir, the Rickage sent me here to tell you that A.M. San and her daughters are here. Also Shizer Sen has brought over Kariha and Mamiji. He says and Joe looks over his shoulder at him. Let them in. He approved getting a high from the Anbu who shunshins away. Tsuki decided to take a small break while watching Ryu and Naruto continue to throw kunai and shuriken at the practice dummy. They then ran out of shuriken to throw and looked at the dummy. 
Looks like we're tied again, Ryu. Naruto said and Ryu nodded. Seeing the results that all targets were tied. It seems so. Ryu answers while they pull their throwing weapons out of the dummy. Tsuki sighed to see her brother and Ryu for the challenge and got up. After all, it seems their accuracy is 100% or less of hitting the target. Are you two done showing off? She asked with an annoyed tone, while the two ninja and training rubbed the back of their heads sheepishly, while Tsuki had her arms folded and was tapping her foot on the ground. Yes, we're done Tsuki, so you can stop complaining. Naruto said in a whiny tone and had to move sideways from a punch he tried to deliver to the side of his head and he tripped her foot, making her stumble and hit the ground. Tsuki got up and rubbed her nose and glared at Naruto who gave her a raspberry and a tick mark appeared on her face. She was about to charge until Ryu had her in a full Nelson or strangle and kept her from trying to attack Naruto who was making faces at her. I'm gonna kick your butt, Nai-san. Tsuki exclaimed while her legs flailed in the air. Ryu was struggling to keep her at bay until he saw a wasp which landed on his nose and he turned pale. Ah. A wasp. I hate wasps. He cried out and released Tsuki while running around, waving his arms and hands around frantically while the wasp got off his nose and flew away. Tsuki realized she was free and grinned evilly at her brother who was now sweating bullets. She then started to crack her knuckles which caused Naruto to take a few steps back. And then he bolted off with Tsuki on his tail. Come back here Naruto. And take your beating like a man. She yelled while Naruto yelled back. I'm only eight, you dumb redeed. What? I'm gonna get you. For that I'm gonna knock you into next week. She cried out while Ryu was watching the yellow and red blur run around the practice field, sighing. Joe who was watching sweat dropped at the scene. They're definitely Kashina's kids, alright. He mumbled and then saw Naruto who was dodging her wild punches and kicks while grinning at her. Hold still Baka, so I can hit you. She screamed out while Ryu sighed. At times like these, I'm glad that I'm an only child. He mumbles to himself. Tsuki tried to punch Naruto again, but he vanished, shocking her and appearing behind her. Before she could do anything, Naruto started to tickle her sides, causing her to cry out in laughter. Ahahahaha. <laughs> Nai sent stop. Hahahaha <laughs> I haha give haha up. She cried out while she continued to laugh. Naruto stopped so that she could breathe and glared at Naruto who just smiled at her, and she ruffled his hair. Tsuki, don't do that. He cried while she grins. That's for calling me a dumb redeed. You do know the Ka-san is a redeed too, right? She asked with reason and made Naruto pale and laugh nervously. While that was happening, five figures appeared from the back of the compound. They were Aam, Shizer, Aan, Kariha, and Mamiji. Aan was an eight-year-old girl with purple hair that stopped near her neck and also had ruby red eyes. She was also wearing a purple ninja guy with butterflies on them. Kariha was ten years old. She had black hair that was tied into a ponytail, brown eyes, and wore what looked like a white and red shrine maiden outfit. Lamiji was eight and also had long black hair that was tied into a ponytail which started on the top of her head. She had clear hazel brown eyes and wore a white and red ninja guy. Am was wearing a white and blue kimono and had long brown hair and light ruby eyes. Shizer was holding both Mamiji's and Kariha's hands while Leanne was holding her mother's hand as they approached the heirs and heiress. Dokun. Shizer calls out. The white dragon turns around to see Shizer with the other females walking towards them. Naruto, Tsuki, and Rai make their way towards Joe and the others and stop next to the man. Tsuki sees Mamiji and Kariha and waves while they do the same. Aan was hiding behind Am who was sighing. Hi Tsuki. Mamiji says but then notices the blonde and asks. Who's that Tsuki? That blinks Tsuki about her question and looks at her brother and shrugs. Oh, it's just my baka of a brother. She says while well, Naruto faces faults and then gets up glaring at him. Both sisters' eyes widen when they see the blonde who just laughs nervously and walks towards them. Um, hi. I'm Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. He greeted the men they bowed their heads before the true heir of the Heibusa clan. Naruto blinks at the men then speaks up. Uh, you two don't have to bow to me. They then look up at Naruto with shocked expressions on their faces. B but Naruto-sama, you're the true heir to the Heibusa clan. It would be disrespectful of us to not Kariha insisted only for Naruto to interrupt her. Ma, ma. You don't have to be so formal. I'm just a kid like you two are. And to me, respect is earned, not given. He says while placing both his arms behind his head. The girls just stare at him when he says those words. Aside from that I would like us to be friends. Naruto said grinning while their faces return to normal and they smile at Naruto, who holds his hands out for them to shake which they did. A tint of pink appeared on Mamiji's face though. After shaking their hands, the sisters went to go talk with Ryu and Tsuki. Shizer walks over to Joe and kisses him on the cheek. Ryu sticks his tongue out in disgust and turns his head away from them. Naruto looks at the other woman who smiles at him as he walks over to her and bows. Hello. I'm Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. Am bows back and speaks. Hello Naruto-kun, I'm Am Tenshin. 
Naruto smiles back, but then notices a tint of purple hair peeking out and then hides behind AM again. Eh? Naruto said as he leaned over to the right. AM notices this and giggles. Oh, where is my manners? I haven't introduced you to my daughter. Come on out Ayan chan There's no need to be afraid. She said with a calming and soothing tone. The girl then walks around slowly and appears in Naruto's line of vision. I'm sorry, Naruto-kun. Ayan chan is just a little shy. She said while Naruto nodded at her. He approaches the timid girl and holds his hand out. Hi Ayan chan Want to be friends? Naruto asks and she looks up at his grinning face and a small smile appears on her face. Sure. She says in an almost quiet tone. When she takes his hand he takes her towards the others. Am saw this and she was happy that her daughter made a friend but was sad due to the fact that she was treated like a plague in the Mugen Tension village and everyone there kept their children away from her. The only two in the clan that associated with her, other than Am, were Heiade and Kasumi. Breakage Tower, Ashina was currently sitting with the daimyo of Dragon Country, with two of his samurai guards flanking his left and right side. The man was by no means a weak-looking, somewhat angular face and phenomenally developed physique. He had a build that would make any warrior proud, and he also wore a blue battle kimono with arm guards on his forearms. He wore a floor-length, white cloak with a red collar on it, black pants with European-styled boots, and he also had long black hair that was tied into a ponytail. Aiko Sajuro Shi from Murani Kenshin or Samurai X. Welcome to the Heiabusa village, Sajuro sama I've prayed you had a safe trip here. She asked while the man nodded to her question. Yes it was, Kishina-san. Now on to business. You stated in the letter your Anbu sent me that an important situation came up in the village. He said mature while she nodded back. Hi. Do you remember when I got married to Minato Namikaze, who was the former Hokage of Kanahagakur, and we were going to have twins? Kishina asks, getting a nod from the man. About the marriage years ago. Yes. I was there to witness the marriage between you two, why? Sajura wondered. Ashina sips a cup of green tea and continues. Well you see sir, when I was preparing to give birth with twins, both of them, on the other hand the village was attacked by the Kikbi no Yoko. She finished while the man's eyes widened. Why would one of the guardians of nature attack the village? Did Kanoha do something to provoke the fox? Sajuro asks and she sighs. That's what I wanted to know. Apparently, she was in Hai no Kuni searching for an evil presence that worried even her. When she was doing that, a man wearing an orange swirl mask and black cloak with red clouds caught her off guard and cast a powerful blow on her, using an eye that I believe was the Sharingan. She paused for a moment so that he could absorb the information and spoke up again. Apparently whoever did that was a member of the Achiha clan, since only they have eyes like that. It resulted in her going into her berserk state and attacking the first thing she set her eyes on Kanoha. During that attack, my late husband found a way to seal Kikbi by summoning the Shinigami and sealing her. But the cost of summoning the god of death was your souls, so Minato-kun died during the process. Kishina said and had to hold back the tears she was feeling. But Kishina, how did he seal the Kikbi into? Sajuro asks about that, and Kishina sighs in frustration and speaks up. He sealed the Kikbi into one of our children. One whom the Sandame said died during the process. He was the first one born and he spent the last six years in that village being beaten and spat on by those ignorant, short-minded fools, and it's taking all my willpower not to declare war on that foolish old man. She said with an answer and a dark tone while clenching her fists under the table, not realizing that she was slowly releasing Kai making the samurai nervous and the daimyo to raise an eyebrow. Please, calm down Kishina. He said while she breathed in and out to subside her temper. Forgive me Sajiro-sama. I didn't mean to. She started to say, but the man waved his hand in dismissal. Think nothing of it. So what is the name of your firstborn who was treated like that? Sajuro asked. My son, Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, the true heir of the Hayabusa clan. She answered, causing the man's eyes to widen in shock. Here in Saratobi lied to me about my son's so-called demise and let those fools in Kanoha treat him like a criminal. He not only lied to a cage of another village he interfered in a foreign clan's affair and kept the heir from the clan in a hostile environment. Pardon my language sir, but I cannot forgive that son of a bitch for what he's done, and every civilian and ninja in the village are demanding retribution for this, and if Kanoha doesn't make a response for their actions, then I have no choice but to declare war. The council has already decided to increase the prices for trade, exports, and economical goods, and I'm already prepared to send our Riknin who are working as bodyguards for the fire daimyo back to the village. She explained while Sajuro lets out a hum sound and rubs his chin in thought. The man looks back at her, and a small smile appears on his face. I agree with those terms, Kishina. Send a message to the daimyo of Hai no Kuni stating that you, with the permission of the dragon daimyo Sajuro Haiko of Ryu no Kuni, are summoning the dragon nin that he's hired back to the Hayabusa village. I want your council to double the price for trade, exports, etc. That goes to Hai no Kuni's ports. 
if they have a problem with it, then I'll have both the Hokage, his advisors, the Fire Daimyo as well as you and your advisors come to a private summit here, and we can discuss their actions against your son. You'll have my back in this Kashina, and personally, I believe the Kanoha needs to wake up to reality, since they believe they are the strongest village. Perhaps in the elemental nations, but not here. Not to mention that nearly all of my samurai could take on Anbu level Nin. He declared and Kashina smiled and bowed. Thank you, Sajiro sama She says and he smiles back. Think nothing of it, Kashina. Your clan and my family have been comrades since the beginning. I would like to meet your son someday. Perhaps I'll see him during the Chknin exams in a few years. Well I must get going. I have a ton of paperwork waiting for me in my office, and if I don't deal with it, my wife will not let me hear the end of it. He says while cursing like a sailor in his mind. Kashina lets out a small laugh after hearing this. Same with me. Only Tsuki-chan will pout and berate me for not finishing it on time and not coming in for dinner early. Naruto, however, is a mystery when it comes to me and my duties. He'd just look at me and blink, then walk away. I tried bringing them both with me to show them what I do and they fall asleep most of the day. She commented and explained with a grin on her face. Tsujiro laughs at that and shakes his head. As fun as this. I have to get going Kashina. He says while getting up and walking out the door with his samurai flanking him. Give my regards to Haruka-chan. She says and he waves his hand back as a response. As soon as he left, Kashina pulled out a scroll and started writing in it. Three minutes later, she seals it up and wraps a black ribbon on it and snaps her fingers. An anbu with a black dragon mask appears and kneels before Kashina. Yes, Rikijsama. He asked. Have this message sent via messenger hawk to the daimyo of Hai no Kuni. She said holding the scroll out and the anbu got up and took the scroll. Hi. He says and vanishes. She looks at the clock on the wall, and it says 5.30 p.m. She then takes off her cage hat and places it on a hat hanger. She then removes her robes, wearing a red and black anbu battle suit, and walks out of her office. She sees her secretary putting some files away and speaks up. I'm leaving Riaika-chan. Take care of yourself. She said and Riaika looked up at her and smiled. You too, Rikijsama. Kashina nods back in sunshine out of the dragon tower. Meanwhile, Naruto and Ryu have it. He was chasing Naruto, trying to tag him, but the blonde was too fast. Come on Ryu. Are you that slow? Naruto exclaimed, and Ryu growled and added chakra to his feet to increase his speed. Naruto stops at a tree and turns around to see Ryu grinning, and he leaps at the blonde. Gotcha. He yells. Naruto leaps over Ryu flying form, while the young dragon in training crashes into the tree headfirst. Naruto lands on the ground and sees Ryu's form slide down the tree. He then clutches his face in pain and glares at the grinning blonde who takes off into the woods, and Ryu gets up chasing after the blonde. Little did they know that two shadowy figures that looked like demons were watching them. So, that blonde boy is the true heir of the Hayabusa clan, A, eh, as well as the Rikage's son. Let's kill them along with the other children. The one on the left stated. But we must proceed with caution. The white dragon and his wife are close by. The one on the right said while the other nodded and they vanished. At the compound, the girls were sitting in a circle talking while Aeyam was talking with Joe and Shizer about Aeyan. I can't take her back to the Mugen Tension village, Joe san Ever since Raid Matak me and Aeyan was born, everyone, even certain members of the clan, have looked at her with disdain, and it hurts me to see them treat her like that. Aeyam said as a few tears fell from her eyes. Aeyam continued. Shiden has tried to reason with the members, but they refuse to acknowledge her as an heir to the clan, since she carries the blood of a traitor in her veins. The villagers even pull their children away from her because they don't want her to infect them with her taint. It's only a matter of time before one of them decides to kill her, and I can't let that happen. While Joe and Caesar looked shocked. Joe's face returns to normal and speaks up. I see. He said and looked at Aeyan who was laughing with the other girls, until Naruto leaped out of a bush and into the middle of the circle panting, scaring the girls. Nice Aeyan. Suki cried, and Naruto was about to say something until a black blur named Ryu tackled him, and they were now rolling around the ground wrestling, while the girls jumped away and watched as Naruto and Ryu were fighting dirty. Shigure and Aim laugh at the scene while Joe sighs and shakes his head for couldn't help. That was when Kashina appeared next to Joe wondering what's going on until she saw Ryu and Naruto glaring at each other with dirt and scratches on their faces while being held back by Mamiji, Suki, and Aan, while Kariha tried to be the peacekeeper. Kashina sighs and Joe chuckles at this. All right you kids, let's go back inside. Shizer calls out. They all look at her and nod. Naruto and Rai were about to join in, but Kishina appeared and grabbed them by their collars. You two need to get cleaned up. She added and they groaned while being led into the bathing area. After getting cleaned up, Naruto and Rai were in a new pair of ninja guys and headed for the living room where the other girls were but Aan was missing. Naruto sees Mamiji and sneaks up behind her. 
Kuriha sees Naruto behind her sister and giggles while Mamiji blinks at her, wondering why her Nissan was giggling. As she turns her head, she happens to see a grinning Naruto and eeps, causing her to fall on her butt while looking at a laughing Naruto. She stands up and puffs her cheeks out and folds her arms, calling him a meanie. Naruto stops his laughter and then pulls her into a hug, causing a tint of pink to appear on her face. I'm sorry, Momo-chan. He says and releases the hug making her sputter and then turn red. Don't call me that. She yelled out only to cover her mouth in shock when she realized that she yelled at the true heir of the dragon clan. Naruto just blinks at her with his hands behind his head and then a snort escapes from his mouth and he laughs even harder. Mamiji looks at the ground and pouts while Kuriha laughs at her. Ma, ma. I didn't mean to embarrass you like that Mamiji-chan, I was just teasing you. He said and pats her on the back. She looks up at him with a pout still on her face. I want another hug. She pleads and spreads her arms out for another one while doing the puppy eyes. Naruto shrugs and gives her another one while she squeals and hugs him even tighter. Kuriha chuckles at this and looks at Tsuki who was also giving Ryu the pouty look while he just sweat dropped and his right eye twitched. I want a hug too, Ryu-kun. Tsuki insisted while his eyebrow twitched. No. He refuses and she sticks her lip out even further. Please. She begged and her eyes grew big, making Ryu twitch more. Oh for Kami's sake she's worse than Kasan. He thought but then let out a sigh of defeat and opened his arms out. Fine. He mumbles. Tsuki then grinned and glumped Ryu, and the boy's face turned blue from being hugged too tightly. He looked at Kariha who was holding her hands over her mouth to stop from laughing. Help me. He squeaked out. Mamiji stopped hugging Naruto and went over to pry Tsuki off of Ryu. So Kuriha-chan, are you a shinobi in training? He asked and she shakes her head for a no. No. I'm training to be a shrine maiden. When I'm old enough it'll be my duty to protect the Hayabusa clan's treasure. Kuriha said and he nodded. Oh. So Momo-chan is training to be a Kanoichi. Naruto asked and she nodded while said girl slumped her shoulders at being called that name again. MMHMM. She didn't want to be a shrine maiden like me because she doesn't want to spend her life doing nothing. Mom tried to convince her to be one, but Mamiji is stubborn like our father. Kariha explained with a grin on her face while Naruto chuckles. I am not. Mamiji yelled while Kariha just grinned at her. Naruto snickered and was about to say something until he heard someone yelling. Don't touch me. I hate you and our clan. The voice yells, making everyone jump up. That was when a slide door opened up and Ayan was seen running out of the room she and Am were in and heading out the door with tears flying from her eyes. Ayan chan please wait. Aim cries out as she appears out of the room also, but her daughter is already gone. Kashina appeared, as did Joe and Seizure. What's going on here? Kashina asked, wondering what happened. Aim looks at the ground and tears form in her eyes. Aan just ran after I told her the truth about her birth. She answers and covers her eyes with her hand, so no one could see her crying. Shizer and Joe's eyes widen while Kashina looks at them with a raised eyebrow. Anyone care to explain this to me? The redeed cage asked and Joe let out a sigh. Ryu. He called getting his son's attention. You and the other kids go look for Aan. He says and he nods. Hi Tusan. Ryu and the others leave the compound and split up to look for her. But Naruto. Naruto was currently running through the forest looking in every direction. He stopped for a while and heard sobbing. He then runs to the direction and sees Aan sitting near a lake with her knees hugged to her body and sobbing. Naruto walked over to her and placed a hand on her shoulder. She looked up and turned her head to see Naruto who had a concerned look on his face. Ayan's eyes were red and puffy from crying, and she looked away from him. What's wrong Ayan chan Naruto asks her. When she doesn't say anything, Naruto walks around and kneels and watches as more tears fall from her eyes. I hate them. She mumbled. Naruto raised an eyebrow at her. Hey too. He asked and she got up and looked at the ground. All of them. My mother, the Tension clan, the village, all of them. I hate them all. She screamed out while Naruto's eyes widened in shock as he stood up. Why would you hate your own family, Ayan chan he asked if he wanted to know. Ayan looks up at Naruto and releases a sob. She then hugs Naruto tightly while sobbing into his chest. That surprises Naruto, but he does the only thing he could think of. He hugs her back and tries to calm her down by telling her it was okay. While that was happening a creature with a humanoid appearance and black wings with what looked like a spiked club in his right hand was sitting on top of a tree chuckling. Well, isn't that cute? The mice are cuddling. Too bad it'll be their last. He said and leaps into the air with his club raised and comes down fast. Kikbi was resting in his mind and she suddenly felt a dark presence ascending to her vessel and the girl. Hit. Jump out of the way now. She yelled. Naruto's eyes widen and he looks at the ground to see a shadow growing under them. He looks up and sees a bird-like creature coming down at them with a spiky club raised. Kuzo. 
shit, he says and then he scoops Ayan up bridal style and manages to leap out of the incoming club, but the shockwave from the weapon sent them flying backwards and tumbling onto the ground. The two ninja and training groan and look up to see the creature in the crater with his club posed into a smashing position. He then chuckles darkly and stands up. It was a Tengu. A bird-like demon who is considered to be a ninja's worst enemy. So the little dragon has some skill after all. This might prove entertaining for me. The red Tengu said as Naruto and Ayan got up and the blonde's eyes widened in shock. WH what the heck is that thing? Naruto asks Ayan whose eyes were wide also and she takes a step back in fear. Hey, hey Tengu. Naruto-kun we must run. We're no match for the demon of his class. She explained grabbing his arm. Naruto looks at her with a shocked and scared look on his face. Th that's a Tengu. I thought they were rare to encounter. He cried as the Tengu started to walk towards them. Th they are. Their entire population has dwindled down to a few since the battle of the Archfiend on Mount Fuji. We need to run Naruto-kun now. It'll kill us if we stay here. Tengu are B-class demons who enjoy fighting and they have been known to kill and eat children. She makes a statement, and Naruto becomes pale as the demon licks his lips. It's been a while since I tasted the flesh of a true dragon. Luckily me and my brother will get the opportunity to eat you, the redeed, and the Hayabusa boy. I'll save the little girl over there for dessert. He says with an evil smile on his face. Naruto and Ayan kept walking backwards as the Tengu moved forward. Thus give up, little dragon. I can kill you both without breaking a sweat, so why delay the inevitable? Tengu asked. Little did he know, Naruto was reaching into his pouch and grabbed two flash bangs. Sorry pal, but we're not on the menu. He replied and then he pulled his right arm out and threw two black spheres at him. The Tengu snorts and grabs them. Do you think your little tricks will work Tengu says and looks at the spheres that start to glow, his eyes widen when they explode and turn into a flash, blinding the demon. Arg. My eyes. You little ninja you blinded me. Tengu roared out and clutched his head in pain, while Naruto smirked and grabbed Ayan's hand, and they ran into the forest. The Tengu shakes his head and opens his eyes. His vision was blurry for a while, and when it cleared, he saw the brats were gone and growled. That mangy flesh bag. I'll crush him with my bare hands. He then spreads his wings and takes off into the sky. Meanwhile, Naruto and Ayan were leaping from the tree branches trying to head back into the Hayabusa village. Then Kami. I had those in my pouch. Naruto said he brought some flash bombs, and Ayan nodded. That Tengu is not far from Naruto-kun, we can't outrun him. She says getting a nod back from the blonde. I know, but we can outsmart him. You saw how cocky he was earlier. He starts until he senses something heading for them and sees the Tengu diving right for them. Crap. Ayan split up. He cries out and they do as the Tengu crashes through the trees and lands on the ground hard, skidding a few feet. So, you mice want to play hide and seek a. Hum hum hum. Very well, I'll be the seeker. He says and punches a tree, knocking it off its roots and onto the ground. Uzumaki compound. Ashina was shocked and pissed as Am told her about Ayan's birth. So Raiden raped you on the day Shiden left to make negotiations with us, resulting in Ayan being in your womb, and then became a Miss Inan afterwards. Kishina asked and the woman nodded. Kishina sighed disappointed and asked. Troublesome. So what do you plan on doing, since your village is on edge with her, not only being a member of the clan, but is the spawn of a traitor? A.M. was about to respond until an Anbu appeared panting. While well, Joe stands up and glares at the Anbu. What is the meaning of this? Joe demanded. That forgive me Joe Sama. But the scouts in the forest spotted a Tengu flying above the forest. He reported and the four's eyes widened in shock and Kishina jumped up and grabbed the Anbu by his cloak. The Tengu what the hell is a Tengu doing here? She yelled in demand and the Anbu sweated under her gaze. I, I don't know, Rikage Sama. It seemed to be hunting I think. He said. Until another Anbu appeared, reported. Rai Kajama, a Tengu was seen in the compound district attacking a group of kids and your daughter, along with Joe's and two other girls are being chased by it. We already have some of our Chknin and Jmnin holding it off. Ashina eyes widen even more as does Joe's and seizure. What? Take me to the previous location now. Joe exclaimed and the Anbu nodded and they shunshin away. Kashina grabbed her katana and rushed out the door. Kashina. Shizer yelled out only for the Redeed to look back. Stay there and look out for Aim. We don't know if more will show up. She says and then an Anbu with a black dragon mask on appears as do five more. Ashina looks at them and orders. You six are with me. We're heading to the southeastern part of the forest. As they nod and vanish. Meanwhile, a group of Chknin and Jmnin were fighting off a blue Tengu who was dodging and evading kunai and shuriken. Don't let that thing get to the children. A Jmnin yelled out until a Chknin was sent crashing into another. One Chknin charges at the Tengu with a katana and swings it at the creature's torso, but it swings its club and swats the ninja away. Another one leaps into the air and brings his sword down on its head, only for the demon to smirk and grab his head. 
He then throws the chicken into a wall, causing it to leave an imprint of the unconscious man. How boring. I expect you dragon nin to be tougher than this. He comments and then spreads his wings out, releasing a huge gust of wind at the remaining ones, who are sent flying and crashing into the ground. Tsuki, Namiji, Ryu and Kariha were trapped in a corner. Ryu was holding a katana out while the girls were holding onto each other. The Tengu smirked and walked towards the ninja in training. He was a few feet away from them until a volley of shuriken and kunai headed for him, and he backed away. That was when a man wearing a white shinobi shizoku, or ninja uniform, with some armor, landed between the Tengu and the children with his katana drawn. Fifteen Anbu appeared around them with their blades drawn also. The Tengu looks around for a while and smirks. It appears that I am outnumbered. As fun as it would be to fight the white dragon of the Hayabusa clan, I only came here to kill the girl and your son, but sadly, I won't get that chance. Blue Tengu said and spread his wings. Joe narrows his eyes at the demon. And what makes you think I let you leave here alive, Tengu? Joe asks in a dark tone while the demon chuckles. Simple. You don't want to end up burying more bodies than you need to. He said only for Joe to growl. So, farewell. He said while glowing and vanishing in a flash of lights. Joe sighs and sheaths his sword, while the Anbu go help the ones who were severely injured. Ryu drops the sword and lets out a sigh of relief. Joe walks towards the four children and looks down at Ryu. Are you all okay? He asked and they nodded until Tsuki spoke up. Where's my brother and Aan, Joe Oji? She asked. Hopefully your brother found Aan and has not encountered the other Tengu. He said while their eyes widened. Meanwhile, Naruto was exhausted as was Aan. No matter what they did, they couldn't get away from the Tengu. Most of the trees in the forest were leveled, and there were crates in certain parts. Naruto-kun. We can't keep this up. He's too fast and too powerful. What do we do? She asks and then the blonde lets out a frustrating sigh. I don't know, Aan chan I used everything I had in my pouch, and my chakra is almost gone. He stated, and that was when the Tengu landed in front of them growling in frustration, scaring the two. I've had enough of this game of cat and mouse. Now I'll swash you many bags of flesh. He says and swings his club down at them, and they barely dodge it. Before Naruto could react he is snatched up by the Tengu and brought Naruto to his eye level, while the blonde struggles to get out of his iron grip. You mangy dragon. Did you really think you could get away from me? He says and slams his fist on the ground with Naruto in it simultaneously, while Aan watches in horror. After slamming the blonde in the ground the twelfth time, he brings Naruto, who is now bleeding from a gash in his forehead, back to his eye level. I'm not gonna kill you yet boy, I'm gonna make you watch as I kill the little girl here. The red Tengu with a sneer on his face while Naruto coughs up blood. Tengu smirks at this and then drops the blonde's limp body on the ground and then makes his way towards a frightened Aan. Naruto painfully lifts his head and watches as the demon makes his way towards Aan. Naruto tried to move, but it felt like every bone in his body was broken. The Tengu raises his club into the air and grins and yells out. Time to die little. And lets Aan scream out loud as he brings the club down. Naruto watches this in slow motion, while a golden aura surrounds his body. Thump thump. Something deep within Naruto was slowly rising and growling. The aura around him was getting bigger. Thump thump. His eyes flashed from blue to a gold yellow color and became slitted with a tint of red and changed back. The canines in his upper lip become longer and his nails become longer, forming into claws. Thump thump. His growl became a snarl and he slowly got up as the aura swirled around him like a twister and his injuries started to heal. Kippy saw the dragon statue become surrounded with a gold aura and chuckles. It's finally awakened. She said and the statue let out a roar. The Tengu suddenly stops when he senses a power behind him. He turns around to see Naruto who was snarling while flexing his clawed hands, while the gold aura twists around him and then forms into the head of a dragon that lets out a roar that sends out a small shockwave, making the Tengu cover his eyes with his arm. Aan sees this also, and her eyes had a look of shock and awe on her face as she saw this. Kashina and the Anbu were leaping through the trees when she felt the power. Oh Kami, he's activated his dragon's blood. I have to get there fast. She thought and increased her speed. The dragon head disappears, and Naruto lets out a deafening roar that shakes the ground. He then vanishes and the next thing the Tengu knew, he was slashed across the chest by five golden claws and blood seeped out from the wound. He takes a few steps back as he sees the look on Naruto's face. His clawed right hand had blood on it, his fangs were bared, and his eyes were now golden yellow and slitted with tints of red in them. The red Tengu smirks as he looks at Naruto. Looks like the dragon's blood inside you has finally awakened, but it won't save you. He yells out and swings his club sideways at Naruto's head. The blonde leaps over it and spin kicks the demon in the head, making it snap back. Naruto then raises his clawed hand at the Tengu. He turns his head and his eyes widen as the clawed hand descends towards his face. He manages to twist his head a little, but it resulted in him having his left eye slashed open and blood spurted from the destroyed eye. 
Jai. He cried out as he clutched his head in pain and agony while Naruto landed and continued to snarl. The Tengu looks at the blonde with hatred in his eye and senses the wreckage in her Anbu heading this way. Consider yourself lucky little dragon, but next time I will kill you. He says and glows until he vanishes into a mixture of multicolored lights. Naruto turns his head at Ayan who continues to look at him in shock. The blonde smiled at her then collapsed onto the ground. Ayan snaps out of her daze and runs towards the unconscious blonde and kneels down. She then turns him over and places his head on her lap. Ayan looks at the boy's calm expression and smiles. Thank you, Naruto-kun. She said and a tint of pink appeared on her face, and that was when Kishina and the others appeared. Two days later, Naruto slowly opens his eyes and finds himself in a bed and a room covered in white. He had some bandages on his face, and he was wearing a deep blue robe. He then got up and let out a groan. He then jumps out of the bed and lands on the floor, but then hears the door open. Appearing from the other side was Ayan wearing a purple kimono with a pink butterfly on the front of it. Her eyes widen when she sees a grinning Naruto who is now awake. She then runs towards the blonde and hugs him while a grunt escapes from his mouth. The blonde hugs her back and lets out a smile. They release the hug, and Ayan looks at Naruto with concern and worry in her eyes. Are you okay Naruto-kun? She asked and the blonde nodded. Yeah. I'm fine. But I'm really hungry. He says as his stomach growls out loud. Naruto blushes when he hears this and Ayan giggles. She then takes his hand and leads him out of the room. As they walk down the hallway and into the dining room where the others were eating. Kishina stops and sees her son. The next thing Naruto knew, he found his face being buried into his mother's chest and was being crushed in a hug by the Redeed. MMMHPH. Naruto muffled out while waving his arms in the air frantically. Suki was laughing at the scene, and AM and Ayan were giggling. Ain't Earth Asan. I ain't Earth. Naruto muffled out loud. Kishina realizes that she's crushing her son, pulls him out, and he breathes in a lot of air, and then glares at his mother, who was blushing in embarrassment and chuckling sheepishly. Sorry, Sachi. How do you feel? She asks with a concerned look on her face. I feel great, but can I eat please? Activating my bloodline burned all the energy I've had, and I'm starting to see three of you Kasan. He whined. Ashina giggles at this and carries him over to the dining table and sets him in a chair. Ayan, would you be a deer and help feed my son? She asked. A tint of pink appeared on Ayan's face, and she nodded and sat in the other chair that was next to Naruto. When she sets a bowl of rice and fried salmon in front of him, she pulls out a pair of chopsticks from the table and then grabs some rice and holds it out in front of Naruto, who takes the rice into his mouth and swallows it. Thanks Sayan chan He says and she smiles and nods at him. You're welcome. She replied and continued to feed him. Bishina and Aam were watching this and inside their minds, they were screaming kawaii. Suki had a look of disgust on her face but kept eating. Bishina was also proud that Naruto activated a part of his bloodline and knew that Suki would activate hers soon. She also wondered what the future would hold for her children. Only time would tell. Chapter 4. Retribution, Godparent, and the Wave. After the Tengu incident where Naruto activated his bloodline, Kishina decided that it was time for Naruto and Suki to learn about the power of their bloodline. Suki managed to activate hers when they were practicing their survival skills and were attacked by a rogue bear. Apparently they activated the eyes, body and chakra based part of their bloodline. All that was left was the elemental based ones and it should activate when they turn 12. Ashina first taught them how to use the eye based ability which gave them different types of visions like thermal, night, or combined both into enhanced that allows their eyes to zoom in and out like the Byakugan. And. Based on solid eye in MGS4. Then the body on the other hand was a little difficult because it gave the person the ability to morph certain parts of your body into the appendage of a dragon-like claws, scales that were stronger than diamond, spikes, wings, and a tail. The chakra-based one gave them a second source of chakra, which allowed them to use the dragon art, Richten, techniques which were like ninjutsu, but they used incantations before calling out the name. And. Maybe I will base it on dragon slayer magic and fairy tale, six basics only. Or American dragon. Jake Long. Sooner or later, they will earn the main branch or second branch's ability of the dragon bloodline. Very soon. Ayan was staying with the Yuzumaki family from the request of Am and Shiden who agreed to this, but this didn't please certain members of the council who wanted the girl to be killed, but both Kashina and Shiden stated that no harm will come to Ayan, or else they will be the ones who will die. The Sumi was saddened when she heard that Ayan is no longer a part of the clan, so was her brother, Haid. She did get to say goodbye to her half-sister and got to meet Naruto, much to Ayan's annoyance, because the girl gained a small crush on the blonde when he called her Sumi-chan and gave her a hug. The Sumi then told Ayan that their mother told her about her secret but that she didn't care and that she still loved Ayan and that they were family and best friends no matter what. Those words caused Ayan to cry and hug the person that became her first friend. 
after saying goodbye to Hade. Shiden gave they ant scrolls that contained their family's fighting style and ninja arts. After that, she left to live with the Uzumakis. Two years have passed since Aan stayed with the Uzumakis. She, Suki, Mamiji, Kuriha, and Kasumi were all best friends now. Too bad for Naruto, because whenever Aan, Mamiji, and Kasumi try to spend some time alone with him, it would result in the three getting into a glaring contest with each other and Naruto wondering why they always acted this way around him. Naruto tried asking Shizurabas in this, but she patted him on the head and told him to ask his mother about it, which he did only for Kashina to stare at him for a while and burst out laughing. Right now Naruto and Ryu were at a lake swimming laps to the other side. Naruto now looked like a younger version of his father due to the fact that his whisker marks were now gone but were replaced with slitted eyes and fangs that jutted from his upper lip. Ryu's hair was in a ponytail and it stopped near his upper back. Naruto was currently in the lead with Ryu a few inches behind him. Naruto increased his pace and Ryu did the same. When they are close to the other side, Naruto taps the edge of land, turns around and pushes himself forward while Ryu does the same. The two dragons in training were now shoulder to shoulder as they head to the other side of the lake. Naruto is now ahead of Ryu by a few inches and when they approach the land, Naruto taps it first and Ryu does the same. As the blonde pulls himself up onto the land as does Ryu. What's the score now, Naruto? Ryu asked while Naruto grabbed two towels from a rock and tossed one to Ryu. 52 to 49. I'm ahead of you by three. He started while Ryu grunted and wiped his hair. Say, doesn't your Kasen have to go to a private summit with the daimyo today? Ryu asked, getting a nod from the blonde who sat on the ground. Yeah. Something to do with how Kanoha interfered in foreign clan affairs and how the village treated me. Naruto replied while Ryu frowned. Do you hold any grudges against that place? He asks while Naruto snorts and places his towel on his shoulders. I could care less about that place right now. Kanoha is not my home anymore. The Hayabusa village is. I have friends and family here and I wouldn't give them up for anything. He stated. Well, except one. You mean? Ryu is about to say what Naruto was referring to, seeing him nod, saddened, before his eyebrow rose. Yeah, I wish I could bring her with me and her parents before they almost get involved. Naruto explained. And if I was pulling mind tricks on anyone. What surprises me is that they thought you were the Kikbi's reincarnation. Talk about idiotic. Ryu comments and Naruto scoffs. Please Ryu, even an idiot can tell that I'm not her. For one thing I don't have fox ears or a tail sprouting from my ass and I'm not the size of a mountain. He stated while Kurumi was in his mindscape giggling at what he said. Ryu chuckles at this and speaks up. Let's head back for lunch, Naruto. I'm starting to get hungry. Well the blonde nods. Me too. I hope Aan chan made fried salmon and spring rolls again. Naruto said along with guest and Rai rolls his eyes at his best friend and they head off to the Uzumaki compound. Hanahagakur no Sato, here is in Siratobi was not having a good day. Then again he hasn't had one since Naruto was taken back to his home. When word got out of Naruto's departure from Konoha, the civilians partied because the demon brat was gone. After that, the civilian and elder council demanded that Hunter Nin be sent out to find and kill the boy and the people that took him, minus one certain blonde hair with a single bang which falls down into her face, did care for the boy for saving her daughter, she was frowned for she is not one of them, but Hiruzen refused to because Naruto wasn't a ninja, but a civilian, so he could have left without his approval. But when that was over, Hiruzen announced to the village that the boy they treated like garbage and beat for their petty vengeance was the son of the Yandame and the last Namakas. Most of the ninja and civilians were shocked at this, but the ones who held their grudge refused to believe it. The council wanted Hiruzen to send Anbu after the boy and have him return to revive the clan, but once again the man refused to let this happen, infuriating them. Making the single blonde women smirk for those fools who made their mistakes. Since she was a friend of a certain red-haired woman. Until the rest of the council told her about it so they knew she wasn't interested. That however wasn't the main problem. An ambassador from the Hayabusa village came to Kanoha a few years ago, stating that the daimyo and the rickage are tripling the price for economic goods and technology that went to the fire country and also cut off the trade for high-ranking missions. A civilian council, minus one, wanted to know why, and the ambassador only said that you angered the red dragon which caused the elders and shinobi council to pale because they knew who he was referring to. After that, he got a letter from the fire daimyo, and when he read it, the man was scared for his life. It was due to the fact that the wreckage is resummoning the ninja he hired as bodyguards back to the Hayabusa village from orders of the dragon daimyo, who sent him a letter stating Kanoha's charges on the heir of the Uzumaki Namakas and wanting to have a private summit with him, the cage, and their advisors, so that they can explain their actions. Hiruzen let out a tiring sigh knowing that Kanoha was gonna pay big time for their actions. 
He was inwardly praying that the Hayabusa village doesn't cut off all ties with them and declare war, because even with their military force backup, they wouldn't stand a chance against the Dragon Nin. Sooner or later, this village will become a shadow of its former self and glory. Not only is their technology more advanced, but their military strength is on par with three of the five major nations. Kashina was no pushover either. Just like Minato, she had a flea on side order in the bingo book, and she's the last person you ever want to face in the battlefield. The pissed off Kashina was one thing, but the wrath of an angry mother is another. I'm too old for this shit. He muttered, and that was when the door opened and Kaharu, Himura, and Danzo walked in with frowns on their faces. Saratobi frowns and looks up at the three, who have been nothing but trouble since Naruto left, especially Danzo who wanted Naruto to be a weapon. What do you three want? Hiruzen asked as they sat down. We came to talk to you about the summit. Do you intend on having Kashina return the last Namakas to the village where he belongs? Danzo asked, only to be glared at by Siratobi. And have Kashinar the fire daimyo raise the village to the ground. Are you trying to destroy us, Danzo? I would do no such thing. He replied only for Danzo's frown to deepen. There must be some way for us to turn the situation over. Hamura stated only for Hiruzen to rub his temples. There isn't, you fool. Kashina and the dragon daimyo have more evidence on us than we do of them. The fire daimyo is not happy with us right now, and it is because of our actions that he has lost half of his bodyguards. He started only for Danzo to scoff. And what is wrong with our ninja taking their spots as his bodyguards? Danzo asks. Hiruzen looks at him like he's stupid. Danzo, the Dragon Nin and the Hayabusa village have been around longer than any other has, and they have been allies with the former daimyo of our country. Not to mention their military power is equal to that of three of the five major elemental countries. Do you honestly think we can take on a village that powerful? We may be the strongest village in the elementals, but they are the strongest non-elemental village. He started and Danzo just stayed silent and looked at the ground. We can't afford to go to war with them. We lost the Ichiha military police force three years ago. That alone has crippled our forces. The daimyo will cut our military and economic funding, if not, he will cut ties with us, making us a target for other villages like Iowa. Kaharu stated but was also cursing inwardly. She never liked Kashina or her ways of ruling a village, thinking that she was a novice trying to fill the shoes of a master when it came to leading. We only have ourselves to blame for not following Minato's dying wish. If we had, we wouldn't be in this situation right now, would we? Hiruzen asked with a statement as the three looked away from him not wanting to admit that he was right. Hiruzen looks up at the clock on the wall and gets up, putting his hat on. The summit is in Tetsu no Kuni, Iron Country. I'm leaving the Ino Shikacho trio in charge until we return, but I'm going to say this one time and one time only. Keep your mouths shut and speak when I tell you to. He said in a tone that stated he was serious which caused them to cringe at his gaze. They abuse a village, Ashina, along with her three advisors Nishiki, Aizen, Kaira and Eight Anbu, were at the entrance of the Hayabusa village, with a carriage waiting for them. She was wearing her cage hat and robes, and strapped to her back was Ndachi. Standing before her was Joe who was wearing his shinobi uniform. I'm leaving you in charge while I'm gone, Joe. Naruto, Ayan, and Tsuki will be staying with you and your family until I return. She said, getting a nod from the man. Hi. Good luck and be safe Kashina. He says and she smiles. I will, trust me. When I say, I'm gonna give the old monkey and those buzzards hell. She declared while her advisors chuckled while entering the carriage. Do chuckles as she enters the carriage in the Anbu flanket. The driver of the carriage motions the horse to move and it does. Do watches as the carriage disappears from his view and then walks off with the two Anbu that were flanking him to the dragon tower. Naruto and Rai were now fully dressed in their training gear and were now heading to the Yuzumaki compound to eat lunch. After they removed their sandals, Naruto opened the slide door and they entered the compound, only for the scent of fried salmon and spring rolls to hit their noses. Naruto walks in the dining room, only to see Ayan and Tsuki setting the table. Ayan turned her head to see Naruto and Ryu entering. Hey Naruto-kun, Ryu-san. Greet while the two smiled back. Hey Ayan-chan Naruto replied as they sat down and started to eat their lunch. After they finished eating lunch, Naruto, Ayan and Tsuki went to get their gear packed and headed over to the Hayabusa compound. Two days later, after taking a boat to the elemental nation, Kishina, her advisors, and the dragon Anbu were walking through the forest heading for Tetsu no Kuni, Land of Iron, until one of the Anbu spoke up. Rikijama. The one with the blue dragon mask said and Kishina nodded. I know. All of you step aside. I'll deal with them personally. She replied with orders and tilted her hat down. The Anbu and advisors stepped to the side, and that was when ten nin wearing cloaks and blank masks that had the kanjina on it leaped out of the trees, with their ninjutens drawn and descending towards Kashina, with the intent to kill her. They were rude Anbu. Kashina lifts her arm up and taps a seal that was on it. 
It glowed blue for a while, and then in a puff of smoke a silver-bladed katana with a deep red hilt, black diamond patterns, and a black guard appeared in her right hand. She then channels her wind chakra into her blade, and with great speed and precision, she performs a series of slashes, releasing small crescent-shaped wind blades at the root ninja, who barely have any time to evade it and are all struck by the attack. Blood spurts from their injuries, and some lose their limbs or are killed instantly. The ones that survive crash to the ground, screaming out in pain and clutching either their wounds or their lost limbs. She walks over to one of them and turns her blade into a stabbing position and runs it through his skull, killing him instantly. She removes the blade from the skull and swipes the blood and brain matter off with a flick of her wrist. That was when a barrage of kunai and daggers headed straight for her. Kashina grabbed one of the fallen bodies by the collar and used it as a shield to take the attack. That was when her eyes grew cold and glared at the now charging root members. Fools. She said with a bad mood as she dropped the body. A few minutes later, the bloody and dismembered bodies of the root Anbu were scattered across the open field, and Kashina was wiping the blood off her blade, the Akarashi, Red Storm, with clothes until the blade was clean. Her advisors walked forward and looked at the scene. That was an interesting display of carnage, Kashina. Azen stated while Kashina leaned over and ripped the mask off one of the root's heads. She then glared at the mask with a nah and crushed it with her bare hand. That fucking war hawk. She snarled out and looked at the Anbu who were preparing to burn the bodies. Don't burn them. Seal them up in a scroll. She ordered and the men nodded. We're gonna return them to their rightful owner. As they started to seal the bodies away. Tetsu no Kuni. Kashina and her group have made it to Tetsu no Kuni, a snow-covered country with a large range of mountains and three large mountain tops that were called Sanro, three wolves, due to their appearance being similar to a three-headed wolf. Kashina and the advisors were wearing cloaks with the Anbu flanking them. They managed to make it to the compound in Tetsu, and they saw three men garbed in samurai robes, scarves, and katanas strapped to their sides standing at the door. The one on the right is a bald man with a scar over his right eye and a dragon tattoo above his other eye. The other one is a balding man with thick eyebrows and a scar on the right side of his head. The one in the middle had a long black beard and mustache, long black hair, and wore some type of headgear that was wrapped in clothing. They were Mifune, Akasuk, and Yurikaku. They all walked up and bowed to the general of the samurai army as did he. I welcome you and the others to Tetsu no Kuni Rikijama. The dragon daimyo and fire daimyo are inside the waiting room. The only ones who haven't appeared are the Hokage and his advisors. He greets and forms and she nods. Also, try not to start a conflict with Rikij. I want this meeting to go without confrontation on either side. He stated, Kishina nods and walks into the waiting room with her advisors and men and sees Hiroshima Jin Rikzai, the Fire Lord, along with his samurai and Sajuro Haiko. Hiroshima also had the build of a warrior and had a scar on the left side of his face. He wore what looked like a red battle kimono with samurai armor and a sword strapped to the left side of his belt. When they met in the middle, the ruler of the fire country approached them and bowed, and they did the same. Ishina san Sajuro-san. It's been a while since we met. Hiroshima agreed and Sajuro nods. Indeed it has been a while. Unfortunately I'm not glad we have to meet like this due to the issues our villages are having with each other. Sajuro stated while Hiroshima frowns and nods at this. Yes, I too am not happy with the situation, but I am sure we can solve this problem, and I do believe that my village and the current leader of the village are responsible for all of this, and trust me when I say when this meeting is over. I will be having a chat with that man and deal with his counsel. Hiroshima stated. That was when Hiruzen, his advisors, and his Anbu bodyguards walked in. Kashina looked over at them, and her eyes went from kind to cold and emotionless. Saratobi saw the look in her eyes and couldn't help but shiver inwardly. Anzo was cursing inwardly because he sent his route to try and slow her down or at least kill one of her advisors. Sajuro just greeted them with a nod and Kishina walked away from them. Hiroshima gave Saratobi a look that meant he was gonna deal with him and Kanoha after this. Mifune stated that he would evaluate the meeting until said leaders have made their final decisions. The cages and their advisors were sitting on opposite sides along with the leaders of their country. The Anbu and Samurai were hidden in the shadows and watching out for intruders or if their leaders got into a situation with each other. Kishina and Hiruzen set their cage hats down on the table. Mifune sat down at the far end of the table and spoke. Now that everyone is present for this private summit, we can begin discussing the issues that are causing conflict between the leaders and their respective country. Mifune states. That was when Sajuro Haiko spoke up. If I may Mifune-san, I'd like one of Kishina's advisors to state the charges she has placed over Kanahagakur. The man said and Mifune nodded. Very well. The samurai general replied and looked over at Aizen who was Kashina's head advisor. Councilman Aizen, would you read the charges? Mifune asks and gets a nod from the man who reaches into his robe and pulls out a scroll, unravels it and starts to read it. 
the goddamn wreckage of the Hay of Yusa village, Kishina Yuzumaki Namikas and the Daimyo of Ryu, no Kuni Sajiro Haikoshi, 13. Find the Sandain Hokage, here is in Saratobi and Kanahagakur no Sato guilty for performing these actions. Lying to a foreign leader of the death of one of her children who happens to be the heir of two clans, keeping the heir in a hostile environment and denying the heir of his birthright. Aizen stated while well, Kishina, who had her hands under the table, was clenching her fists in fury while her eyes remained cold. Ifyun then looked over at the dragon daimyo and spoke, asking. Do you agree with the charges that were stated by Sajiro-sama? With the man nodding his head. Yes I do. The daimyo started making the elders frown and Hiruzen to look at the table with shame. Does the Hokage agree with the charges placed against him? Nifyun asked in court and the old man nodded. Yes I do. He said, making his teammates and Danzo look at him in shock. Okage-sama, Yukanti Sirihamura stated only for the professor to glare at him which caused him to shut up. Nifyun then looks over at Hiroshima who had his eyes closed. What is your opinion on this Hiroshima-sama? Nifyun asked the man who opens his deep brown eyes and speaks. I would like to hear Kanoha's side and let the leader of the village explain his actions against an allied nation. Hiroshima says as he looks at Hiruzen who lets out a sigh and looks up at them. I'm Yosama, I honestly thought I was following the wishes of my successor before he sealed the fox away into his son. I denied him of his heritage because I hated the man for what he did during the war. I made a law that stated the younger generation wouldn't know of Naruto's condition and warned the older generation who hated the fox that it was an S-class secret punishable by death. He explained his reason, but Kishina scoffed. Looks to me that s how that turned out, Sandame sama But that's not what I'm pissed off about. Tell your daimyo, why did you lie to me about my son's death? She said in a cold tone that made the man cringe. Kishina I'm Saratobi started to say until she growled. That's Rikaj-sama to you, you old monkey, now answer my question. She demanded. I did it because he was the last male Namikas and Minato would have wanted him to stay in the village where he can revive his clan. He said only to instantly regret it when she smashed her fist into the table, causing the Anbu and Samurai to appear ready to defend their leaders until the daimyos waved them off and they disappeared into the shadows. Ashina's eyes were now a golden yellow color with a tint of red around her slitted pupils. You son of a bitch. How dare you say Minato would have wanted Naruto to stay in the village to revive his clan. That's what you bastards want. She yelled while a bead of sweat appeared on Hiruzen's brow and that was when Kaharu spoke up. Please calm down Rikich. Kaharu started to say until Kishina aimed her glare at the old woman. I wasn't talking to you, you ancient relic. So shut the fuck up. The redeed yelled, making Kaharu shut up, and Kishina looked back at Hiruzen. Give me one reason. Give me one fucking reason why I shouldn't kill you four right here and now and then have my army head to Kanoha and reduce it to ashes you traitorous dogs. She snarled out as she removed her fist, leaving an imprint in the desk while Hiruzen, Kaharu, and Hamura had a look of horror and fear on their faces. After all my village has done for you fools when the Shadame Hokage first created that village you go and stab me, my village, and my country in the back just because my Sachi was the last Namikas. Have you forgotten that he is also my son and the heir to the Uzumaki clan? She roared out while the daimyos and Mifune just watched the event, as did Kishina's advisors, who almost felt sorry for the old man. Almost was the keyword. Kishina, I was only doing what was best for the boy and for you, and I couldn't allow you to take the container of the most powerful bitch out of Kanoha. He would have been a danger to you and your village. Saratobi tried to explain, but this only pissed Kashina further. The killer intent she was releasing frightened even Mifune and the hidden Anbu and Samurai. Whoever said hell hath no fury like a woman scorned wasn't lying. Nishiki and Aizen thought. And that justifies your actions in separating a mother from her child. I can't believe I'm hearing this from you of all people, Saratobi. What was best for my son? He told me how you would just sit in your seat and let those idiots beat him near an inch of his life. He also had to eat food out of garbage cans because he was always kicked out of restaurants and grocery stores. Garbage cans you fucking fool. How could you do this to me and Minato? Kishina yelled out while the man looked away in shame. Hiroshima's eyes widened in shock and then glared at the four. How dare you do this to me, my family, my country, and my children. I consider your actions inexcusable as do the ninja and civilians of my village. The dragon daimyo also agrees with me and we demand retribution from your village. Refusal to do so will be the complete termination of our treaty and an all-out war with us. She finished while Hiruzen impaled at the threat as did the elders. Retribution it is, Rikijama. What is it that you want from us? Hiruzen asks, knowing that if he refuses the fire, Daimyo will either erase the village with his samurai army or cut his ties with him and watch as Kanoha is raised to the ground by Kishina and her forces. 350 million rim for financial retribution to the Yuzumaki and Namikas clan, the execution of those who assaulted my son, as well as 30 and S ranks from the cage vault. She said and was inwardly smirking at their shocked looks.
I object. Danzo yelled out. Ashina the demands are. Are. Hiruzen started to say. Are what? Too much. It's either that or the liquidation of Kanahagakur, Sandame Sama. Kishina replied. We can't pay that amount of money, and the execution of the ones who attack the boy are too numerous. We could end up crippling our village. Hamura stated while Kishina just shrugs and looks at her nails. Not my problem, advisor. Pahara then speaks out. You're being unreasonable, Rickage. She yelled, getting a smirk from Kishina. Payback's a bitch, isn't it, elder? She said, making the woman sneer at her. This is blasphemy. Daimyo-sama, don't you think she's being unreasonable? Danzo asks only for the man to look at him. Actually, Danzo. I don't. Hiroshima said making the four pale. The ruler of Hai no Kuni was agreeing with the foreigner's side. Be but sir, she. Danzo started to say until the man silenced him with a hand gesture. Ashina sama I agree with the financial retribution as well as the list from the cage vault. But I wish you would reconsider having 85% of the village executed. Hiroshima says and Kishina looks at the man for a while and lets out a sigh. Fine. But in return, I demand 10 and 10s ranked mission scrolls from them. Kishina said and the elders opened and closed their mouths with no words coming out. Very well. Hiroshima states and looks at Sajuro who nods back at the agreement. Tsuritobi sadly nods back while the elders look at the table with frowns on their faces. Oh, and Danzo. Kishina called the Warhawk while the man looks up only to see a scroll tossed at him, and he catches it. He opened it, and a pile of corpses with blank masks with a kanjina on them appeared in a bloody pile, making the man's single eye widened, as did the others. The next time you want to send your drones to kill me, make sure they're at least cage level. Oh, and I want double of what I requested. You can thank Danzo here for that. She said with an evil grin on her face making them a white as a sheet of paper, and after that, Hiruzen glared hard at the now scared man, releasing murderous intent on him, and then Hiroshima spoke up. I will personally make sure that the retributions are accounted for Kishina-sama, Sajiro-sama. He said, getting a nod from them. As they started to file out, after the summit was adjourned, Saratobi looked at Kishina. Kishina I'm, Kishina cut him off. Save it old man. I don't want to hear your piss-poor apologies. You're a disgrace to your village, your clan, to your predecessors, and my husband. I'm gonna say this one time and one time only. Keep your counsel on a leash, because you've got one time to piss me off, one time to try anything against my children, and one time make me regret sparing your village, and not even the daimyo will stop me from sending my entire force to your village and wiping it off the face of the earth. She then got in his face and gave him a look that would make the Shinigami proud. I will make you watch as I destroy everything. You and the former cages worked hard to create, and then I will kill you and mount your head on my wall. She said in a cold and dark tone, while her eyes flashed gold and yellow for a few seconds, while the Sandane flinched and gulped. A day later, after the eventful meeting, Sajuro went back to the capital of Ryu no Kuni, and Kishina returned to the village. The fire daimyo had his messenger send the money, as well as the mission scroll she wanted for retribution. The civilian council, minus one, were not happy about it and wanted the man to reconsider it, but Hiroshima ignored their protests. Making a single councilwoman happy for her friend to pull off. She refused to pay for what they deserved before the fire daimyo called her and gave a letter that turned out to be a secret message for Kishina. She appreciates him and Kishina. Right now, Kishina has decided to take a couple of days off to spend with her children due to all the stress Kanoha has put her through. Kishina, her kids, Ayan, Ryu, Kasumi, Mamiji, Kariha, and Seizure were at the lake relaxing. Kishina and Seizure were lying on their backs on towels, sunbathing in their bathing suits while the kids were in the lake splashing and laughing. Shizer looks over at Kishina and speaks up. Kishina, have you considered getting remarried or dating again? She asked for a raised eyebrow from the woman. Since when did my personal life interest you, Shizer? She asked only for the woman to sigh. Come on, Kishina, I know Minato was your first love and you miss him, but you should move on and find someone else. Minato would want you as well as your children to be happy. She stated and Kishina sighed. I don't know if I can Shizer. I can't have any more children plus I'm in my early 30s. There aren't a lot of single 30-year-old males in the village. She stated. Shizer frowns, but then a grin appears on her face. What about Rikimaru? She asked and a tint of pink and made it red appeared on the Ritid's face. Since few friends called Arashi as a nickname. His real name is Arashi Rikimaru Kazama. The Sentaicho of the Anbu. What about him? Kishina asked only for Shizer's grin to widen. Oh, come now Kishina, you should ask him out on a date. She insisted on making the woman sit up and look at her. Shizer. She exclaimed while Shizer blinked. Dust asks the man out on a date, Sheena. You need a man in your life. Naruto and Tsuki like him. Just give it a shot. She says while Kishina blushes and looks at the sky for a while and then sighs. Fine. I'll ask him tomorrow, since he's off that day. 
she replied and Shizer grins at her best friend. Thus don't blow it or you'll never hear the end of it from me. She said and Kashina's brow twitched. After that, everyone left the lake. Kashina, Naruto, and Tsuki were heading towards the compound until they heard a deep masculine voice. Yo, Kashina. The three turned around to see a man with long white spiky hair that was tied into a ponytail, and on his head was a headband with a kanji for superscript 1 oil on it. He wore a green ninja guy with a mesh shirt underneath it, as well as a red vest and Jetta sandals. He was Jiraiya. The Gama Senan and one of the Sanin. Kashina saw Jiraiya and blinked in confusion. Jiraiya. What are you doing here? Did Saratobi send you here? She asked as she narrowed her eyes at the man who blinked in confusion. No, he didn't. He looks at Naruto, and his eyes widen as he looks at Naruto. Kashina is that. He started to say only for Kashina to nod. Yes, Jiraiya, this is your so-called dead godson. She answered and the man's eyes widened in shock, and then they narrowed. I'm gonna beat the shit out of Saratobi. He said scowl and Kashina blinked at the man. So he lied to you too, right? She asked only for the man to nod, and Naruto looked up at his mother. Hey Kasen, who's he? He asked. That signals Jiraiya was about to do his introduction when Kashina interrupted him. He's your Kyofu, godfather, Sachi. Jiraiya, the Gama Senan. He's also the man who trained your father. She answered only for Jiraiya's head and shoulders to slump. Kashina, you interrupted my cool entrance. He whines while Tsuki giggles and Naruto sweat drops and looks back at his mother. Are you sure he trained Tusan? He looks like a goofball and a pervert. Naruto stated only for Jiraiya to face fault and get up to glare at the boy. I am not a pervert. I'm a super pervert. He proclaimed as he puffed his chest up. Naruto's brow twitches at his proclamation. That is not something you should be proud of and state, Hiro Senen. Naruto replied and the man's face faulted once again. Kashina bit her lip and tried to stop laughing, while Jiraiya sat up and glared at the boy once more. Don't call me that. Jiraiya yelled while Kashina laughed as did with Tsuki. Just like his father. He called me that too and now his brat is calling me that. He ranted until he calmed down and spoke up. Anyways, Kashina, the reason I came here is because I would like to train the kids for a couple of years and teach them some of my personal skills. Jiraiya replies that Kashina looks at him for a while and then speaks up. I don't mind. Besides you have a lot of catching up to do with your godson, but if you turn him into a pervert, I will make Sanadi's beatings look like an act of mercy once I'm through with you. The redhead cage said in a sweet but dangerous tone, making the man sweat bullets. I I won't. Jiraiya said nervously and mentally added yet at the same time. Naruto looks up at his mother again to speak. Is he really that strong, Kasan? He asked and Jiraiya gave the boy a look of shock and hurt. Aki, you mock my skills as a ninja. I'll have you know that I am without a doubt one of the strongest ninja in the world. Heck I could give your mom here a run for her money. Jiraiya said with a grin on his face, making Naruto's and Tsuki's eyes widen. Kasan, can he really take you on? Tsuki asked since her mother is the strongest ninja in the village, and Kashina nodded while rubbing the back of her head. Yes he can, Tsuki-chan. I remember all those spars we had with him and your Tusan. He actually knocked me out in our first fight. She said while Jiraiya smirked at her. Sure did. You were getting arrogant and cocky, so I had to knock you down a couple of pegs. The Toad Sage replied Naruto however was scratching the back of his head. Why is it that some of the most powerful people in the world are weird Tsuki? He asks his twin who shrugs while the two adults laugh at them. Four years later, at an empty restaurant near the borders of Kaminari no Kuni, Lightning Country, a manager named Taro was currently being harassed by a group of Yakuza's who had bats, clubs, and a few had guns with them, any series of MP5KS, Uzis, M4s, Axe, M9s, Glocks, Desert Eagles, and Sig Saucers, etc., installing dot sights or cog scopes or laser sights. And? That's right, mates, there are guns in this story since I combined the Naruto world with the Ninja Gaiden world by using the Call of Duty style with customized arsenals and baddest StarCraft weapon selectable style, so I will be had Sonya select those guns, plus combat knives and Ninja Blade style too, and advised you guys not flame me, cause this is fanfiction, fans. Hero was currently gulping as one Yakuza named Maki, who was wearing an all-black suit with brown spiky hair, a tattoo on the right side of his face, and holding a bat walks towards the man with a bat resting on his shoulders. Oh look. I, I already said I didn't need protection from your boss, so please leave. He begged only for the leader to snort and then kicked a table over with his foot, making the man whimper. The Jirasama didn't ask if he wanted protection. You're getting it and will pay us for it or else. He said as he pointed his bat at the manager's face. I don't want your protection and I'm not paying you for it. Taro yelled, and Maki snatched the man up by the collar and slammed him into the wall, getting a cry of pain from the man. He drops his bat on the ground and pulls a switchblade out of his back pocket and points the sharp steel at his neck. 
Either you accept his offer or you're gonna have a bigger smile on your he started to say until his body jerked and he looked down to see a knife in his torso and blood dripping from his gut. He drops the switchblade and Taro pulls the blade out and kicks the man in the face, sending him flying into a table, which shatters. The others had shocked looks on their faces while Taro flicks the blood off the knife. The Nikki. The Yakuza grunt cried out and aimed his 9mm pistol, M9, at the manager. You son of a he said until he was hit by a barrage of shuriken that flew from the ceiling. Three hit him in the chest and torso, two hit him in the back, and one hit him in the back of his skull. The man dies before he hits the ground and the other gangsters freak out at this. What the hell is going another one said only for his head to be looped off by a flash of silver and blood squirts from his neck and sprays everywhere. Arrow had a smirk on his face and pulled four throwing knives out of his sleeves and threw them at the rest, who had barely any time to react. Three were killed instantly while the others cried out in pain. A redeed appears between two of them and plunges her twin Kadachi into their spines, killing them instantly. She was wearing a whole body jumpsuit that was red and black with a dragon on the back and had arm guards on her arms and fingerless gloves. She also wore a black face mask that covered half of her face. The front part of her suit was slightly unzipped revealing a mesh shirt. A ninja leaps wearing an all whole body black outfit with a headpiece that resembled a dragon's crest, falls from the ceiling with his blade, Shinken no Riken, divine dragon sword, drawn and performs a diagonal slash down on one Yakuza and vivisection another, separating his upper and lower body. After the small massacre. Taro turns into a puff of smoke and when it clears, a 14-year-old male with wild blonde spiky hair, Yandame's hairstyle, wears a deep blue and silver bodysuit with a face mask, arm guards and fingerless gloves. Strapped to his back and belt were Raiken and Shiken no Rikjin, dragon sword and fang of the dragon god, his family's heirlooms. Well, that was fun. Naruto is admitted and walks over to a bleeding Maki, who was trying to stop the bleeding from his torso with his hands, and Naruto grabs the man by his hair and lifts him up to his eye level. Look. You're gonna die soon, so why not tell us where your boss is? He asked only for the man to be silent until Naruto punched him in his bleeding torso and blood squirts out of it. Maki screams out in pain as Naruto dug his fist into the injury. You're only prolonging your death you fool. Tell me where he's hiding and I'll make you death quick and painless. He says as he applies more pressure. Maki had enough and spilled his guts and answered. Okay, I'll talk. Kajira-sama is staying at a five-star hotel called the White Cloud in the upper district where he's being guarded by his personal guards and some ninja with black spider symbols he hired. He's staying in the penthouse on the right side of the building. Thank you. Naruto appreciated and the blade came out on his wrist and slits the man's throat in a quick manner, killing him instantly. You know. You always like to play around with Assassin's Creed, right? Ryu commented. Naruto started to like to play that game Assassin's Creed since it's a new game this year, since the blacksmiths insisted on building the same weapons as the game. And. It's now the future comes to the past and there's modern computers. I know. Naruto replies as his hidden blade slides back. Ryu pulls out a scroll and seals the bodies in it. I'm pretty sure some of these guys have bounties on their heads, especially the one with the tattoo. He states. Suki then sheathes her cottages and walks over to Naruto and Ryu. The personal bodyguard should be no problem, but the black spider nin will be a problem. We need to get rid of them first. Suki stated about the arch enemies of the dragon nin. Naruto nods in agreement. Yes, we'll deal with them first before we go for his personal guards. Once we deal with the guards, we'll deal with Kajira. He said getting a nod from the man the shunshin out of the restaurant. White Cloud Penthouse. Inside the penthouse was a bulky man wearing a purple and black suit. He had black hair that was slicked back with a few gray strands in it and a scare on the left side of his head. His name is Kajira Sasuke, a crime boss of the Yakuza gang. He was also a former cutthroat and hitman of the group until he had an incident when facing an assassin that was after the bounty on his head. He was now sitting in a chair, drinking red wine out of a wine glass. He was waiting for Maki and his group to come back with the protection money. If not, that is the manager's head. Outside his room were his guards who were wearing black suits with white dress shirts and black ties, armed with SMGs with lesser few reflex and laser sights, and four grips. The others were patrolling the upper room. On the roof were eight black spider nin equipped with katanas, axes, and gauntlets. They were watching the rooftops and looking out for any ninja. Meanwhile, three figures were watching. Tsuki was crouching on a telephone pole with a pair of goggles and zoomed in on the rooftop to see eight spider nin patrolling the rooftop of the penthouse. She then removes goggles from her face and leaps off of the pole and lands into an alley. Ryu appears from out of the shadows and approaches her. We got a total of 12 guards patrolling the upper room where the penthouse is. Judging by their outfits, they're probably equipped with firearms. Ryu informed me before I asked. What about the rooftop? There are a total of 8 spider nin patrolling the roof. Suki states and Ryu nodded. 
A beeping sound comes from his comm link, and he clicks the headpiece that was in his ear. Yeah. There's a total of eight. Naruto, should I handle them? Ryu asked. Okay. I'll handle the spider nin, and you and Tsuki will handle the guards. Okay I'm about to head there. He replied and clicked the earpiece to turn it off. Meet Naruto at the tenth window on the northeastern side of the building, and he'll meet you there. Ryu said. Tsuki nods and shunshins out of the alley, and Ryu emerges with the shadows and disappears. White Cloud Penthouse Rooftop, the black spider nin just finished sharpening his sword and was about to rejoin the patrol group until he was hit in the skull by three shuriken. His body jerks back and he hits the ground with a thud. Ryu appears in a crouching position and pulls out an exploding tag, placing it on the man's body. He then grabs the spider nin and flings him over an air duct. The body lands in between a small group of spider nin who jump up with their weapons ready. They approach the body carefully and see a tag on the dead Spider-Man's body. Ryu was behind the air duct and had his hand in a ram seal. Hi. He mutters and channels chakra into the tag, which glows yellow, then explodes into fire. Three of them ended up being set ablaze and were screaming and rolling around the ground. The other two had third-degree burns on their arms and legs, trying to put the flames out. A black blur was heading towards them, and when one of them looked up, he was decapitated by a silver flash. It was Ryu with Shinken no Rikken drawn. The headless spider nin falls to the ground, and the others rush at the dragon nin. Ryu pulls out five shuriken and flings them at the two. One deflects them with his gauntlets and swipes at Ryu's head. Ryu sidesteps the attack, and the other spider nin does a horizontal slash with his wakizashi. Ryu blocks it with his blade, and roundhouse kicks the in on the back of his head, making him stumble backwards. Ryu then spins and cuts off the man's right leg, and he hits the ground clutching his missing limb in pain as it bled out, while the young dragon stabs him in the head, killing him instantly. Four more nin appear around him with their weapons ready to kill. Ryu looks around and then twirls his blade twice and gets into a stance. The tenth floor, the bodyguards heard the explosion and ran around in different directions looking for the source. Naruto appears in the air with Raikin drawn in hands. He rushes at two of them who were firing their 9mm and... 45 act guns at Naruto who was deflecting the bullets with his blade. The guns went blank and started to click, shocking the bodyguards who tried to reload the clips. Naruto leaps into the air and performs a spin kick on the one from the right. The impact sends him flying into a wall, and his skull hits it, leaving an imprint and falls to the ground unconscious. When Naruto lands, the other one tosses his gun to the side and pulls out an electric tonfa. He charges at Naruto who sheaths his sword and gets into a CQC stance. The guard charges at Naruto and takes a swing at his midsection. Naruto sidesteps and grabs the man's arm. He twists it hard, hearing the snapping of bone. The guard cries out in pain as he drops the electric tonfa only for Naruto to grab it and strikes him in the torso with it, making the guard keel over from the electric currents running through his body. Naruto then lets him go and strikes him in the back of the neck, and he topples over. He tosses it aside and sees his sister kick one guard into a wall, and then leaps over one that tried to strike her from behind. She grabs his head, flips over and pushes her body forward, flinging the man into another group of guards. She then throws a kunai, which had an exploding tag on it, at the ceiling. When it hits, she performs a ram seal saying kai and it explodes. Large chunks of debris fall, and the guards scream as they are crushed under the rubble. Inside the penthouse, Kajira had a gold-plated Desert Eagle Mark VI in his hand and was heading for the elevator as he heard the sounds of guns firing, blades slicing into flesh, the sounds of screaming and explosions shaking the ground. He had a limp in his leg and was using his cane to help him move forward. He was now at the elevator and about to reach for the button until he heard a crashing sound and saw one of his guards come flying through the destroyed door and sliding across the floor and stopping having a bloody, swollen, and broken face. Shit. Kajira mutters and reaches for the button again only for a barrage of kunai and shuriken to come flying at him. He curses once again and barely avoids them. They destroy the panel as sparks buzz around the destroyed elevator panel. He aims his gun at the entrance and starts to fire at the smoky entrance. Little did he know that Naruto was already in the room on a metal beam with a kusurigama in his hands, the one from Ninja Sigma 2. He twirls the end that had the metal spike ball in it, and then he flings it at the man's hand that had the desert eagle in it and knocks it out. What the? He exclaimed as the gun went scattering across the room. He turns his head to see Naruto on the beam twirling the sickle end. Kajira tries to run away, but when he does then he cries out in pain as the sickle is embedded into his spinal column. Blood spurted from his injury, and he fell down losing all feeling in his lower body. Naruto yanks the sickle out and grabs the handle, swiping the blood off of it, and seals it into a scroll. He then lands on the floor and walks over to the man who was crawling on his belly with his hands trying to reach for his gun, but Naruto plants his foot on his back, and he screams out as his spine snaps. Naruto pulls out his blade and places it in a stabbing position near the back of his head. 
Any last words, Yakuza? Naruto says in monotone while Kajira snarls and clenches his fist. Fuck you. Was all he said. Squelch. The blade was embedded into his skull, killing him instantly. A puddle of blood started to form around the man's body, and Naruto removed the tip out of his head and swiped the blood and brain matter away. That was when the body of a spider nin came crashing through the ceiling and hit the ground hard, creating a small crater. Naruto looks up and sees Ryu leap from the hole in the ceiling and into the penthouse. He kicks the dead body away and walks towards the blonde dragon who was sheathing his sword. Mission accomplished. Naruto said while Ryu let out a sigh of relief. Finally, a feminine voice exclaimed. Tsuki was walking into the room dragging the unconscious body of a Yakuza guard. We managed to take care of all the Yakuza crime lords in Kaminari, Lightning. Not that it was tough or anything, but these guys were pushovers. She said while Ryu nodded. You would think they would at least hire some missing nin to protect them or at least more black spider ninja. Ryu said in a bored tone while Naruto chuckled. Well, we can finally go home after hunting crime lords for six months. He comments and they both nod. Come on. We need to get out of her because I am not paying for the damage. He says and the three shunshin away. Naruto, Ryu, and Tsuki were used to this kind of thing. They got used to killing and fighting, and they started when they were 12 years old. They have killed crime lords, corrupt politics, gangsters, pirates, and even stopped the smuggling of drugs and illegal weapons. After collecting the bounty on the Yakuza crime lord. They headed back to the Hayabusa village via dragon summon. Naruto, Ryu, and Tsuki each signed the summoning contract for the legendary dragons since it was their birthright, and Naruto was given Rikken and Shiken no Rikken when he turned 13, and Kishina gave Tsuki her blade, Aka Rashi. When the dragon landed near the compound, Ryu left to head to his family's compound. Naruto created a shadow clone and had to take the mission report to the dragon tower. After being greeted by the servants, Naruto and Tsuki went to their separate rooms. Naruto closed the door and removed his ninja outfit and gear, wearing a mesh shirt and boxers under it. He places his blades on the sword stand and then grabs a pair of shorts, boxers and a towel and heads to his private bathhouse. After taking his bath, he dries himself off and puts on his boxers and shorts while leaving his well-toned muscular body shirtless. He walked towards his bed, ready to lay down on it, until he felt a pair of soft feminine arms wrap around his waist and felt a body press up against his back. A smile appears on his face as Aan's hands travel across his chest and abs, and after doing that for a while, she latches her hands around his waist and inhales the scent of his hair. Hello, anyone home? He said while she giggled and kissed him on the cheek. Hello, Naruto-kun. I missed you. She said they walked towards his bed. Ayan removes her hands from his waist, and Naruto turns around to see a smiling Ayan. She was now 5'3 and had a figure any girl would kill to have. She had clear violet hair that stopped to her shoulders and ruby red eyes. She is wearing a grey sleeveless shirt that hugged her body and showed off her curves and C-cup breasts and wore a pair of short purple shorts that showed off her flawless legs and hugged her hips. I missed you too, Tenshi. He says getting a small blush from her and she kisses him on the lips. They stop and Naruto goes and lays his back on his soft comfy bed. Ayan joins him but lays next to him and rests her head on his chest. He wraps his arms around her and pulls her closer to him. He then closes his eyes while Ayan smiles at this and does the same. Ever since Naruto saved her from the Red Tengu, Ayan has become more open with Naruto. She even cried for him when he told her about his life in Konoha and that he was the container of the Kikbi no Yoko. Kasumi, Mamiji, and Kariha did the same when he told them, and it resulted in him being hugged to death by the crying girls. As he told them he had met a single girl before she was taken away from him by his mother. Since the girls told them her name. He'll tell them the answer when the time comes. So. They gave him a hint of cherry. Just as Naruto told them about his first friend. He'll tell them when the time comes. After living with Naruto and his family for almost six years, Ayan's feelings for Naruto went from a crush to actual love. At first she was afraid that he would reject her, but surprisingly, he stated that he had feelings for her too. Now Naruto earned her trust to give an answer to the hint of the cherry, which made her surprised that it was. It was a name, so Ayan will keep the secret for time being. They then became a couple, which seemed to hurt Mamiji and Kasumi, since they also developed feelings for the blonde, but wanted Ayan to be happy, since it wouldn't be fair to her, since they had a lot in common. Surprisingly Naruto got out of his denseness when it came to girls when he got older. Actually, Tsuki had to literally beat it out of it as did Jiraiya, who stated that both he and his father were blockheads when it came to women. Kishina and Karumi, Kaiubi, had never laughed so hard when they watched her daughter and Jiraiya beat some sense into his head. After Kishina told her son and Ryu about the Kra, he nearly had a heart attack as did Jiraiya due to the fact that his godson got to live every man's dream. They were skeptical at first but realized that it would help restore their clans, so they agreed to it. Kishina and Seizure wanted lots of grandkids whom they could spoil. 
Naruto knew that Kasumi and Mamiji had feelings for him, and when he told Ayan about it, she said that she'd agree with letting Kasumi and Mamiji join his clan, and he would tell them about it. And includes her. Kashina told the girls that she had a friend in Konoha. About two or three at least. Since she can't risk herself sending a letter to her friend since they had talked about being in an academy years ago in Konoha. So she secretly gave it to the fire daimyo to her friend, so that way they could keep themselves in touch until the time came. Of course she came up with this wild proposition. The girls were curious about it. So Kashina replied that during that time she was six months pregnant with Naruto and Tsuki. She actually came up with a bizarre idea of wanting her daughter to marry Naruto. Of course her friend laughed because Kashina thought she was going to give birth to a girl. That surprised the girls talking about Naruto's friend. They told Kashina that she has pink hair, which triggers Kashina to smile because she knows a person had pink hair too. The girls questioned whether Kashina actually brought up the idea of the two of them marrying. Kashina persisted too. Kept telling her friend that her son and her daughter would make the most adorable and beautiful babies. That only made Naruto blush about his mother and made an unofficial arranged marriage. He told her that she did have pink hair. Since Ayan didn't mind. So. Kashina told him she hadn't sent a letter for a while after the twins were born. Since she can't risk it to send another, she'll keep in touch with her. The next morning, Naruto opened his cerulean blue eyes to see Ayan sleeping on top of him with her head on his chest. He smiles at the sight, hearing her snore lightly with her hands on his chest. He brushes a strand of hair from her face, and she stirs for a while. She opens her ruby red eyes and sees Naruto grinning at her. Morning Tenshi. The great and she smiles back. Morning Naruto-kun. She replied and moved up to kiss him on the lips. Naruto sits up with Ayan on his lap and deepens the kiss. Ayan does the same and wraps her arms around his neck. Naruto has both of his hands on her hips and pulls him even closer, and Ayan brushes her hands through his soft blonde hair. Naruto then moves his hand downward and slips it under her shirt and caresses her stomach, making her shiver slightly. Naruto manages to get his other hand under her shirt and lifts it up revealing her well-toned torso, which she gained from training. Ayan removes her lips from his, and a sly smile appears on her face. Naruto, if you wanted me to remove my clothing, all you had to do was ask. She replied only to giggle when he tickled her sides and stomach. Be careful what you wish for Tenshi. I might do more than strip you of your clothes if you keep teasing me. He says getting a blush from the girl. Naruto removes his hands from her hips, and she gets off his lap and pulls her shirt down. Should we get ready for our morning run? He asked and she nodded. Naruto went into his closet and pulled out a blue sleeveless shirt, grey pants, and a pair of blue and white running shoes, as he wore the same hidden blade bracer for precaution. Ayan went to her room to change and put on a purple tank top, grey jogging pants, and a pair of purple and white shoes. After that, they walk out of the compound and stretch for a while. Naruto pulls out an iPod and puts the headphones in his ears and starts playing Agony by Kotoko. Ayan pulls out hers as well, and they start running around the quiet village. After running for 45 minutes they stop near a park to relax. Naruto was drinking out of his water bottle when he noticed a redhead and a teenager making out on a bench. It was Ryu and Tsuki. Tsuki was sitting on his lap with her arms wrapped around his neck and Ryu had his wrapped around her waist. Ryu was wearing a black sleeveless shirt, black jogging pants, and white running shoes, and Tsuki was wearing a red tank top with red jogging pants and red and white running shoes. Naruto saw this and a grin appeared on his face. He looked over at Ayan who was drinking water out of her bottle and taped her on the shoulder. She turned to see a grinning Naruto pointing in a different direction, and she turned her head in that direction, only to spit her water out of her mouth and her eyes as wide as dinner plates when she saw Tsuki and Ryu making out. Naruto the sunshine behind the bench they were making out on and stood up. Ahem. He coughed out and the two froze and opened an eye to see Naruto smirking at them. You two don't you realize that this is a park, right, and kids play here? He asked. Ryu and Tsuki jump off of the bench and look away with their faces glowing red. Ayan appeared next to Naruto with her arms wrapped around him and was smiling at them. So this is what you two do early in the morning. What would your mother say if she saw this, Ryu-san? Ayan asked and Ryu glared at them while they grinned. Speaking of mothers, Ka-san didn't come home last night. Naruto said think about that subject. Tsuki's eyes widen, but then a grin appears on her face. I bet that she is staying with Arashi-san. She replied while Naruto groaned. Figures. Why doesn't she just marry the guy for crying out loud instead of sneaking out of the compound when we're gone? He asked. Kashina has been seeing Arashi for the past four years. Naruto was shocked that his mother was dating again, but she did like the man and decided to give him a chance, but he did threaten the Smtaicho of the Anbu that if he broke her heart, he'd break all four of his limbs, castrate him with a heated up kunai, and throw him into the volcanic mouth of Mount Fuji, causing the man to twitch at the threat. Tsuki snickers at this and wraps an arm around Ryu's. Well at least they're not at the compound doing that. 
she emphasizes while the blonde's eye twitches and he shudders at the thought of his mother doing that with Arashi. After finishing their morning run, eating breakfast at a restaurant and going home to change Naruto, Ryu, and Tsuki were summoned to the Dragon Tower by the wreckage. Dragon Tower, Naruto, Ryu, and Tsuki were now in the tower, where Kishina was glaring at the piles of paperwork she had and had a tick mark on her head. I swear if that woman comes in here with more paperwork. I'm gonna pull a kick bee. She roared in her mind while a chibi form of her burned the mountain of paperwork with a fire and then did a victory sign with her hands while grinning like a Cheshire cat. The three dragon nin sweat dropped at their cage's expression, as did the ambu hidden in the shadows. Naruto coughed, getting his mother's attention, and he speaks up. You wanted to see us, Rikage sama Naruto asked and she nodded. Yes. I got your report from the cage bunshin, shadow clone, you sent yesterday, and I want to congratulate you all for dealing with the Yakuza crime lords and reducing their activities in Kaminari no Kuni. Kishina stated. The lightning daimyo thanked you all for dealing with them and is sending the bounties on their heads to your accounts. A small smile appeared on her face while they nodded. Now. I know you just got back from the six-month mission, but you and Team Tenshi have been requested for a joint mission from the daimyo of Nami no Kuni, Land of Wave. She stated while Naruto blinks at this. What is the mission, Rikijama? Naruto asked. Apparently the country's economy and trade has been dwindling for the last three years. As you know, Nami no Kuni is a port country and is very vital to the other villages for trading both imports and exports to other countries. A man by the name of Gato is the one responsible for this. She explained getting wide eyes from them. The man who owns Gato's shipping company? What does he have to do with this? Tsuki asked about that man and his company. Kishina pulls out a file and places it on her desk. She opens it revealing the picture of a short man wearing a black suit. While Gato does own a shipping company that deals with imports and exports, he is in no shape or form a good businessman. She states. According to our spy network, Gato also works in the criminal underworld and is responsible for transporting illegal items like drugs, weapons, and even slaves. He has worked with the Yakuza in sending them their items and not getting caught. He's also responsible for the murders of a lot of important people in waves and also known for selling women and young girls to whorehouses or his personal brothel. She replied as she said those words with venom and was twitching. Tsuki's brow twitched as did Naruto's and Ryu's. I want you and Team Tenshi to head to Nami no Kuni and find his hideout. Find as much evidence as you can on him, get access to his bank accounts, and when you get the chance, kill him but be careful. He also hires bandits and missing nin to do his dirty work, and I'm positive he'll hire the Black Spider clan. She said getting nods from them as they started to leave. Now if only I knew how to get rid of all this damn paperwork. I have a lunch date, damn it. She said while an I'm tears fell from her face and the sweat drops on the hidden Ambu's faces grew bigger. Naruto's head popped out the door and he smiled. Have you considered using Cage Bunshin, Kasan? Hiro Senen stated that the knowledge they gain after being disappeared is sent to the user. He said and disappeared. Kishina's eyes were the size of a dinner plate and her jaw was on the ground. So that's how Minato got all that paperwork done. Minato you blonde jerk, if I find a jutsu that brings the dead back to life, I'll kick your ass. She yelled furiously as her eyes glowed red and streams of fire shot out of her nostrils and mouth, scaring her Anbu who were praying to Kami that she doesn't take it out on them. Naruto and Tsuki heard this and snickered at how their Kasan reacted. Pops better hope she doesn't find a bring back the dead or he is so screwed. Naruto stated. While in heaven Minato felt a shiver go up his spine, wondering who it was he was fearing right now. Chapter 5. Wave, Fiends, and Hunters PT1. Naruto, Ryu, and Tsuki were walking towards the entrance to the Hayabusa village. When they got there, they saw Team Tenshi. Ayan, Kasumi, and Mamiji. Ayan was wearing a purple and silver whole body jumpsuit with flower decorations, along with several pieces of armor and a black garb over her head. Strapped to her sides were her Fuma Kadachi. Kasumi wore a blue and white Kinoichi outfit with a wakizashi with a golden tassel strapped behind her back called Hikari no Hanana, the flower root of the light. She also had long copper hair and brown eyes. Lamiji wore a red and white shrine made in battle outfit with black ninja boots and strapped to her back was an ajinata called Tenyu, Heavenly Dragon. Naruto sees the three and a grin on his masked face. Hey Tenshis. He called out. The three girls looked at him and made Mamiji and Kasumi blush on their faces when they saw him here, while Leian smiled. So, my one san and Mamiji still have a thing for Naruto-kun. I wonder how they will react when he tells them that he can have more than one wife due to the clan laws. I'm positive they won't mind since Naruto-kun treats us all like equals. She thought. And hopefully if he'll find her of what he's looking for. Hey. So are you guys ready for the mission to Nami? No Mamiji asked to be prepared, and they all nodded. Naruto bites his thumb and performs a few seals and slams his palm into the ground. Kuchiyashi no jutsu, summoning. 
he called and in a puff of smoke, two horse-sized dragons appeared. The first one was bronze-colored and had reddish-brown eyes. The second one was forest-green-colored with yellow-slitted eyes. Hey Kaiser, Senyu, can you take us to Nami no he asked, and the two dragons nod and puffs of smoke escape from their nose. Of course, Naruto-san. Hop on. Kaiser said as he and his brother lowered their bodies. Naruto, Kasumi, and Ayan hopped on Kaiser's back while Ryu, Tsuki, and Mamiji hopped on Senyu's back. Hold on tight. Senyu said when he spread his wings as did his brother. Kasumi wrapped her arms around Naruto's waist and blushed when she pressed her body against his back, and Mamiji wrapped her arms around Kasumi's. The dragons then shot up into the sky, and the squeals of Kasumi, Ayan, Mamiji, and Tsuki were heard as the dragons soared into the sky. While the dragons were soaring in the sky Kasumi and Mamiji were thinking about Naruto. He was cute, funny, and treated everyone equally unlike some who come from powerful clans. Most boys his age were perverts to girls like them, but Naruto on the other hand, wasn't. While he would tease them on certain occasions, he doesn't take it far. How are you two doing back there? Naruto asked as he looked over his shoulder behind the Tenchi sisters. Fine. They both replied at the same time. He then smiles at them and turns back around not noticing the blush on Kasumi's face, but Ayan does and smirks. Meanwhile, Rai looks down to see an island with what looked like a bridge being fixed. Also, it's unfinished. That must be Nami no Kuni, wave country. Naruto. We're above our objective. He yells out. Naruto hears him and nods. Alright Kaiser, I need you and your brother to land on that island. Naruto orders and the dragon nods. Kaiser heads downward and his brother follows. As they pass the clouds, they see an island that's mostly forest. The dragons land in a clearing and the two teams jump off their backs. Thank you too, and give my regards to Ayabin, boss. Naruto appreciated getting a nod from the dragons, and they disappeared in a puff of smoke. They then pulled scrolls from the seals on their arms and in a puff of smoke, several duffel bags appeared, and they contained their camping supplies. After setting up the camp and setting traps around the area, Naruto holds his arm out, and on it was a seal. He once again bites his thumb and presses down on it. The seal glows and in a puff of smoke a container appears. He opened it and inside were six radios with comm links connected to them. Alright guys, here are the radios and comm links. He started as he pulled one out and attached it to the left side of his belt and placed the comm link earpiece on his ear. His team and also Team Tenshi got theirs. Okay, this is what we'll do. Team Tenshi, you all are heading to the closest town you can find and scout the area and see if you can get info on Gatton's location. As Team Akuma, we'll be setting up traps and killing any missing nin, black spider nin, or bandits we find in the forest. Naruto said in an authority tone, getting nods from them as they got serious. We'll be scouting and looking for info for at least three hours, then we'll head back here and set up camp. Also Team Tenshi, if you can hinge into civilians to gain info and steer clear of any shady characters. It's possible that they're Gatton spies, but if you see one alone, capture and interrogate him. Naruto stated and they nod. Alright, we have our objectives. Now move out. Naruto exclaimed and the six vanished from the scene. On Hagakur, Irizen Suratobi was not enjoying his day right now in this village. After the event in Tetsu no Kuni, Kanoha's economy was not in the best of shape for the last three years due to the fact that they had to give half of the village's worth of money to the Hayabusa village and Kishina's clan, not to mention the 20 high-ranking missions and for retribution. The council was very upset about it, minus one as well, and plus a screeching purple hair banshee furious for having their fortune low, and when the clan heads wanted to ask about it. Hiruzen told them to thank Danzo and his drones for their actions against the wreckage. As the warhawk wasn't seen at the meetings for a while, which Siratobi was thankful for. And the same blonde woman was secretly pleased and admitted how her friend did it. That. She was disappointed at the so-called professor, and also as a friend of Minato besides her husband. She did honor her best friend's wish. Since then, the Kanoha was now the shadow of its former self. Just as the orders received from Kashina requested the fire daimyo had publicly executed most of the few civilians that abused, despised and assaulted the true heir of the most powerful clan in the shinobi village that interfered with the foreign ninja clan affairs. And rest of the shinobis were devoted from Jininurchknin into Genin, or Eternal Genin, eternally. Leaving a few remains to honor late Yandame's wish. Also few of the Anbu had disregarded the fourth second's wish. By sending all of them to Ibiki to interrogate after the suspended, or devoted, or executed. It was the arrogant villagers of Kanoha to blame for they didn't realize the resemblance, not Naruto did the mess he made from them, for all the rest of shinobi forces are reduced, for disregarding the late fourth Hokage's wish that cripples the village. They were extremely low on cash as the amount of money they had to hand over to Hayabusha was extremely large for a village, without the Kanoha's funds they earned to rebuild the village from the jobs and missions, they're liquidate and collapse soon. 
it will take years to earn it after taking D ranks for capturing a certain cat will earn some money and more fresh out genins and C rank missions for escorts and errands. But Kanoha had less highest ranks for now, only 1B and or A rank they received each a 2 week or 14 days from the fire daimyo for salary. So. He gave Kanoha 15.5% from the salary. And even the matron from the orphanage is fired from her job and executed in public, replaced by the same certain blonde woman and husband that took over and had her daughter to do the rest. Also, they had a newborn son brother to raise. And. I admired the rarest story of Narasaku. Land of Ice. A certain pink hair will have a brother. I'll have this story that she will have a sibling. After the foolish mistakes they made, the villagers were completely downfall for their ignorance and fallibility, after all. The village won't be the same with peace. Without their Jinch Kriki and their new allies to form. The village of Kanoha will be the easy target of other hidden villages like Iowa. Their military power and village economy weakened. Lastly, each year, October 10 after the retribution. They tried to form a festival after the fire daimyo gave Kanoha's half of the village's worth of currencies to the Hayabusa village and Yuzunami clan, and as well as the admission scrolls the wreckage wanted for retribution. Also it turns out the fire daimyo declined and terminated the festival that was held in Kanoha, that many travelers that came by were disregarded. So it's completely low on funds for requirements. Now the so-called Kikbi festival is over, gone, forever, permanently. So they cannot enjoy themselves because they disregard the late Yandame Hokage's wish. It's because of that. They shouldn't listen. But nothing can go back to the way it was. Now standing before him was Team 7 and 8, with the Jinin senseis being Kakashi Hadak and Kurunaiki along with their students. After years passed that they earned their currency with D or C rank missions, only 5 or less higher rank missions after Kashina had Kanoha retributed. Of Team 7, it was Sasuke Ichiha, Sakura Haruno, and Sai. Lead by Kakashi. And Team 8, Tracker Team, it was Shino Aburam, Kiba Inuzuka, and Hinata Hayuga. Lead by Kurunai. They were currently standing before their leader who spoke up. Okay, since both Team 7 and Team 8 have completed the exact amount of missions, you'll be doing a joint C rank mission. He announced and the Jinin Sensei's eyes widened. Now don't worry, it's only an escorting mission. You'll be escorting Tazuna, the bridge builder of Nami no Kuni. He answered. Sasuke however was scowling because he won't be able to fight any strong ninja. Great. We have to spend our time with the king of pricks. Kiba mumbles and gets bopped on the head by Kurunai. Back in the forests of Nami no, the sounds of screaming and metal clashing were heard. Naruto and Team Akuma had ambushed a bandit camp that was near the shorelines. The body of a dead bandit hit the ground with his eyes rolled into his sockets and had two shuriken embedded into his skull. Blood seeped out of his mouth and into the sand. Ryu had sidestepped from being stabbed in the torso by a bandit spear. He sweeps the man off his feet and then grabs the spear and stabs it into his heart, killing the bandit instantly. Naruto was cutting down bandits left and right. One tried to get him in his blind spot, but Naruto substituted himself with another bandit who was gutted with a broadsword. Naruto then vivisected the man in half and blood sprayed everywhere. Suki had one in a stranglehold and snapped his neck. She then shoves him away and stabs a charging bandit in the kidneys with her kadachi. After that she performs a few hand seals. Pain. Karakendon. Fire release. Fire dragon flame bullet, she exclaimed and shot flames out of her mouth, and five bandits were engulfed in flames and watched as they screamed out in pain and agony. Naruto brought his right arm back with his index and ring finger out and yelled. Futen. No yeba. Wind release. Wind blade. As he does a slashing motion with arm. An invisible blade of wind strikes down the last group of bandits and they are cut down into piles of limbs. Naruto looks around at the sight and grunts. This is the fourth camp we hit. He mutters and Ryu nods as he wipes the blood off his blade with a flick of his wrist. At least this one didn't have any women in cages. Suki castrated and slaughtered the poor fools. Ryu comments as he sees Suki swipe the blood off her cottages. Okay, let's reduce this camp to ashes. I'm pretty sure they do root checks on the camps. Naruto said and they nod. The three perform and incinerate everything. After that, he summoned Shinku, performed a water and sprayed the ashes off the sand. They then leap away back into the forest after the water dragon returns to the dragon summoning world. But Team Tenshi, the Sumi, Aan, and Mamiji had found a town and were watching from the rooftops. The place was in simple terms a dump. The stores barely had any food, people were in rags sleeping in alleys and in cardboard boxes, and the children looked malnourished. The Sumi frowned at the sight she witnessed before her eyes. This is terrible. What kind of person would do this to a country? She asked. Only a scum, like Gato. I see mostly the children, but hardly any women or teenage girls. That bastard is probably selling them to brothels or as his personal slaves. What a sick fool. Aan answered and Mamiji clenched her fists. If we capture this man alive. 
I am gonna cut off his beads with a heated kunai and then shove them in a place where the sun doesn't shine. Mamiji states and they nod in agreement. Ayan then looks around and sees a man wearing a clean brown suit entering a building and narrows her eyes. I think I found our spy. She said getting their attention. Where, Ayan? Kasumi asks and she points to a bar. He just entered that bar. He was wearing a brown suit that was clean. Now tell me, what kind of person wears a suit like that in a town full of poor people? It's possible he's a spy. She explained and the two looked at the bar he entered. So what should we do? Naruto said that if we see one, alone, we should capture him. Mamiji says and Ayan thinks about it. I could go in disguised as a Yakuza. Suggests and Kasumi looks at her and nods. Okay, but let's wait until the sun sets. She replies. Three hours later, as the man in the brown suit walked out of the bar looking around, walking through the dirty streets until he heard a PSST. Hey you, in the suit. A masculine voice called out. The man turned around to see a man in a light purple suit with silver hair and black eyes. Who are you? He asked. My name's Mary Kusagi. I'm a Yakuza. Mayuri greeted him and the man in the brown suit raised an eyebrow. And? He asked. I used to work for Kanjira Samsuk, a crime boss for the group in Kaminari no Kuni. Mayuri answered and got the man's attention. Really? I heard he was killed by a group of ninja. He states and he nods. Yes he did and I have a new boss that's interested in your boss's operation in this country. Mayuri said and the man raised an eyebrow. Really? And how exactly did your boss come across this information? He asks and Mayuri smirks. My boss had eyes and ears everywhere. He answered before asking. How about we discuss this in a more secluded place? What is your name by the way? It's Hamada Tashi. Hamada answered. Well then Hamada Tashi, follow me. Mayuri insisted and they walked away and entered an empty building. The door closes and Hamada raises and at Mayuri who just stood in front of him smirking. Well? What is it you wanted to discuss? He asked. Asumi appears behind him, and before the man could react she covered his mouth and nose with a handkerchief that was coated with sedative. Amada's eyes widen and struggles for a while, but then he blacks out and collapses. Well, that was easy. Mayuri said in a feminine voice and dispersed in a puff of smoke, revealing a smirking Ayan. Mamiji appears out of the shadows also while Kasumi starts to tie the guy's arms and legs with ninja wire. Good work, Ayan. Kasumi said to her sister for her actions. Thanks. Have you two ran into any of Gato's henchmen? She asked. I took care of some of them, but there were no black spider nin. Mamiji stated. Beidou's probably using them as security guards. Kasumi answered. Ayan pulls an anbu mask on as does Kasumi and Mamiji. Thirty minutes later, Amada wakes up and sees that his arms and legs are tied up. His eyes widen in fear. Oh shit. He says to himself but then freaks out when three kanoichi wearing animal masks appear in front of him. Wh who are you? He asked, shaken. That's none of your concern. Kasumi replied before asking. You're gonna give us some info on your boss or else. Or else what? Hamada tries to act brave, but then Ayan pulls out a kunai. Or else, we'll cut those beads of yours and then heal them with our medic and repeat the process. She said with a menacing voice and aimed the sharp end at his crotch. Hamada pales and then speaks up. Okay, I'll talk. I swear I won't lie to you about the info I'm giving you. He replied not wanting to go through that. For your sake, you better not lie to us. Mamiji said and stabbed her Najinata in the ground, making the man whimper. With Team Akuma, Naruto, Tsuki, and Ryu were leaping through the trees until Naruto stopped as did his teammates. What is it, Naruto? Ryu asked, wondering. Naruto motioned them to leap into the higher parts of the trees, and they did. When they landed on the tallest branch, Naruto spoke up. The cage bunch and I sent out earlier spotted some Kanohan in with a bridge builder. He answered and their eyes widened. How many? Tsuki asked about them. Eight of them, two of them are Jinin, and the other six are Genin. They must be the senseis of the Genin squads. One of them happens to be Sharingan Kakashi and Jinjutsu Mistress Kurinai. Naruto answered and their eyes widened even more. Until Naruto sighed, letting his teammates wonder. What's wrong? Tsuki wondered if Tsuki was curious about her brother's behavior. According to my clone's info. She's there. That made it wider from their eyes. You mean? Ryu is about to realize, getting a nod from the blonde. He and Tsuki knew he had his first friend. So, what should we do? Tsuki asked. I mean. Are you going to see her if something happens to her? We'll stand clear of them for now. And the second yes, I will see if she's there. Naruto says. Ryu places his hand on his comm link and speaks up. Naruto, Team Tenshi has captured one of Gato's spies and is getting intel on the man's security and location. Apparently the man is after the bridge builder and has sent some missing nin from Kiri to deal with him. He informed me. Any idea who they are? Naruto asked. The demon brothers and demon of the mists abuse Mamachi. Ryu answered. Tsuki's eyes widened at the name of the demon of the mist. Am? 
An A-class missing min. This just complicates our mission. He's one of the seven swordsmen of the mist. She states and Naruto nods. Okay, this is what we'll do. We'll keep an eye on the Konohan Inn and the bridge builder. If they get into trouble, we'll assist them. Ryu tells Aan that once they're done getting info off the man, wipe his memory and head back to the camp to rest. Naruto said determined. Ryu nods and informs them to wipe the man's memories and head back to the camp and rest. After that team Akuma saw the group of Konohan in walking through a path and saw a puddle which they passed by. So, they have an Inuzuka, an Aburam, and a Haikta. They're probably a tracker squad. Then there's the other team. An Ichiha and two who are unknown. Ryu commented. Before he noticed one of them felt a strong chakra signature conceal her. Something strange about this one. Tsuki scoffs when they pass by the puddle and wonders. Are you kidding me? Didn't they notice that for Kami's sakes, what do they teach the ninja in their village? Before she noticed one of them too. As for this girl, is she the one Nyson is talking about? Getting a nod from Ryu. That was when the demon brothers leaped out of the puddle and wrapped their chains around a shocked Kakashi and Kurinai. With a tug of their gauntlets, they ripped the Jinins apart and went after the Genin and bridge builder. Sai managed to stop their pursuit by stopping their chains with a tan and separated it from their gauntlets. Jizo charged at the bridge builder and Sakura was trembling as he swung his poison claw at her. Sasuke decided to show off and tried to strike the nin with a roundhouse kick, but the missing nin blocked the kick and swatted the boy aside like a fly. Sakura was trying to defend herself. She tried to fight back. I'm to die, little girl. Jizo says as he continues to charge at her. Sai frowns and then appears in front of Sakura to block the claw with his tanto. Kami, you are useless, flat chest. Sai stated as he kicked the nin in the chest, making him skid back a couple of feet. Letting herself be a shame. Ska. Piercing fang, Kiba cries out, and Jizo's eyes widen when he sees a spinning cyclone heading for him. He sidesteps the attack only to cry out in pain when Hinata strikes him in the back with a strike and collapses. Brother. Why you little Maizu growls out and gets ready to charge at her only to feel his body getting weak. Wh why do I feel so weak? He wondered, but then looked at his arms and saw black beetles crawling all over him. Shino appears behind him and backhands the ninja in the temple, knocking him out. You shouldn't ever take your eyes off your opponent, no matter how weak they appear. Shino states and tilts his sunglasses up. That was when Kakashi and Kurinai appeared. Excellent work, team. You managed to knock them out without our assistance. And you, Sasuke, you shouldn't have tried to show off. Kakashi states. As the Ichiha stood up shaking the cobwebs out of his head. Don't berate me, berate my useless teammate. He mumbles and Sakura flinches at being called useless. She mentally growled. Kakashi frowns at his response. She actually tried to defend the bridge builder, and if it wasn't for Sai, they'd both be dead. Until he'll face Tazuna with a nervous expression. Anyways, Tazuna cares to explain why these missing nin came after you. He asked in a voice that meant he was serious and the man gulped. Back in the trees, Naruto, Tsuki, and Ryu saw the short battle. Naruto was frowning about how spoiled Ichiha scolded his teammate. Ryu had the same boat about the Ichiha for being a show-off, and Tsuki was disappointed. Well, at least one team seems competent. The Ichiha was pathetic. Showing off like that, what a joke. He's probably the runt of his family. Ryu commented and Tsuki agreed with a nod. Yes, that was very pathetic. No wonder the entire clan was killed. They were probably weak, and also. She said. Naruto nodded and looked at one of the genins. Yes. And includes her, she had tried to fight back, but something felt strange within her, but. She is keeping a secret from her team. I sense a surpassed seal that prevents her from being suspicious about her true self as well. Raya nods about Naruto's statement. Yup, she did keep secrets. But more importantly, looks. The three dragon nin banished. As the two squads were leaving, Kakashi was looking over at the tree. Kurinai saw this and asked. What is it, Kakashi? We're being watched the whole time. He started and her eyes widened. Do you think they were ninjas working for Gato? She asked. I doubt it. If they wanted to attack, they would have done it by now and killed Tizuna. He replied. So what should we do? Kurinai asked. Nothing, for now. They don't seem to be interested in us, so they're not a threat at the moment. Kakashi states and she nods. So after that, they went to join up with their squads. The leaf ninjas were now riding a boat to cross the ocean to get to wave country. Until one of the team within her thoughts. I wonder how is he? It's been eight years since we haven't seen each other. Alright, now the glove is off, and sooner or later. I will not give up for myself, and then. I will find him. Soon. When they got closer to the shore of Wave they saw the biggest bridge that they had ever seen. Okay, this is as far as I am going to take you, I already risked more than I had to, now get off. The boat driver said with fear in his voice. The group got off the boat and began to walk on the road heading to the client's house. As they walked the mist seemed to get denser and denser. 
Sasuke felt something and to try to act cool, threw a shuriken into the bush getting the group into alert. They slowly walked towards the bush to find a white snow rabbit. Wait a minute. Why is that rabbit skin so white when it's spring? The skin of rabbits is always brown in the spring, not white. Sakura asked as they noticed the rabbit's no white skin and read about them in one of her books. The group looked at Sakura after looking at the rabbit and had the same thing going through their minds. When did Sakura get smart and stay sharp? Unlike she was a fangirl before her change of behavior. Kakashi thought, wondering. I'll find out soon enough. Or is it what mabuki san is trying to say? So he decided to play along. Or do his shinobi part. Sakura's right. That's because the enemy was keeping it in a cage to use it for body switching. Which means the enemy is already here. Everyone, be on your guard. Kakashi added to Sakura's observation. Better look underneath, underneath on Sakura, after we. Suddenly they heard a whistling sound. Everyone get down. Kakashi yelled as a giant sword came flying at them and almost took their heads off when they ducked. The sword was sent into a tree where a man stood on the hilt of it. Well look at who we have here the copycat ninja and the ice queen of Konoha, no wonder my men were defeated. The man said. Zabuza Mamachi, the demon of the bloody mist. To think someone of your reputation is working for scum like Gato. Kakashi said as he got into his battle stance. Zabuza looks at him and shrugs then says. Well it pays and that's all that matters now I will give you a chance, give me the old man and I will let you all leave here alive. You know, we can't do that. Kurin I said. Very well. I guess you all will die here today. Zabuza says as he pulls his Zambatu out of the tree and lands in the middle of the lake and performs a few hand seals. Nin. Kurigakur no Jutsu, Ninja Arts. Silent Mist Technique. Zabuza said, and then the whole field was engulfed in a very thick mist. The Genin guards Tazuna while Kakashi reveals his Sharingan eye and Kurinai starts to perform some hand seals. What's going on? This mist is so thick. Sakura said. This isn't good at all. This technique is specialized for silent killing, which Abusa was an expert of. You won't even know you're dead until you are. You guys better be careful. Kakashi explains, alerting them of a possible attack. The mist is getting thicker. Kiba said as he noticed it getting thicker. Eight choices. Zabuza started to say. Where is he? Sasuke asked. Did you know that there are eight vital spots in the human body that if struck could spell instant death? Liver, lungs, spine, clavicle vein, neck, brain, kidneys, heart. Tell me little Jen in which one of these spots do you want me to strike in order to kill you? Zabuza asked, using his voice projection and scaring the Jenin. Not far from their location was Team Akuma, who was watching the battle from the trees. This should be interesting. Former Anbu vs Former Anbu. They both have experience in their fields, but Zabuza apparently has the advantage when it comes to stealth. Naruto comments and Ryu looks at him. How so, Naruto? Ryu asked. Zabuza Mamachi was a member of the assassination squad in Kiri's Anbu force. Naruto explained. He's a master of the silent kill. From what my mother told me, he's mastered it to the point where all he needs to do is hear an irregular heartbeat or a twitch of your finger, and you're dead. To pull something like that off takes a lot of skill. Not to mention he has high levels of water in his arsenal. That caused Ryu's eyes to widen in amazement. That is incredible. He could probably give some of the dragon nin a run for their money. Too bad he's a missing nin. He'd make a good addition to our village. Ryu states. That was when they saw Zabuza kick Kakashi into the lake and the copy nin gets trapped in a Suro no water prison technique. Kurinai ended up getting struck in the shoulder by his blade and was kneeling down clutching her bleeding shoulder in pain. Well, that was easy. I expected more from you, Kakashi and Kurinai. I guess you're nothing more than tree huggers. Once I kill the mistress, you brats are next. He comments and creates a dozen water clones. Run. Get Kurinai and the bridge builder out of here. Kakashi yelled out, but the six were frozen in fear. Four water clones appear on every side of her with Kubakiri Hacho raised and ready to cut her down. Sensei. Hinata cried out as she saw the blades come down at her in slow motion. Kurinai closes her eyes, waiting for her death. That was when a flash of silver was seen cutting down the clones and they stood still for a while. They then dispersed into water, shocking Zabuza. What the hell? Who did that? He yells out. I did, demon of the mist. Said a calm yet dark voice. That was when a 14-year-old male with wild blonde spiky hair wearing a deep blue and silver bodysuit with a face mask, arm guards and fingerless gloves appeared in front of Kurinai with Rickon drawn. Zabuza narrows his eyes at the newcomer. And who the hell are you, brat? He demanded while releasing Kai on Naruto who just shrugs it off. Me? I'm your executioner. Naruto proclaimed. Naruto vanishes and appears beside a shocked Zabuza and a surprised Kakashi. Zabuza is suddenly hit in the side of the head by a roundhouse kick courtesy of Naruto and is sent flying away from the blonde. This right here forces the man to free Kakashi from the water prison. Kakashi was drenched in water and gasping for air. 
Zabuza skids in the water and glares at the blonde teenager. I don't know who you are, brat. But you're in the way of my job. I suggest you leave before I add your death to my list. He threatens, but Naruto scoffs. You don't scare me, demon of the mist. I have fought and killed ninjas that would make you look like a child and as for being a demon. Ha. Huh. Don't make me laugh. I have had encounters with the real thing and you, my friend, aren't a demon. You are merely a human with the title of one. He said determined and Zabuza had a dark grin on his face. You have guts, kid. Too bad I have to spill them. Zabuza pulled his Zambatu out on his back. Naruto sheathes his blade and taps a seal on his gauntlet. It blows in a puff of smoke. A blade that seemed to be the same size as Zabuza's Kubikiri Haucho only this one was bronze colored. The blade was wicked looking, having razor sharp carved edges on each side. The cross guard was curved also, and it had a long hilt that is used for a two-handed grip, and on the end of it was a red gem on the pommel. Naruto grabs the hilt and twirls it in his hand. Everyone's eyes, minus one with amazed, bulge out of their heads when they see this. How the hell does he do that? That sword must weigh over 100 pounds. Kiba yells out. Hinata runs towards her injured sensei and pulls out a small med kit with Sakura accompanying her before looking at Naruto that she notices a dragon symbol on his back. That must be. Sensei. Are you alright? She asks and Kurinai looks at her student and Sakura and nods, but winces in agony. Here, let me patch that injury. She said as she pulled out some healing cream and bandages, then she and Sakura did learn first aid. Zabuza had a look of shock on his face when he was a kid, no older than 14 hoist a blade that heavy without even struggling. Like it? It's called a blihero, and that kid was correct. This sword weighs over 100 pounds. But it is powerful enough to cut down trees and boulders like they were paper. In the hands of a master swordsman however, it can create shockwaves that can cut half a city block. He explained. Zabuza looks at the blade and snorts. I'll admit. It's pretty impressive that you can lift a blade that heavy, but I doubt you can use it correctly. He commented. To be honest with you Mamachi, I don't really like using Zambatus because they lack speed and leave me open for my enemy to attack unless I'm fighting a large enemy. I prefer my blades over this weapon. He referred. Heh. Well at least you admit that a blade of that size isn't suited for you. He said and hoists his blade over his shoulder. You misunderstood me. I said I didn't like using it. In my village, we are taught to use every single form of weapon from A to a Zambatu. That way our options aren't limited to a single weapon. Naruto states and Zabuza lifts an eyebrow. And what village do you hail from, kid? He asked curiously. The only village that isn't a part of the elemental nations. The Hayabusa village. Naruto answered. Zabuza's eyes widened in surprise. The Hayabusa village. So you're a dragon nin. He was shocked that his shinobi is from the non-elemental village. Yes I am. Naruto answered. As he then charges at the shocked man. Zabuza managed to get out of his shocked state long enough to block the attack. He lets out a grunt as the two Zambatu grind against each other. The Kashi manages to get back on land and helps Kurinai up after Hinata and Sakura finish treating her wound, and the Rosette helps her up before helping Kakashi. They then head back to the others and watch as Naruto engages with Zabuza in a sword fight. Ah no. Kurinai sensei. What is a dragon nin? The Haika heiress asked. While Sakura watched the fight, Kurinai answered with an explanation. The dragon nin are the ninja who hailed from the Hayabusa village, the oldest non-elemental village that isn't a part of our country by one of them. It's a village from the west. The dragon nin are the shinobi of that village, and unlike each of the hidden villages, they don't have a ninja academy. That gets shocking looks from everyone. Minus Sakura while watching the fight with Odd. For she overheard. No way. Their village doesn't have an academy. Then how do they become shinobi? Kiba asked, sounding surprised. Akashi joined in and explained Kiba's question. They are trained by their family members at a young age, and then they do simulations to see what they excel at and pair them up with other ninja. From what the boy said they're trained in every single art of the ninja, even ones they don't major in. That is how they are able to succeed on missions. Dragon Nin are known to be ruthless and show no mercy to their enemies. That made the genin have shocked looks on their faces. Minus one with a slight nod to understand it. Sasuke was growling at the fact that someone his age can be this strong. Because of his arrogance and selfishness. He was so called elite, he was always strong, not a foreign shinobi. Great Akami, you will never face a dragon nin on the opposite side because if you do, you're dead. Even the genin of that village are known to be deadly to even shinin level nin. Kakashi said since he has on occasion seen how dragon nin fight and they are not to be trifled with. Back at the fight, Zabuza had to duck from an overhead slash from Dabliaro, Naruto unleashes a kick towards his head and it makes contact with Zabuza's skull and sends him skidding back. He looks up at Naruto and charges at the blonde dragon. Their blades clash once again, and they perform a series of slashes, stabs, and blocks. Zabuza performs a sword thrust at Naruto's chest. 
as the blonde leaps over the attack and lands on the other side. He then charges its abuser and attempts to stab him through the back, but the man blocks it with the flat end of his sword and is pushed back a little. Naruto then turns his blade upwards and pushes up using his strength. This forces Abusa's guard to break and he is left open to an attack. Naruto performs a diagonal slash and vivisections Abusa in half. Zabuza however dispersed into water. Impressive. He substituted himself with a water clone. I guess the swordsmen of the mist are competent after all. Naruto admitted. Zabuza rises from the water performing a series of hand seals and stops at the bird hand seal. Zurikin no jutsu. Water release. Water dragon bullet, Zabuza cries out, and a dragon made of water rises slowly out of the water roaring. Naruto performs a series of one hand seals and stops at the tiger seal. Sujin Heki. Water release. Water formation wall, he muttered and a large wall of water appeared in front of him. The dragon collides with a wall of water, but it soon overpowers the wall and breaks through it. Zabuza had a look of glee in his face as he saw his technique overpowered by the dragon nin. Not so great after all, are you brat? He asks as he sees no sign of the blonde boy. He was about to gloat more, but that was when Naruto leaped out of the water behind the man. Zabuza's eyes widened in shock, and he slowly turned around only to have three more Naruto appear on all four sides of the man performing hand seals. Hayton. Karyu Enden. Fire release. Fire dragon flame bullet, Sarikton. Erikton. Lightning release. Lightning dragon bullet, Butin. Kazurikton. Wind release. Wind dragon bullet, all four Naruto's unleashed each elemental dragon and said dragon's head straight for a wide-eyed Zabuza. The four attacks collide, and the combination of the elements causes an explosion that sends a large shockwave across the water and the land, causing everyone to cover their eyes. Damn it, Naruto Nai. Did you have to put that much power into those attacks? Tsuki muttered to herself and complained a little. Zabuza is seen flying out of the explosion and onto land, crashing through a few trees and skids through the ground until he hits another three. The demon of the mist was battered, bruised, and had cuts and burns all over most of his body. That was when a volley of kunai strikes the man in several places, and he cries out in pain. Naruto appears in front of the injured man with Rick and drawn. Damn. To think I'm being done by a kid. He mumbles and Naruto raises his blade and prepares to bring it down on the man until Zabuza's body jerks and he collapses onto the ground and remains motionless. His neck was struck by two needles. Naruto jumps back and looks around with his sword ready and sees two people wearing hunter nin outfits and both of them appear to be male or female. It had raven black hair that was tied into a bun, and the other is white hair, a wolf oni mask, grey vest, white shirt, grey pants, black fingerless gloves, and sandals standing in the tree branch. Hunter Nin. Naruto mutters Shunshin and appears next to the dead form of Zabuza. Thank you for weakening him, Dragon Nin. We've been hunting him for some time. The raven hair said. Naruto narrows his eyes at the two and keeps a firm grip on his blade. Is that so? Then go on ahead, behead him and burn the body. He started and they tense up. Unless of course, you two are not actual hunter nin, and you are playing the role of one to save him. Naruto states. That was when a barrage of white needles flew right for him, and he leapt to the side. The hunter nin with the white hair threw another barrage of white needles from its fingers, and Naruto once again leaps back to avoid them. Let's get out of here, the other two are coming. He suggested and the raven-haired girl nodded. They shunshin away with the body of Zabuza while Naruto sighs and sheaths his blade. Ryu and Tsuki appear beside Naruto and look around. They got away. Suki asked and Naruto nodded. Damn. Oh well, with the injuries you gave him, he shouldn't be active for a while. Getting a nod from Ryu. Naruto turns his head to see the Kanohan in heading towards their direction. Before seeing someone laying his eyes at her. Wonder what they want? Ryu asked and Naruto shrugged. Don't know, don't care. They're not our problem. Let's head back to the camp. Naruto said before rolling his eyes sideways, behind the same girl. I'll see you soon. And they shunshin away, leaving Kakashi, Kurinai, and the others wondering what they were doing in Nami no Kuni. With a certain pink hair, hold her hands on her chest. That blonde hair. Isn't that? Maybe. Chapter 6. Wave, Fiends, and Hunters PT2. The sun was setting, and the three dragon nin appeared back in the camp. Aan, Kasumi, and Mamiji caught a boar and had it cooking over a fire on a pike and were sitting on a log when they appeared. Hey guys. Suki gets a nod from the three girls. What took you guys so long? Kasumi asked about yesterday. We ran into some Kanohan in and Zabuza Mamachi the demon of the mist. Naruto answered, seriously. The three Kanoichi had wide eyes and shocked looks. What? You ran into the demon of the mist and Kanohan in. Mamiji exclaimed. Actually, Naruto did and saved the Jinin. The rest were Jinin. Ryu answered. Naruto nods in return and that was when Aan narrowed her eyes and gave him a look that said explain or else. Naruto was smiling and rubbing the back of his head nervously. 
I only freed the men afterwards fought him for a while, but he underestimated me which gave me an advantage. I came close to killing him, but he was rescued by some fake hunter nin. He explained to her while she walked up to him and looked him right in the eye. And also. I was able to see her while we watched them. Really? Ayan frowned, since she knew about a certain girl he met her for being a first friend. Really? Naruto exclaimed, frightened. Ryu and Tsuki were snickering at how their teammate was shifting his feet in an uncomfortable manner. Ayan looked at him for a while, but then sighs and pulls down his face mask and kisses him on the lips, while Naruto returns it, Kasumi and Mamiji had depressed looks on their face and looked away for a while. And also the certain girl he told them. But. Why Ayan was not jealous or upset. It's like it's okay at least. But what did she mean? They're wondering why Ayan is not jealous. After their little kissing session, Ayan smacked him on the back of the head, making him yelp out in pain. Ow. Ayan chan what was that for? Naruto cried while rubbing the back of his head. That was for being a baka. The next time you want to take on an A-rank missing nin, make sure you have to call back up. She growled out making her boyfriend sweat bullets. He then heard a whipping sound come from Ryu and turned his head to glare at his best friend while the Hayabusa was trying to look innocent. What? Ryu asked while Tsuki giggles and elbows him in the ribs. Anyways, did that guy you capture give you the location of Gato's base of operation? Ryu asked for the info from Team Tenshi. Asumi shakes her head in response. No, but we're able to find out the locations of where he smuggles his imports. He said that Gato has a guy who's in charge of where they smuggle drugs and females go and comes to do inspections of the bases near Wave on Wednesdays from 1.30pm to 8.45pm and reports to Gato how the transfers are going the next day at 9.30am. This man wears a blue suit with a hat that has a white feather on it. The first base he goes to is the one near the northwestern side of the docks near Nami no Kuni. She explained. So our best bet is to head there and wait for this guy to appear at that time and follow him. He'll probably have Black Spider Nin guarding him since bandits would be out of the question. Suki states getting nods from both of them. Yeah, but what about those ninja from Kanoha? Are they gonna be a problem? Mamiji asked Suki and Ryu spoke up. From the way those genin fight, no. But Sharingan no Kakashi and Kurana Yuuhi, the Jinjutsu mistress could be a problem especially since he has the Sharingan in his left eye. He stated. Best thing to do is not use any that is from our village in his presence or the Achiha, but I doubt he has it now. After the discussion, they go ahead and eat the boar Ayan, Kasumi, and Mamiji caught, and when night hits, they go to their tents. Ryu and Tsuki stayed in the first one, Kasumi and Mamiji shared the second one, and Naruto and Ayan shared the last one. As the couple were holding each other, Ayan was resting her head on his chest while he had his arms wrapped around her waist. Hey, Naruto-kun. Ayan called getting the blonde's attention. Yeah, Tenshi. He responds and tickles her sides making her giggle until she slaps him playfully on the shoulder. Stop it. You know Kasumi and Mamiji have feelings for you right? Especially her. She asked her boyfriend whose eyes widened a little. Really? But why are you telling me this? Naruto asked. Simple. I wanted to know if you're considering letting them be your future wives. And also her if she'll join us. She replied, causing him to gawk. Why you're serious? He asked with a shocked look on his face. Ayan smiles and nods while Naruto stares at her for a while before asking her why and asking seriously. Why would you ask me this, Ayan chan The violet-haired Kinoichi sighs and explains. Look, Naruto. I know you and Ryu-san have to go through the Clan Restoration Act in order to revive your clans. I know Kasumi Nichin and Mamiji-chan have feelings for you and want to be with you as well. As the blonde dragon nin listened. I want them to be happy and if you are what makes them happy, then I want them to be with you as well. Ayan finished. I see. I'll talk to them about it and if they agree. I'll go on a few dates with them before getting into a relationship with them. Before I met her, trained her, and dated too, in one night. And I'll talk to Ka-san about this. How does that sound? Naruto replied with a statement. Ayan nods her head and smiles at him. I think it is a great idea. The next day, the six of them got up early and packed up all their gear and afterwards entered the country via leaping through the rooftop stealthily, heading to the northwestern section of the village where the docks are located. The six of them land on the roof of a warehouse and Naruto stops them with a hand signal. They wait for about 45 minutes and see a boat stop near one of the docks and walking out of it was a man in his mid-thirties wearing a blue suit with a top hat that had a white feather on it and flanking him were four black spider nin. That's him. And he's being flanked by four black spider nin. Ayan stated while Kasumi narrowed her eyes. This seems odd. Only four spider nin are guarding him. She started seeing four spider nins guarding a blue suit man. Naruto nods at her statement. Yeah, I agree. There's no way only four of them would be guarding him. The others are probably watching them from hidden areas around here. We'll proceed with caution. He instructed them to get nods from them as they watched a man head towards a warehouse. 
A six ran and leapt from the rooftops of the other buildings and watched the man in the blue suit make his rounds throughout the small bases. After watching him for the last four hours, he makes his way to a yacht with his guards. Mamiji pulls out a scroll, opens it up and in a puff of smoke, the Tenkyaku, Heavensong bow, and a quiver of arrows that were in a carrying pouch, appears in her hands. She pulls out four arrows, places them on the bowstring and pulls them back, aiming at the four spider ninja in high accuracy with a keen sight. And. You guys know quiver is a container for arrows, bolts and darts. She waits for them to move a little further and fires the four arrows. At the docks the four spider ninja pause when they hear the sound of projectiles heading towards them. That was when they were hit by arrows, one was hit between the eyes, killing him instantly. The second one was hit directly in the spine, paralyzing him from the waist down. The third one was struck by an arrow from behind which pierced his heart and killed him instantly. And the final one had the last arrow lodged into his jugular, making him choke and gargle on his own blood before collapsing. Doji, the man with the blue suit, saw his bodyguards collapse instantly and he looked around, fearing for his life. He then looked up to see a Kinoichi aiming an arrow at him. Oh shit. He mutters and tries to make a run for it, only for Mamiji to fire the arrow. Toji suddenly cried out in pain when the arrow lodged itself into the back of his left leg and fell over, clutching his bleeding limb with one hand and crawling towards the ship with the other. That was when Naruto and Ryu appeared in front of the scared man with their arms crossed, and Kasumi, Ayan, and Tsuki appeared with face masks on. WH who are you? Toji asked the mysterious assassins. Your executioners, if you don't tell us where your boss is hiding. Kasumi proclaimed, causing Toji's eyes to widen. Why you mean Gato? I, I can't tell you he'll kill me. He tries to explain, but that was when Naruto pulled out Raikin and aimed it at the man's throat. Beto is the last person you should be worrying about. I'm here, he's not and I'm way worse than him. He started releasing Kai on the man who was now soiling himself. Naruto would have continued, but had to use his katana in order to deflect three kunai knives that were aimed at his head. Ryu's eyes widened, and he leaped backwards when two incendiary shuriken hit the spot he was at earlier. The projectiles exploded into a flash of light, forcing Ayan, Kasumi, and Tsuki to cover up their eyes from being blinded as did Naruto and Ryu. When the flash cleared, Ryu opened his eyes and saw a spider ninja appear and grab the injured man. Ryu runs towards the ninja and the injured target but then had to duck when an axe flew past his head and saw another spider ninja who was standing on the yacht with another axe in his hand. He smirks under his mask and throws the other one towards Tsuki's head. Tsuki move. Ryu yelled out. The redeed turned around and her eyes widened when she saw an axe heading towards her and didn't have enough time to dodge it. That was when Mamiji appeared in front of her and deflected it with her Najinata. Thanks Mamiji. Tsuki appreciated and Mamiji nodded back. No problem Tsuki. The spider ninja who threw the axes leaped and landed next to an injured Toji, picked him up and hoisted him on his shoulder. What a disappointment. I expected more from you dragon ninja. He said mockingly and looked at the spider ninja that appeared earlier. You and the others deal with them. He said and vanished instantly. The spider ninja wearing gauntlets on both arms appeared behind Ayan and Kasumi and was about to lop their heads off until Naruto appeared and kicked the ninja directly in the chest and sent him flying into a few crates. More spider ninja with katanas, gauntlets, and axes appeared surrounding the teenagers who pulled their favorite weapons out. Looks like we're gonna be busy tonight, Mina, everyone. Naruto mumbles, getting nods of agreement from them while the spider ninja walks around them in a full circle, waiting for a chance to strike. One spider ninja leaped at Kasumi with the claws on his right arm swinging at her torso. She sidesteps the attack and strikes him in the side of the head with her elbow. The assassin is dazed from the counter-attack, and Ayan takes this opportunity and slashes him diagonally across the chest, causing blood to spray out, and then decapitates him. She then leaps over a charging spider ninja, but then wraps her legs around his head from behind. She plants her arms on the ground and uses her lower body strength to lift the man off his feet and slams him head first into concrete and flips back on her feet. She then stabs a kunai into his chest and leaps away when the tag on the knife sizzles but then explodes, spraying blood and burned flesh everywhere. Naruto dodges a sword swing aimed at his torso and punches the spider nin twice in the ribs, making a few cracks. The spider ninja coughs up blood and stumbles while Naruto leaps over him, grabs his enemy by the head, flips and throws his enemy into another spider ninja, and they are sent flying off the dock and crashing into the water. Tsuki and Mamiji were dodging, blocking, and striking at the spider ninja that were attacking them in a dance of death. While Mamiji would block and avert the strikes, Tsuki would strike them down with her blades and kunai knives. Ryu slides on the ground past a spider and tries to vivisect him with his katana and wakizashi, but the young dragon hacks off both of his legs, making him fall over, and then stabs the nin in the skull, killing him instantly. Ten minutes later, the docks were littered with the bodies, blood, and limbs of the spider nin. Naruto lets out a frustrating sigh and brushes his hair back. That bastard got away, damn it. 
Now, we lost our only lead to Gato. He was irritated. Ryu kicks one of the bodies into the water while Mamiji and Tsuki dispose of them with fire. Yes. This mission just got more complicated now that the spider nin knows we're after Gato. Ayan was cleaning off her fumikadachi with a cloth and then realized something. The bridge builder. She said the answer for her, getting Kasumi's attention. What was that, Nisan? Kasumi asks her half-sister. Seeing Ayan quickly turn to Naruto. Naruto was Abusa after the bridge builder, correct? She asked the blonde who nodded, but then his eyes widened. I can't believe I didn't realize it sooner. The bridge builder was Gato's target. Without him, the bridge won't be completed, so Gato would either target him or the man's family. He stated. So the bridge builder is our key to getting Gato. Tsuki stated about the connection between the bridge builder, the spider nin and Zabuza. Yes. Pretty soon, Gato will have no choice but to come after the bridge builder. Mamiji replies until Kasumi speaks up. What about Zabuza and the spider nin hired? Due to the damage I've caused on the man, he won't be up for at least two weeks. That gives us plenty of time to wipe out Gato's smuggling stations on the island. First, we need to find the bridge builder's home. Our base of operation will be there for now. Naruto said, getting nods from them. Himakuma and Team Tenshi were leaping through the rooftops until they heard a scream and stopped. They then saw a bunch of people running out of a bar and a roar was heard. Naruto, Ryu, and Tsuki's eyes become slanted and their arms twitch. I sensed a fiend in that bar. Naruto said in a dark tone. The three of them leap off the rooftop and land on the ground, heading towards the location of the fiend. Ayan sighs and motions the two Kanoichi to follow her. Inside the bar, Naruto, Ryu and Tsuki run into the bar while the other people run out of the building, screaming about a monster. What they see shocks them. It was a large red devilish bipedal dinosaur-like creature with clawed arms, two horns, dinosaur-like jaws and a reptilian tail. It is twice the height of a full-grown human. In its maw was the bloody body of a human. Blood was dripping down its maw as it chomped down on its prey. It's a gala. Naruto muttered as he slowly drew his blade as did Ryu, and they moved forward carefully. The gala continued to chomp down in the human until it paused and growled, making the two dragons tense up. The creature glared at a figure that was slowly walking towards it. The creature snarled and hissed at the person approaching it. The person was female. She was 5'6 with blonde hair tied into a high ponytail. She had pale skin, platinum blonde hair, and icy blue eyes. She was dressed in a black leather outfit. It was a leather jacket and leather pants with knee-high boots. She also wore a tank top that showed off her midriff and had a massive warhammer strapped to her back. She appeared to be 17 and had a figure that would make any man keel over. The gala tosses its meal aside onto a broken table and green saliva drips from its maw and its green tongue hangs out of its mouth. Hunger filled its yellow eyes and slowly approached his new prey. Ryu was about to intervene until Naruto stopped him with his arm. Ryu gave Naruto a questioning look and the blonde looked back at him. Let's see how this goes. He stated before turning his attention to the scene. The gala growls and crouches down at the blonde female. It then leaps forward with its maw open wide and its claws ready to tear the female apart. Without warning, the blonde female pulled her warhammer off her back and swung it instantly. The creature lets out a shriek due to the fact that the sharp edge of the warhammer severed its upper jaws from its body and was sent flying backwards into a pool table. Red and green blood oozed from its severed head and twitched violently as it melted away. The blonde then wipes the blood off her weapon and places it on her back. She then notices a group of ninja who just saw what she did and raises her eyebrow. There was only silence in the room, and that was when Naruto spoke up. That was impressive. You took down that gala like it was nothing. He said impressed. Ah thanks. I guess. She replied. Are you by any chance a mercenary? Tsuki asked only to get a head shake as an answer. No, I'm a fiend hunter. She answered Tsuki's question. Fiend hunter? I thought they all passed away after the genocide. Ayan stated the woman chuckles and speaks up. Unfortunately, I'm one of the few remaining on this world, so we are close to being extinct. Plus the genocide was caused by a greater fiend. She answered with venom in her voice. As the blonde women continue. Anyway, let's go somewhere away from this place and I'll explain everything. She said and walked out of the bar with the six following her. Takra no Mori, Forest of Chakra. The blonde was leaning against a tree with her arms crossed over her chest and her weapon resting beside her while the two teams sat on the logs. My name is Rachel, since you'll already know my profession, I'm a fiend hunter. Rachel proclaimed, and that was when they introduced themselves, starting with Mamiji. I'm Mamiji Higarashi, a Kinoichi for the Hayabusa village and protector of the Hayabusa clan's treasure. I'm Ayan Tenshin, former member of the Mugen Tenshin clan and Kinoichi for the Hayabusa village. Ayan said. Kasumi Tenshin, heiress of the Mugen Tenshin clan and Ayan's half-sister. Kasumi said. Ryu Hayabusa, clan heir of the second branch of the Hayabusa clan. Ryu said. Tsuki Yuzumaki Namikis. 
daughter of the god Enrikage Kishina Yuzumaki Namikas and late Yandame Hokage Minato Namikas. I'm the heiress of the main branch of the Hayabusa, Yuzumaki and Namikas clan. Tsuki said. And I'm Naruto Yuzumaki Namikas, older brother of Tsuki Yuzumaki Namikas, heir to the main branch of the Hayabusa, Yuzumaki and Namikas clan. Son of the god Enrikage Kishina Yuzumaki Namikas and late Yandame Hokage Minato Namikas. He finished. Rachel looked at them with wide eyes, but then they returned to normal. I see. So you're all ninja. She asks for getting nods in return. Yes, we are currently on a classified mission. Ryu explained, and that was when Naruto spoke up. Rachel-san, if I may ask why do I sense the aura of a fiend on you? He asked, causing Rachel to tense up and look away. I was born with the cursed blood of the fiend. Well I'm not like them, I have inherited their powers, but I can lose myself to my cursed blood if I'm not careful. She explained ashamed. So, you've inherited the fiend bloodline like the Black Spider Clan. No wonder the fiend's energy I felt was so strong. It's close to matching a greater fiend's. Tsuki stated. So, you're hunting fiends in these parts. Mamiji asked about Rachel's business. Yes, but unfortunately the fiend's sightings are small, and that gala was one of the few I've ever encountered here. However most of them are appearing around the larger continents. She explained making their eyes go widen. So the fiends are appearing in the larger continents. This isn't good. The only way they can appear so much is if the seal in Fuji broke or a greater fiend or two are in the elemental summoning them. Kasumi said while Rachel nodded about it. Yes, that is another possibility. She concludes and then grabs her warhammer and places it on her back. I must go now and see if I can find out if any greater friends are close. She says and gets ready to leave until Naruto speaks up. Rachel-san, when you get the chance, head to the Hayabusa village and inform my mother about this. If the fiends are starting to appear in the elemental nations, then it's not a good thing. Rachel looked at him and nodded, replied. I will and thanks. Well see you around. With that, she walks into the darkness of the forest and disappears. Alright guys. Naruto said, getting their attention. Our mission has changed. We'll have to protect the bridge builder and his family from Gato's thugs and be on the lookout for Black Spider Ninja at the same time. He states while Tsuki sighs in frustration. Great. She mutters while Ryu chuckles. No one said the mission will be easy Tsuki-chan. He commented. I'm glad it's not for once. Killing crime lords, pirates, and gangs gets kind of boring. Aan started getting nods of agreement from Kasumi and Mamiji. Okay then, we'll search for the bridge builder's home and inform him of our mission, but remember to be cautious of the Kanohan Inn. Naruto warned. You really don't like Kanohan Inn, huh, Naruto? Kasumi asked him, and that made Naruto silent because he mentioned it. After all, you told me and Mamiji about her, she was there when you saved your first friend. After all, her mother took her away from you. Yes, her mother dragged her for protection. But tell me. When you spend half of your childhood getting chazzed and nearly killed by half of them, you wouldn't like them either, Kasumi-chan. He answered in a flat tone while Kasumi flinched and looked down. Sorry. She mumbles, but Naruto sighs. No, it's fine. Now then let's look for the bridge builder's home. He said, mentally add. And hope I can see her too. And they vanish from the forest. Tsuki, Ryu, and Mamiji were looking around the forest area for any sign of the bridge builder or his home, while Naruto, Aan, and Kasumi were searching the small town. They kept leaping from the rooftops until Naruto stopped and saw a female wearing a pink shirt, blue skirt, and had long deep blue hair cornered in an alley with a brown bag in her arms trembling, while two thugs with knives trapped her. Kasumi and Aan did the same and glared at the sight. Even the women aren't safe in this country. Kasumi said with venom etching off her voice. Naruto said nothing and sunshine away from them. Tsunami was trembling and backed into a corner. She was just getting food for her family and guests, and these two thugs grabbed her and shoved her into an alley. The thugs grinned and were about to advance on her until in one of them was sent flying out of the alley via kick to the face, and before the other thug could do anything, he keeled over from a punch to the gut, and his face was shoved into a wall, rendering him unconscious. Naruto was the one responsible for knocking out the thugs and saving her. The blonde threw the unconscious man out of the alley and into a pile of garbage. He then turns his head to a shock and awed Tsunami. Are you okay miss? He asks for a nod in return. Kasumi and Aan appeared next to Naruto making her eat. We're not here to harm you ma'am, so please relax. Aan says in a calm tone while the woman lets out a sigh of relief. Sorry. Thanks for saving me. I'm Tsunami. She answered with an introduction. Naruto Uzumaki Namikas and these are my teammates, Aan Tension and Kasumi Tension. We are ninja from the Hayabusa village and were given a mission by your leader to eliminate Gato. We recently lost someone who had a lot of intel on the man's location and we need to locate the bridge builder and his family since they are the man's primary targets. Naruto explained, causing Tsunami's eyes to widen. You too. 
My father is a bridge builder who has ninjas from Konoha protecting him. Tsunami answers with statements cause their eyes to widen. Getting a slight nod from Naruto. I see. Well then Tsunami-san would be so kind and let us escort you to your home safely. He felt regretful and she nodded. Yes, I would like that Naruto-san. Tsunami replied and that was when Ryu, Tsuki and Mamiji appeared. It's about time you three showed up. Naruto said seeing them here. Tsuki scoffs and ignores her brother. These are my other teammates, Tsuki Uzumaki Namikas, Ryu Hayabusa and Mamiji Higurashi Tsunami-san. We'll be looking out for your family in case your current help is unable to. Naruto said a gesture at the end until Tsuki spoke up. Aniki, why are we protecting her? She asked. She's the bridge builder's daughter. Ayan answered. Oh. After that Tsunami leads them to her house that was near the shores while keeping an eye out for Gato's goons and ninja he hired. Azuna's house. Inside Tazuna's house Kurunai was in the living room, sitting on a couch with her shoulder bandaged up. Better than a certain pink-haired Kanoichi, Kakashi was proud and admitted that she had helped her student learn medical ninjutsu. Kakashi was recovering from chakra exhaustion, so he had to recover on his feet for a couple of days. Before staring at Sakura with a suspicious look with his famous seeing what is underneath, the underneath. When she did get her shinobi training, seriously. The genin were in the room watching Tazuna and Inari, that was when the door opened and Tsunami walked in with the groceries in her arms. I'm back to San, Inari-chan. She called out. Azuna saw his daughter walk in and was about to greet her, but then his eyes widened when he saw six ninja walk in behind her. Tsunami-chan, who are those six ninja behind you? He asked with fear in his voice. As Kiba saw the blonde Rick Nin and cried out with his finger pointed at him. Hey. You're the ninja who took on that Zabuza guy. Kiba's reaction caused them to tense up and Sasuke was getting ready to pull out a kunai. And including a certain pink hair felt nervously to see him or them. Yes. I should know I was practically fighting him, and Ichiha if you don't want to lose that limb of yours, then I suggest that you stop going for your weapons. He replied and suggested in a dark tone, while well behind his left hand, he had a pair of shuriken ready to skewer the boy, before seeing Sasuke was about to take out his weapons. Sasuke saw the look in his eyes, which reminded him of that look Itachi had after he wiped out the clan and gulped a little. This ninja is the real deal. He thought and decided to be smart for once and retract his hand. Smart move. Now then, we are not here to cause trouble, we are only here to complete our mission. Naruto said informed. And what is your mission exactly, Dragon Ninja? Kurinai asked Naruto, curiously. Simple. We are to kill Gato. He answered, getting looks of surprise and shock from them. Kill Gato? Tazuna asked with a look of shock on his face. Yes. Your leader hired us to get rid of the man due to his ties to the criminal underworld and illegal smuggling. Apparently Tazuna-san, you and your family are his targets. Mamiji explained. So you're using us as bait to complete your mission. Tazuna muttered in an angry voice. No. You and your family are not bait. Your lives and safety are very important to us. Suki answered, and that was when Inari scoffed, getting their attention. Oh please. Do you honestly think you can kill Gato? You're all just gonna die. He stated. Inari don't say such things. These ninjas saved my life earlier. Tsunami yelled. Inari just breathed and ran to his room. Nice kid you have there, Tsunami-san. Naruto said with a hint of sarcasm in his voice only for Tsuki to elbow him in the ribs. I'm so sorry about Inari-chan. Our family has a bad history with Gato, and ever since then my son has changed. Tsunami explained. It's okay, Tsunami-san. Naruto replied. That was when Kakashi spoke up. So, are you gonna stay here as well? The copycat asked. No. We'll be staying close to the house in our tents. Oh and so that you know you'll need to be on high alert due to the fact that Gato has hired help. Ryu stated until Hinata spoke up. But we saw your teammate deal with Zabuza. Shy Grill said. I wasn't referring to Zabuza. I was referring to the Black Spider Nin. Ryu answered, causing Kakashi's and Kurinai's eyes to widen in fear, while the genin looked confused. Who are the Black Spider Nin? Kiba asks while Akamaru barks while Naruto answers his question. They are members of the Black Spider clan who hail in Masha no Kuni, Devil Country, and have a village known as Yamigakur, the village hidden in darkness. Like the Hayabusa clan, they are feared too, in the shinobi world, and can be more ruthless and dangerous than the dragon ninja. Naruto explained and that was when Sakura spoke up. I've never heard of that village. She stated. Like I said. That's because that village and ours live in the west. We are not part of the elemental nations. Kasumi said. The Kashi groans and curses to himself. I never would have thought that I'd have to face ninja from that clan ever again. He muttered. Sensei? Sakura asked with a concerned look on her face. The last time I faced them was during the last war. If I had to pick between fighting an army of Iwanin or them I'd rather face the Iwanin. 
those ninja like the Dragon Ninja said are ruthless killers and have been bred to become the perfect assassins like the Dragon Nin. They will not rest until they kill their target and they do not take prisoners. They show mercy to no one. Not even women or children are safe from their path of destruction. He finished causing the genins to pale. And one felt nervous. So what do we do? Shino asks the leaders. Leave the spider ninja to us. We have more experience dealing with them. Your genin wouldn't last two seconds against them. Naruto answered, causing Sasuke to frown. And why should we listen to you? The prick asked while Naruto raised an eyebrow at his glare. I didn't say you had to listen to me, kid. If you want to get yourself killed then be my guest. Naruto answered, making the boy growl. I'm an Ichiha. Those spider ninja are insects compared to me and my clan. He said with arrogance in his voice. And what would that make your clan? Worms or dirt? Tsuki asked in a mocking tone. Sasuke's eyes flared at the red head and clenched his fist. Watch your mouth bitch or I'll he spat out until Tsuki appeared in front of him with her hand wrapped around his throat and slammed him against the wall. She had a kunai in her hand that was pressed against his throat, her eyes were as cold as ice, and the Ichiha was scared shitless. Call me a bitch again weakling and I'll spill your lifeblood all over this floor. She threatened and suddenly had a look of disgust on her face when she got a whiff of him shitting himself in his pants and threw him onto the floor. Naruto stayed quiet when this happened. I suggest you teach that kid humility, Kakashi Hada can beat the arrogance out of him before he is either killed by me, my partner, or me. We have killed our fair share of ninja, politics, and criminals, and this runt will just be another death added to our list. He finished before looking at the same girl. Can I borrow one of your genins? Which made Kakashi and Kurinai confused. Why? Which one? Kurinai asked. The girl with pink hair. Naruto answered that made Sakura eat, the genin surprised minus the Ichiha growl, until Kakashi stood behind her with a protective mood. The copycat was curious about how Naruto was serious about Sakura. Why did you want Sakura? Kakashi demanded. Nothing, I just want to talk. In private. But don't worry, I won't bite her. Naruto replied that it only made Kakashi stand down. Until Sakura approaches Naruto. Before the blonde lent her ear whispered. Is your mother Mabuki Hirono? Now Sakura is about to ask before she looks shocked and looks at Naruto at the side. As Naruto quickly places his finger on her mouth before placing a single finger on his lips of silence. I'll tell you when we'll take you to the camp. Naruto replied, getting a nod from Sakura before the Konoha group saw Sakura shocked, wondering if she knew them or not. As Tsuki and Ryu saw it coming, the best thing is to keep themselves a secret. Until Sakura looks at her sensei. Can I sensei? She asked anxiously, only gained a sigh from the copycat, and nodded. You may. As Naruto places his hand on her shoulder besides her and his team before they leave and informed. We will be watching the house from outside, after a little talk with your student, copycat, and if I were you, I'd train them, because Ibuza is still alive. With that, they shunshin out of the house with Sakura and into the forest close to the house, leaving a shocked and scared group. What was he going to do with Sakura? Kiba wondered. Kakashi was informed by Mabuki after the graduation. She secretly discussed it with him at home. Flashback started before the team assignment was recommended, Sandaim and Kakashi went to the Haruna residence. After the discussion with the Team 7's instructor, she told Sandaim to have a talk with Kakashi. As the Sandaim left, then leaving them alone. Until he notices he activates a privacy seal. Then Mabuki spoke. Kakashi-san. There is something I need to know about my daughter. What is it? Kakashi asked. If you were Sakura encounter or hear a someone come. Had my daughter talked to someone? Mabuki suggested. Who? Kakashi wondered. You'll find out soon enough. Mabuki replied with a smirk. And it started with symbol of the dragon. Blackback ended. Back in reality, Kakashi thought. Is this what Mabuki san was about? The symbol of the dragon. That means. Chapter ended. Okay people this is the new chapter and I will update the harem for this decision. In the next chapter Naruto and Ryu will have a small encounter with the hunter Nin and then Naruto will have a rematch with Zabuza on the bridge. Can you tell me what kind of weapon Naruto used? Rikin, dragon sword. Shikin no Rikin, fang of the dragon god, reforged designed. Abelaro, rematch. Sakura isn't a fangirl in this fanfic. She fell in love with Naruto when they were young. Her parents, being best mates with Naruto's parents, approved. I'll go into more details later on in the story. So she will be part of a harem. After all, there will be more about Haruno soon. I will have a bitchy, screechy councilwoman that is unlike the Sakura bashing story about her mother. They will be Ami, Sakura's bully. And her mother is a sane too. As for adding Hinata and the harem. I refuse. I declined to have Hinata for part of this harem. Chapter 7. The Cherries reunion and joined the Dragon's Angels. Zabuza was currently in a bed recovering from the injuries he got when he faced a Dragon Nin and was inwardly berating himself for underestimating the kid. 
his arrogance nearly cost him his life, and had it not been for his assistance being six feet under right now. He'd hate to admit it, but he was impressed that young Dragon Nin was able to fight him, a member of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist in the Art of. While he was pondering on this sitting near his bedside were the two companions. The one on the right had long, smooth waist-length raven black hair with a light skin complexion, brown eyes, and wore her hunter outfit. The one on the left he had hazel eyes and looked about 16, and also wore his hunter Nin outfit. Lastly, there's two red marks on his eyelashes. They were Haku Mamachi, adopted daughter of Zabuza Mamachi and Shinji Kagaya Mamachi, both apprentice of Zabuza, and the adopted older brother of Haku. I think a ninja no older than us could put you in this state. Are you sure you're not losing your touch, old man? Shinji asked humorously, while Zabuza glared at him for a while and grumbled. Shut up, Shinji. That kid was lucky because I was distracted. He said while Haku sighed and shook her head she was about to speak up until they heard the door being pushed open and a short man wearing a black suit with a pissed off expression on his face along with two guards walked in. Shinji and Haku had pissed expressions on their faces and were slowly standing up. What the hell is this, Zabuza? I heard that you almost completed your objective in killing that stupid bridge builder, but then you get your ass handed to you. I thought you said you wouldn't have a problem dealing with Tazuna's hired help. He said while the demon of the mist facial appearance remained the same. I didn't have any problem with those tree huggers, you idiot. He said, making the criminal growl at the idiot comment. I would have finished them off, but a dragon ninja interfered with my job, and I'm pretty sure you know about their reputation. He finished, making the man cringe in fear. There was not a gang lord alive that didn't know about the dragon ninja and how they were respected and feared throughout the shinobi world, especially when their village's military might was on par with that of three of the four major countries. He snapped out of his stupor and made his way towards Abusa. The H that's not the point. Even if a dragon ninja did show up you should have dealt with that fool. He said and when he was close enough he reached his hand out towards Abusa's face. Before he even had the chance to touch the man Haku grabbed Gato's wrist and started to slowly crush it and cried out in pain. Don't you dare lay your filthy hands on Zabuza sama you scum. Haku said in a cold voice while squeezing the wrist harder. Ah. And my arm. You're crushing my arm. Gato cried out in pain. Two of his guards were about to pull out their katanas, but that was put to a halt when they felt the tips of two white blades aimed at their necks. Don't even think about it. Shinji warned and continued with a dark tone. If you so much as even twitch I'll skewer you through your skulls. Which made the two remain frozen in fear. On the other hand was trembling when he saw the look in his eyes. I suggest that you three leave. I am in a very bad mood and you're only making it worse by pissing me off. You have five seconds to leave or I'll freeze you to death. Shinji said and flung him towards his men while Kagura backed away. Gato got up rubbing his probably broken wrist and glared at the three. This isn't over. I expect you three to get the job done or consider yourselves unemployed. He growled at and left with his bodyguards. As soon as they did, Shinji made her way towards Haku and Zabuza. You know you two didn't have to do that. Zabuza said since he had a kunai placed under the sheets and was gonna use it to loop off Gato's arm. Shinji, on the other hand, smiled. If Haku hadn't grabbed his arm, you would have killed him, then we'd once again have to be on the run from the onion, Hunter Nin, Zabuza-sama. He replied while Haku nodded. I agreed with Nyson. And we could really use the money. We hardly have enough to get supplies and weapons. Haku stated while Zabuza groaned. Great, just great. And with these injuries I got from facing that Rick Nin, Dragon Ninja. I'll be in this bed recovering for a week or two. Also if you two plan on wandering around do not engage that Dragon Nin or any of his colleagues whatsoever. If you can get away from them then do that, but don't fight them. He said seriously while they looked at him with wide eyes. Are these dragon ninjas really that dangerous, Zabuza-sama? Haku asked and the man nodded. Yes they are Haku. Facing a dragon nin one-on-one -on -one will more than likely cause you to lose a limb, but facing a group of them is beyond suicidal. The only reason why we managed to escape from the one I fought is because you two caught him by surprise. It won't happen a second time so be careful. He warned them and they nodded. What about those black spider ninjas hired? Kagaya asked a man who was now frowning. Definitely stay away from them. I don't know why, but I always get a bad feeling from those ninja. They reek of death of malice. More than I do and I'm the demon of the mist. Zabuza finished and decided to get some rest. Meanwhile, Naruto and Aan were currently at their campsite taking a small break from patrolling the forest of Chakra. Yesterday, Naruto is talking to Sakura after they inform them about Zabuza's alive to the rest of the Kanohan Inn. So they will introduce themselves for sure. Flashback, Dimakuma and Tenshin arrived at the camp with Sakura via Shunshin. Until Aan turned to Naruto, brought her before arrived at the bridge builder's place, then informed about Zabuza's life. Is there a slight reason why you brought a Kanohan in here, Naruto-kun? Aan frowned, which surprised Sakura, the name he heard. Naruto? You mean he's... 
Sakura was about to realize before looking at the masked Naruto. Hey Anne. Naruto scolds. There is no way to treat Sakura-chan as a guest here. That made her eyes remember her name. Wait. Does it mean he Sakura thought shocked as she cut her thoughts? Wait, Sakura? As in the Sakura when you were kids. Kishina-sama did mention it to her. Ayan exclaimed before Mamiji and Kasumi were curious about Naruto bringing a Konohan in here. They heard from Ayan about Sakura. Along with Tsuki and Ryu. Until Kasumi realized something about the hint cherry. Naruto-kun. Kasumi called to get Naruto's attention. The hint you told us about cherry is a name, right? Naruto smiled through his mask and replied. Yes. That was what I was hoping for. Ryu commented while the girls looked at him as Tsuki spoke. You knew. She asked as Ryu nodded, gaining a small pound on her shoulder. Baka, why didn't you say that in the first place? Getting a rubbing behind his head from Ryu. Tsuki turned to Sakura and went to her by analyzing her description. So you're the same Sakura Naruto Nai told me about. Until she noticed something covered in her sleeve. As she lifted the Sakura before the reset reacted and saw a seal was exposed on her bicep. Why did you have a suppression and an anti jutsu seal? Tsuki asked. That surprises Sakura then she sighed. Yes I better drop my act now. Sakura said in an effort to not hide for now and made a tiger seal, then said. Kai. Until the seal deactivated, that surprises the dragon nin team for no wonder her chakra reserves are reduced to genin. Her chakra reserves are now mid genin level. They notice her muscles are toned instead of a skinny diet. That only made Naruto frown about her appearance. My, my, Sakura-chan. You've gotten beautiful since the last time I met you. Before he lowered his mask to reveal his face. Sakura was stunned. She did see him after all before she noticed his face and that he had whisker marks. Naru-kun. Is that you? What happened to you? What happened to your face? Seeing her future boyfriend with questions. Naruto chuckled about his question. It's a long story. Guess I still love your forehead when those bullies did to you before you were crying. As Sakura's eyes widened for more surprise. Naruto-kun. Do you mean? Sakura asked with a happy voice as a lone tear fell from her eye. With the girl's disbelief and Ayan smile seeing her for seeing her childhood hero. Yes, Sakura-chan. I remember. Naruto replied with a smile. As Sakura rushed to Naruto gave him a reunion hug. Then the others of how Naruto had finally had his childhood friend reunion that includes Kasumi and Mamiji. As they broke out, Naruto looked at Sakura. Let's have some catch-up to do. Yeah, Sakura nodded. Later, they were sitting in the camp eating dinner with the Rosette joined in. As Sakura explains about her pretending. With the others not understanding before Tsuki spoke in. So, you use deception. Sakura nodded. Since she told her parents about what happened to Naruto. That they told her about his burden and everything. Since he was abused and shunned by the villagers, she will become a Kanoichi by joining the academy. So, she needs to pretend to be a fangirl of Sasuke and the diet part is not her type. Since she did increase her physical and studies in the library and learned medicine. As a book smart, she did have brilliant talents. Ryu frowned, explained. So. No wonder your chakra signature is weak. As he was about to continue explaining. You must have used the, the suppression seal, high level jinjutsu. And also, a anti jutsu seal. Then that means. Tsuki added his explanation. Before she recognized the seal design. It means it belongs to the Yuzumaki clan. Sakura finished by shocking the dragon nin about the Rosette's capabilities from the Yuzumaki clan before explaining. Ka-san has persisted in acting like a weak Kinoichi before encountering Jiraiya-sama. After I heard what happened to Naruto-kun, I had to train to be a Kinoichi. So you mean that? Kasumi is about to say sorry to Sakura for not being a weak and or fangirl for her reasons, even though she was trained by their godfather, Jiraiya. Yes, my own dream is to become equal to Kishina-sama or Tsunade-sama. I had to pretend to be a Chiha fangirl if my friend Ino Pig didn't get my suspicions and or anyone knows about me. Sakura replied and explained. After what happened to Naruto-kun, I made a vow to leave and find him until I resigned from being the Konohan in and joined the next. You mean? Mamiji is about to say, getting a nod from Sakura. My Ka-san, Mabuki, did help me with my training secretly. Also had Jiraiya-sama trained me a little and had installed those seals on me to prevent the Hyugas by Akigana Ichiha Sharingan from seeing it and even Sensory Nin can't see it through. Sakura explained with a smile on her face. Since. It was Kashina that I admired, not Sasuke, and trained harder, studied harder until I removed my mask of deception. That was more surprising from the team. You admired Kasan? Tsuki asked, surprised. Sakura staring at Tsuki before. She noticed her hair is red and eyes are blue. I take it that you're Naruto-kun's sister, right? Sakura chuckles at Tsuki. Wow, you're smart. I admitted. Tsuki admitted. Name's Tsuki. 
Yeah, likewise, since my Kasan told me about her. So I became her idol. Sakura explained. I never thought I would meet the children of Kashina-sama. She couldn't believe her luck. She was talking to the two children of one of her idols. Her inner self screamed in joy. And. She and Kasan were friends and made up an arranged marriage before they made a joke about it. Ayan felt that she wasn't pleased. Since it's okay for sure. As the nods for understanding. Kasumi and Mamiji frowned because they knew about it from Kashina. So, have you been keeping this secret from anyone? Ryu asked, getting a nod from Sakura. Whoa. You've been training. Never thought your Ayasama trained you better. Yes, and also I need to keep my low profile to be sure. Sakura replied, before looking at Naruto. After you saved me in the park from the bullies and got beaten by them, instead of me. But I loved you, and then you disappeared about six to seven years ago. With sadness in the end, five of the dragon nin felt pity for the girl, before looking at Naruto. Why didn't you come back to the park like you promised? Sakura asked. I was taken away and saved by Joe Ajison with his wife and son, and his squad arrived to negotiate it when the mob attacked me again, after he will cut ties for them for treason, he had obtained you sent scroll, money, and from your Hokage, he told me I was about to see my mother and sister in the first time by taking me back to Hayabusa village, I had been trained to be the dragon nin and but for now, Kanoha is not my home anymore, but the Hayabusa village is my home now. Naruto said sadly and upset. That shocked Sakura with disbelief of how Naruto was taken, she was told by her mother about it too. She heard from her mother about from the announced Naruto status as the last of the Namaka's clan, the council tried to send the hunter Ninur Anbu to kill retrieved Naruto when he wasn't a shinobi without approval, but he's still a civilian that day. And even he wasn't an academy student after all. But Sandame Hokage refused or denied the request. After the meeting, her parents had a new job for taking over the orphanage, since Andame had ordered an execution for abused and shunned Naruto and planting a seed of corruption to the newest generations. And then there was the demand for compensation from Hayabusa for the lies that were given to them about Naruto from the rumors they heard. The Sandame and the elders personally went to the fire daimyo about it as well, in Iron Country, Kanoha had hand them 350 million rim from each of Kanoha's clans as compensation for retribution, along with highest ranked missions and, and publicly executed several villagers and shinobis for assaulting the true heir of two strongest clans, and even had the children were completely disowned them from their parents or heading to the orphanage after the execution. Needless to say Kanoha hit a recession. But Sakura and her family, they secretly had their currency, it was given by Kishina or Jiraiya to keep things intact, to prevent it from going bankrupt. As for kids, they did stay in the orphanage after the revelation. Kanoha is now the shadow of its former glory. But, you still loved me. How is that possible? Sakura asked as she pulled Naruto into a loving hug, and Tulei An, Suki and Rai were smiling about how Sakura had loved Naruto for a while. Kasumi and Mamiji sadly frown after they stare at Ayan, wondering if she wasn't jealous. Then let's get to the beginning of how that old monkey of the Hokage of yours lied to my mother about how I was so-called dead. Next half an hour, aside from eating, Naruto explained everything to Sakura about what happened six years ago. Sakura understood the reason their Hokage let the villagers berate the true heir of the Hayabusa. He told her that Naruto was the Kikbizinch Kriki. Before Naruto introduced Sakura to Ryu, Ayan, Kasumi and Mamiji, minus Tsuki. Sakura is kinda jealous about the girl's chest size. So she made fast friends after all. Sakura got understand the reason from her mother that she was protecting her from the villagers, since Kashina retribute Kanoha for dishonored the father of Naruto and Tsuki's dying wish, the Yandame Hokage, now Kanoha got punished of what they deserved, that Naruto got the bloodline of the dragon of the Uzumaki Namikas and are incredibly powerful. And he told her about why Kurumi, the Kikbi, attacked Kanoha. As Ryu told Sakura the same thing before he told Naruto about how the economy and populates Hayabusa village look like, and how Sakura heard from Kakashi before the village don't have a ninja academy, and also the meaningless titles didn't have like. Rookie, Kinoichi, and dead last, of the year titles, because that is insulting and ruins the way a squad cooperates. That made Sakura understand the meaning. Sakura understood during the academy about being a Kinoichi of the year. But the titles didn't mean anything. That explains why many graduates failed the test, since Kanoha is weakened after Naruto is taken by the Riknin to his home for years. Sakura failed to cooperate with his teammates like Sasuke during the bell test, except Sai is a mystery as well. Next day Anne whispered to tell Sakura that it's okay for her to want him. That surprised her, looking at her with a curious look, with Anne nodding in agreement, that melted her heart and broke into tears, and then an incredible thing happened. She jumped on Naruto and started kissing him. Ryu and Tsuki were surprised to see them, and Kasumi and Mamiji were wondering why Ayan allowed Sakura to kiss him in front of anyone. She originally was in love with Naruto since they were kids. I'm glad that it wasn't only a dream, but a real memory. 
Naruto said with a single tear. Yeah, after you saved me in the park from bullies and then you disappeared. Sakura said with sadness in the end. I was in hospital when I woke up after another mob attacked me and I had amnesia. Naruto said sadly. I had a feeling that you are that girl that I loved, but until I trained with my friends and I, I didn't remember that event. He added as Sakura stroked his hair. This is why I love you, you are going to be there where your heart tells you. Sakura said as she kissed Naruto again. Naruto smiled at Sakura, now on the other hand he decided to train the girl personally, he declared. Guess, I will train you instead tonight. That surprises the Reknin group, well Mamiji asks. Um. Are you sure it is wise, Naruto-kun? I mean, you sure if Kishina-sama didn't mind if you trained a Konohan in her outsider? Naruto looked at Mamiji, then nodded. I do, I can't stand by and do nothing. Sin Saku-chan did admire Kasan. That made the Rosette blushed for calling Saku-chan as a nickname. Asumi had something in mind. Naruto-kun, what if the Tiandai and I in Konoha will learn that information about us? That caused Sakura to flinch because she had forgotten about Ino's father. Inoichi was a T and I operative. Sakura spoke. Don't worry about me. I had an inner persona in my mind protecting my head. But only I gain permission by trusting anyone. Or did Inoichi san trust me or not? The Dragon Nin team admitted his decision. Ryu started to speak. I don't know. Since Sakura did earn our trust. So I agreed with his decision. I agreed with Nai san. Tsuki said. Me too. Ayan added, made Kasumi see her half-sister friend agreed. As the first friend of Naruto after all those years of abuse and shunning. All the other two girls each looked before looking at Sakura, Namiji spoke. What about your parents? Sakura sighed and answered. Yeah, after I resigned and brought my brother with me to join Hayabusa after the Chunin exams. Ah. The Chunin exams are held in Konoha for hosting this year. Ryu exclaimed before snapping his fingers for he had forgotten, as the rest of the nod agreed. That's right, my parents will do the same, at least. Sakura replied. After what happened to Naruto-kun for everything that was Sandame Hokage's actions, you all told me everything, since he lied to my greatest idol, and your mother. Yes you're right, Sakura-chan. Naruto replied, with a foxy grin, seeing her smiling at each other, making Ayan happy along with Tsuki and Ryu. Including the frowning Kasumi and Mamiji. Tsuki knew her brother Sakura was his first friend. So she will respect Naruto's decision. Ryu also had the same boat as his girlfriend, Tsuki. After all. He was told by Naruto about Sakura a lot. Ukasumi and Mamiji also respect Sakura's words. She is a Konohan in or not, she will leave her home for everything Naruto did to make a single friend. She did have a brother if she wanted to. After all, they want to know about how Ayan allows Sakura to do so. As Ayan stood within a minute and said. I will leave you guys, okay. The girls and Ryu not agree then stand and Tsuki speaks. Be sure, you bring her back to Tazuna's place. She suggested. And it's your night shift. Naruto parted and let Sakura close to him on his chest, and he glanced at his reply. I will. At the forest of chakra clearing point. But that, Naruto and Sakura faced each other in front of the trees in the forest. Then Naruto said, Sakura-chan, do you know how to climb a tree? Climb a tree? By hands, yes. Sakura replied. Naruto chuckled and said correctly. No. I meant climbing trees with your feet only. You need to be able to do this so that your chakra control is perfect. To do this, just channel chakra to the sole of your feet and walk the tree. It's easy once you do it. Sakura did what Naruto asked of her and found it easy, but only to fall from the branch she was on and into Naruto's big arms. That blushes her with her eyes away. Very good, Sakura-chan. Judging from the way you did that exercise, you are ready to do water walking. You saw how you witnessed the fight against Zabuza with Kakashi and Kurenai, and I also walked on the water and along with my team. Apply the same method and you can increase your chakra capacity. Naruto said as he set her down and walked to the huge lake, where Sakura walked on the water and fell in. It was hilarious to watch Sakura doing it again and again, but she managed to do it pretty soon after a total of 20 times falling into the water, soaking wet. Naruto then piggybacked the exhausted Sakura back to the house and laid her on her bed, letting Tsunami in to be her savior for gratitude, with team 7 and 8 saw an exhausted Sakura on his back. Sasuke was angry to see his so-called weak teammate was somehow trained by the Dragon Nin, as she was trained by the best. Sai on the other hand was curious about Sakura's development if he reported to Danzo later, and even the blonde Dragon Nin. Hinata told them about Sakura and what happened to Sakura. Naruto told them it was training, getting nods from Kakashi and Kurenai to understand. Since it is okay if he made his decision as a squad leader like the Jinin. So it's quite alright. Sasuke was glaring at Naruto again for noticing something he, and Ichiha, didn't. Since they're informed by the Dragon Nin that those two Hunter Nin were fake, one of them gives him a death-like state. 
he and the rest of the Dragon Nin were trained by their family members instead because the Hayabusa village didn't have a ninja academy. It's time for them to sleep, and Naruto will take his nap before he takes her back to the bridge builder's place. As he went to Ann's tent to sleep beside her. Flashback ended, as before sunrise. After Naruto brought Sakura home, with the reset seals activated. Before Naruto had decided to spar with her. As Kakashi and Kuranai questioned her of what was about. The bridge builder's family was curious. Since I did have his suspicions about her, then teammate asked Sakura how it's like they're interrogating her or something. So Sakura replied that it was nothing. Just a talk, but that made the so-called elite demand to know. But. It was a bad idea. Sakura twisted Sasuke's arm harder to surprise Konohan in. If you lay on me again, and I will personally remove your jewel that won't shine that you want to have grandkids. That made the boys cover their pride and joy for Sakura's threat. She was very bipolar. Kurenai smiled with pride for the reset taking some serious training. That amused Naruto, before Kakashi or Kurenai looked at him. What have you done with her? The copy asked, with Naruto giving a reply in defense. What? I did not do anything to her, really. After that, Naruto left for the night for patrol or to sleep in his tent with Aan. Until it's already morning and prepared. After Aan talks to Naruto about it, it's okay to share with Sakura about his harem. Also Kasumi and Mamiji are okay for sure. Now, back to the camp, and also the mission they prepared. Naruto was wearing an all-dark bluish-black ninja guy uniform with a mask covering the lower half of his face, Kakashi's mask, that had a silver trim on it, along with silver and black steel reinforced shinobi gauntlets and shoulder guards, and fingerless gloves with metal plates, and attached to the sides of his pants were armor-like metal plates, as well as pair of ninja tabi boots. Tied around his forehead was a headband with a metal plate in the middle with a coiling dragon carved into it. On the back was the yin-yang symbol and a silver dragon coiled around it. He also had a dark grey sash-like belt tied around his waist with several small scrolls attached to it, as well as two weapon pouches. Strapped on his back was Raikin, Dragon Sword, while Shikin no Rikjin, Fang of the Dragon God, was sealed in a scroll. Aan wore a sleeveless purple ninja guy with a mesh shirt underneath and black arm guards. Her Fuma Kadachi were strapped in X formation on her sash with a weapons pouch. She was currently drinking water from a water bottle, and after finishing it, she crumpled it up and tossed it into a trash bin they had. We haven't had any luck in finding Gato's location for the last few days, and those Konoha ninja seem to be keeping their distance from us. Aan stated as she got up but then frowned. Though that Ichiha kid is gonna be a problem if he doesn't stop seeing us up. Naruto scoffs while popping his neck in place. Just ignore that pest, Aan chan His presence doesn't even affect me, and after I brought Sakura-chan back for our training date. Also, did you know that pale one? Aan nodded at his question. Naruto explained. He's no ordinary genin. Matter of fact, he's nowhere close to being a genin class ninja. We better keep an eye on him as there is something off about he pauses in the middle of his sentence and pulls a kunai out of his sleeve as does Aan, and they both fling them at a tree. The blur leapt out of the tree and into the forest with Aan and Naruto going after him. So I was leaping from tree to tree and riding onto a scroll quickly. I have to get this message to Danzo-sama. He needs to know that the heir of the Hayabusa clan is in the his senses, went on full alert as Aan appeared in his line of sight and performs a spin kick that he flips over and flings a kunai at her, about she deflects it with one of her Fuma Kadachi. Sai pulls out a scroll and an ink pen, preparing to write down on it until the scroll was shredded by a volley of shuriken and was forced to leap back as Aan attempted to slice him in half with a diagonal slash. Before he could do anything, chains appeared around the pale teenager, but before he could do anything he was ensnared by the chains. Naruto slams him onto his back, and the pale ninja crashes into the ground. Naruto then had Sai bound and pinned to the ground with the blade of the Kayaketsu Shoji, its blade with a gut hook at the end of the blade, which is then followed by a solid oval metal guard and a black nylon cord wrap handle, the chain dagger used in Ninja Assassin, pressed against his throat. You better have a good reason for spying on us, kid. Naruto growled out coldly, and he tightened the bindings on Sai who grunted in slight pain. Returned his head towards the stone-faced blonde and did a fake smile. Spying. Whatever gave you that idea, Dragon Ninja. I was merely in the area training, and he didn't get to finish because now Naruto slammed him into a tree, pressing the tip of his blade at size jugular until he drew blood. Don't fuck with me, fool. Lied to me one more time and you'll get to see what your intestines look like outside of your body. The blonde's eyes were now cold as ice, and for the first time in Sai's life, he was afraid. A bead of sweat fell from his brow, and despite his emotional conditioning, he was very afraid for his life. I was. Making sure you weren't a threat to our client after all, you are a ninja from a foreign country and are to be treated as enemies. Before you spoke to Sakura-san. The pale root member answered while Naruto smirked behind his mask. 
then, you're either very brave or stupid because if I was a threat, I would have ended your life along with those others when Zabuza had you to his mercy. Naruto stabbed the curved dagger into the tree near Sai's face, and the blade was a few inches near his neck. And unlike those kids who play ninja in your village, mine is her so I am the real deal, and I will kill you just for looking at me, funny. With that, he sheathes the blade and then delivers a vicious punch into Sai's stomach, and said pale boy gasps, falling onto his knees and coughing up saliva. Let's take this puppet back to his superiors. He said as he dragged the groaning boy by his collar into the forest along with Aan. But the Kanoha Nin, Bakashi and Kurinai were currently watching their students train in the tree climbing exercise or in Kakashi's case, Sasuke on when the last Ichiha kept attempting to get higher up on the tree and fume, especially when Kiba, Shino, and Hinata were progressing much better than he and Elite was, and it didn't sit well with him. Also Sakura has already had that exercise that was taught by the Dragon Nin, making the Ichiha even angrier by the second, for someone like him trained Sakura. Over the training, Sakura has changed so much and even dropped her crush on Sasuke that made Kurinai proud. The Achiha even tried to demand Sakura to give him the power she was practicing, but he got punched in the stomach, hard by Sakura's developed strength that put him in bed for the betterment of three hours. Hours later, Kakashi had to Kurinai to train Sakura with Jinjutsu. He admitted how Sakura got her serious training. So he taught her a thing or two. The day prior to this he asked if Sakura would like to spar with Tsuki, sent by her brother to get to know her more. Much to the distress of Kakashi as he knew where the other Kinoichi was from in Hayabusa and worried about his students' well-being. Sasuke on the other hand was extremely pissed off at his female teammate being the weakest after he woke up as getting training from someone like teammate Sensei or Naruto and Tsuki. She secretly trained with her Tojutsu for her own. Who is probably stronger than the Demon of the Mist, Zabuza Mamachi. He tried to go to their camp when he was stopped by Kakashi. He ordered him to keep distance from them, which made him more angry. Only Sakura does. As this went on, Sai's chain form landed in front of the two jonin, who jumped in surprise before Naruto and Aan appeared before them, with Naruto's foot pressed against the boy's head. What's the meaning of this? Kurinai demanded, getting the attention of the others. They were about to help their teachers, but stopped as they saw the edge of Naruto's blade pressed against Sai's neck. Move and you'll be returning to your village with him in pieces. Naruto threatened Icy and turned his gaze to the sensei of the genin teammate. I'm gonna ask you two questions. Did you send this brat to spy on me and my teammates? Kurinai blinked in confusion and shook her head as did Kakashi. No, we didn't have Naruto-san. We informed our students to keep their distance from you and your colleagues, but apparently our orders weren't clear enough. She answered before glaring at the pinned down pale boy. Naruto looks at them for a while before stepping off Sai and re-sheathing his blade. Consider this your first and last warning because I'm not the type to give second chances. Keep those brats on a leash. I've already informed my other teammates that they can use excessive force on you or them, and if I catch them snooping around our campsite or spying on us, then their lives are forfeit. He warned the two Ko's of the group. The other Genin's eyes widened in disbelief at the blonde's warning, minus Akura, before Kiba spoke. What the hell's your problem, you jerk? Kiba remarked, but flinched when Naruto's piercing stare turned to him. I wasn't talking to you runt, so shut up and go back to climbing trees. Naruto then turned his attention to Aan. Let's go eh Ann, we wasted enough time with these kids and we're losing daylight. He informed his partner. She nods and they both vanish before them. Hiba and Sasuke on the other hand were miffed at how they were ignored. Assholes, where do they get off treating us like we're inferior to them? Kiba asked his sensei. Because in their eyes they don't believe you have what it takes to be a real ninja. Kakashi answered in an honest tone, shocking most of them to the core. They are the perfect example of what a ninja is and they take their roles as such very seriously. He explained as he unchained Sai. Sensei's right. Sakura stated that surprises anyone minus the Jinin's about Sakura for her stated purpose. A rookie genin like Miras is not the perfect example for being a shinobi unlike those headbands we wore that proved nothing. After all, I take some training too. Gurunai on the other hand nodded her head at the pink-haired girl's statement, with Sasuke growling more about his so-called fangirl. Sakura's right. There's more to being a ninja than wearing a headband. As a ninja our duty is to carry out missions that can range from guarding a client to the assassination of someone who governs another country like the daimyo for example, or even an influential businessman. The copy ninja explained as he wasn't going to sugarcoat anything for the rookies minus Akura. As such we lie, cheat, steal, kill, and even kidnap in order for our village to prosper. There are no good or evil sides in the way of the ninja, and Konoha is no different from any other village who wants to gain power. Her and I had to nod in agreement with Kakashi, but she didn't want to take away their innocent mind so soon. She thought about objecting, but chose to go against it. After Sai got up, he was face to face with an irked Kakashi. As for you Sai, this is a warning, and as your commanding officer, 
I am ordering you to stay away from the Dragon Ninja and not provoke them. The same goes for the rest of you, including Sakura. If they confront you then that's another story, but do not antagonize them or your life is forfeit. He warned them before instructing them to get back to their training. Sasuke on the other hand scowled. Like I'd waste my time or energy with those nobodies. He muttered but Kiba heard him and smirked. Says the guy who shit himself when that red head was about to slice your throat open. Kiba said mockingly, getting a heated glare from the Achiha. She just caught me off guard and it won't happen again. Sasuke swore he'd find a way to get back at Tsuki for that humiliating scene. And also Sakura got a number on you too. Kiba added a mockery that made Sasuke more annoying. Later on that day the others returned from their patrol around the village and met back at the campsite about their progress on the mission. So, did we have any leads on Gato's whereabouts yet? Naruto asked his comrades. Ryu shook his head in a negative fashion. No we haven't, but we did manage to take out several illegal imports around the docks and kill several more groups of hired thugs and spider ninja. He answered. Our only option would be to find Zabuza Mamachi and his accomplices, since they are the backbone of Gato's operations and would know where his actual base is. Kasumi suggested. Naruto on the other hand signs but nods in agreement and says. Very well then, let's retire for now, since our only option is to look out for the bridge builder and his family, since they will likely be targeted as well. The rest of them nodded. Tsuki then got up and stretched for a while getting the kicks out before reaching out and grabbing Ryu's hand. Come on Ryu-kun, let's go swim in the lake for a while. That made Ryu's eyes widened and sputtered with a blush under his masked face as Tsuki dragged him off to the lake. Ayan glances at Mamiji and Kasumi for a few seconds before looking at Naruto and winks. I think I'll go for a stroll in the forest. Ayan states and leaves the other three at the campsite. Mamiji and Kasumi were about to head in a different direction as well. Hold on Mamiji-chan, Kasumi-chan, I need to talk to you both. He informed the two Kanoichi who blinked in confusion, wondering what it was he wanted to talk to them about, so they sat down while Naruto pulled his mask off. About what? Mamiji asked. Kasumi was also wondering why he had them stay back. About us. He answered. You two know how I am the heir of the Uzumaki Namika's clan, correct? Kasumi and Mamiji nodded in agreement. Naruto continues. What you two didn't know is that Ryu, who is the heir of the Hayabusa clan, and I were put under a certain law that only a few clan heirs go through when their clan is close to extinction, especially the last males of the clan. And what type of law is it? Kasumi wondered. That would be the Clan Restoration Act which entitles me to have more than one wife. The blonde answered to the shocked Kinoichis who then felt his hand wrap around one of theirs. I know you two have developed feelings for me, and to be honest, I care deeply about you both in the same manner. After all, the reason Ayan allowed Sakura to kiss me is that she is also part of it too. Both Kasumi and Mamiji looked into his deep blue eyes and saw the love and warmth it carried in them. They both smiled back and Mamiji spoke up. Does this mean we can both be? She asked and he nodded. Yes it does. Naruto replied. Before he knew it, the two tackled him to the ground and pressed their lips against his, performing a three-way kiss. This went on for a few seconds before they heard someone cough out in a hymn. They stopped and looked up to see a Anne who had an amused expression and raised eyebrow with her hands on her hips. I leave you three alone, for three seconds, and this happens. She questioned. Both Kasumi and Mamiji jumped off of Naruto instantly, and they were red-faced and sputtering. Ni-chan, we can explain. Kasumi tried to say but to her surprise a Anne giggled and waved it off. Oh relax, I already knew something like this would happen after Naruto and I talked about it. And also Sakura. I allowed her to do so. She stated to the two stumped Kinoichi. Wait. Why you knew? Mamiji asked the lavender-haired girl who nodded. Naruto on the other hand got back onto his feet, rubbing the back of his head. Yeah we did, and the same ordeal went for Ryu, but he mostly kept it secret for a good reason. Naruto replied. Kasumi and Mamiji raised an eyebrow at this. And why would you do that? Kasumi asked. And girls? Naruto answered with a shudder while Kasumi and Mamiji sweat dropped. Oh. Kasumi replied and had to admit that his logic was agreeable. So where do we go from here? Naruto pondered on this and then smiled. Simple Kasumi-chan, I'll take you and Mamiji-chan out on a couple of dates and we'll see where it goes from here. Since I finished dating night training with Sakura. Meaning they'll get a first-hand experience with your inhuman stamina like I did. Ayan remarked, Kasumi and Mamiji's faces were now matching the color of an apple and they looked at her with wide eyes. You mean you too. Mamiji is about to ask Ayan who grinned and giggled. We sure did. The last time we went to do that. After all, I had some trouble walking correctly for three days. She answered. Thud. Thud. Both Naruto and Ayan laughed as they saw Mamiji and Kasumi fainted from the innuendo and when they saw some blood trickle down their noses. You're cruel. Naruto chastised in a joking manner. I learned from the best. She said back, wrapping her arms around his and kissed him on the cheek. 
What do you think Suki and Ryu-san are doing at the lake? What do you think? I am a sex addict for Kami's sake. I feel so sorry for Ryu though, because he's gonna be whipped when they get married. He answered back. And you're not. She questioned Naruto who looked back at her with a feral grin on his face. I'm an alpha, and I bow to no one Tenshi. He growled out, sending shivers of excitement down her spine. I love it when you get all dominant. She said before pulling him into a passionate kiss. Chapter 8. Wave Part 1. As for several days been for prepared to fight on the bridge to Lurigato. Now Sakura returned to the Konoha team with the anti Jutsu seal that belongs to the Uzumaki clan, Naruto or Sakura gave it to each of them since she left the scroll at Konoha, so she retrieved it before the upcoming exam so that any Jutsu users unable to scan their bodies. Sakura was able to memorize the seal's design. Naruto gave her a kiss and she left with Shunshin that Naruto taught her, considered as a gift for their training date. During that time, Naruto had Kasumi and Mamiji went several dates after Aan and Sakura on day 3 after her half-sister's topic. Between them about Aan's inability to walk correctly in 3 days. They need to spend time together while training to improve against the spider ninner's abuser. Also, Ryu got up this morning with lower back pain when he and Tsuki were in the lake. I guess he needs to recover in a day or two, at least. Poor Ryu. Naruto and some of his girlfriends felt pity on him while Tsuki went a little overboard. Eh, uh -huh, guess can't blame Tsuki for all the injuries she made him when there. Made it. So they decide to have Ryu on his guard duty in the camp with Tsuki, since it's her responsibility after all. Until he'll recover. Then, there's Team 7 and 8 of Konoha, minus Akura, many of them have been training too, while taking guard shifts to the bridge builder, having Sakura the first, the tension between Team Tenshi and Akuma only seemed to increase. It started with the damned Ichiha coming to their clearing, demanding that they give him their power, claiming he deserved it more than they did because he was an Ichiha elite. And also his girlfriends and his sister, while Ryu overprotected Tsuki. That interaction ended with Naruto punching Sasuke through multiple trees, brutally and causing the top half of the forest to fall into the clearing. Until Kakashi's shock and surprising his student had provoked the dragon nin, he had disobeyed his warning, he was surprised Naruto's strength is less equal than Tsunade herself, the copycat apologized to the Rick nin for his arrogance. He displeased Sasuke for his stupidity. So Naruto gave them one strike for warning until he will try again, if he'll reach three will have two chances, if he or any of his teammates will kill the Achiha that frightens the Kanohan in for their warning. The Kashi told teammate everything that he witnessed, minus Akura while guarding, so she knew the dragon nin first, they were shocked seeing Naruto punch Sasuke with brute strength. Sasuke's stupidity will damage his bones and organs. And held a warning for each of them to kill the last Achiha within three strikes. Now he got strike one down to three. Since that would be a major problem for losing his mind, then Kurenai was disappointed about Sasuke's attitude, she suggested Kakashi drop him from the ninja program if he tried something stupid like that again, or he'll resign himself as well. Hiba on the hand that he did the best for not to flirt one of the dragon beauties and include his sister, otherwise, he will have his jewels removed by hand of Tsuki, or Mamiji, or Kasumi, since each of them were taken with the sun don't shine. Lastly, Kiba did admit how the Ichiha served him right, like he was humiliated by Tsuki. As for Aan, the Tenshi squad leader informed about their Konoha team before Kurenai asked some questions, so Naruto can't help it. Well Aan told them they called the team Akuma or Demon that terrifies the Genin plus a nervous Acha. They are called that because of how they fight as they can see they are ruthless. Each of them killed and assassinated tyrants, warlords, crime lords and black spider nins. They are the best team, led by Naruto himself, her boyfriend. Next is Tenshi or Angel. They are a female-only group, they work mainly in the shadows gathering information and giving support to frontline teams. Their beauty is well known around the world, many men fall victim to their charms, soon after falling and revealing the info they are killed silently, which many have given them the nicknames the Angels of Death or Shai no Tenshi Tachi. Led by Ann as well. They are the same result as the Akuma. Hiba on the other hand were admitted for calling them Angels, well. If he likes he thought if he'll want to flirt with any of them, it was a bad idea. Sooner or later, he will get killed or beaten up into pulp by any of Naruto's angels. It was his death wish. Before Sasuke seeing Mamiji had an Ajinata strapped on her back if she'll cut him or Kiba in size, before Sasuke demanded handed all of their weapons to so-called elite, includes Naruto's dragon sword, Rikken, that only Naruto had chained him up and slam him on the ground, harder, then tighten the chain more harder. That strike two until it turns into three, he's dead. As he releases Sasuke and walks away along with the others, leaving an enraged Ichiha for humiliation for refusal of the Dragon Nin. Shino is. Well, Shino of course, he didn't want to say anything to the Dragon Nin. Since he did not send his Kikage to spy on them, it will be his wise decision to leave it be. Anada on the other hand felt nervous about the Dragon Nin, the cold-blooded killers like no other. 
even team tennis were ruthless killers, when it comes to beauty, they're also extremely deadly. For more details. Sasuke is a selfish arrogant brat who wants power to be given to him on a silver platter. Since that stupid civilian council, minus one or two, spoiled him for power. He believes he deserves to have everything handed to him without question, this led to a few situations between the teams when he tried to force each of them to train him and where he tried to attack Naruto. Both situations were dealt with and avoided before they could happen. Now last is Sakura, she did have time to train with Naruto, Ritsuki, or Ryu, or each of Naruto's GFs that she had earned. So Naruto will be the second, beside Ayan. Also Kasumi and Mamiji. Kakashi was proud to see his student approved, and the same goes with Kurenai. Until Ichiha was completely furious about his so-called loyal fangirl getting power instead of himself. As he demanded his teammate, it was a bad idea, that results gave him kick on his nuts that made him scream like a girl, also causing any male population to have their spine shiver if any of them were to have the same fate as what they witnessed. That made Naruto amused by what he saw. Until he told his team about it when he was heading back, causing any of them to laugh like crazy about what he told them. It was a humiliating scene, ever. Naruto spent time with Ayan, Sakura, Kasumi and Mamiji for the past few days. Sakura had learned advanced jutsu for her taste. Ayan taught her the basics with katachis. Includes bjutsu, or kusurigama jutsu, or tanfa jutsu. In the woods, for several days now, Naruto has been training in order to prepare for the upcoming rematch of Zabuza. Naruto was practicing his unfamiliar white helted o katana with multiple slashes to inform his kenjutsu, with his other hand is a pitch black sheath with the decorations of a coiled dragon and a red knot at the base of the sheath. Turns out. It was Shiken no Rikjin. So after his moment with Kasumi and Mamiji and Sakura's training date. Focusing, he will need some training for the upcoming fight until he notices a too muffled signature of chakra nearby. Whoever this person was, he or she didn't want him to know his presence. He admitted that two people were good at hiding. But Haku and Shinji. Shinji and Haku walk into the clearing. As they saw Naruto training with his sword. After that they need some serious training. That must be him. Haku thought. Just as old man said. Shinji thought seeing Naruto perform multiple slabs. Whoa, this dragon nin is good. As he gazed at Haku with a nod each other, you know what to do? He advised, gazed at Haku. Hi. Haku replied. Until he and Haku turn their attention then they see Naruto sheathe his sword, then approaches the tree, then performs a batenjutsu. Hey Haku. This stance the dragon nin uses looks like a samurai stance. Shinji stated. Haku shook her head. It seems like it. But it's batenjutsu, but I don't know. But Naruto. Naruto gripped his sheathed with his hand on the inch of the hilt. Then suddenly there is a slashing glowing line coming from the moment the sword was unsheathing. In a blink of an eye Naruto swung the sword and cut the tree on a vertical angle. But the quick multiple slashes, then sheathed his sword with a click. Without knowing the blade that has to do with it. Until the tree started to fall on the side, then crashed on the ground. Which made Naruto smirked and satisfied from the result. Whoa, man, you sure are working hard out here. Shinji whistled with a surprising look as he was dressed without his dark blue coat and with a black shirt and black pants that had dragons on them. He was with Haku, who was wearing a pink yukata instead of her usual battle attire. Who are you two? Naruto asked. My name is Shinji, and this is Haku, what about you? Shinji asked with a grin. My name is Naruto Uzumaki Namikis. Naruto replied that before asking with a frown on his face. Anyway, what are you guys doing here? We were just going around, picking up herbs. Haku replied as she smiled at the boy. Which made Naruto keep his expression and asked with a smirk through his mask. Herbs for Zabuza I presume? As he knew he had uncovered both their true identities, which caused the duo to grit their teeth and get into a fighting stance. However, Naruto held his hand up. Don't worry about it. I don't want to fight, in fact I just want to talk. Naruto said, surprising them. Why do you want to talk rather than fight? Shinji asked, still on his guard in case this was a trap. Because there's no need for it. In fact, why don't we help you gather the herbs for him? Naruto said with a smile causing them confusion. Why are you being so nice to us? We're your enemy. Haku asked as they were picking up the herbs for Zabuza. Since Naruto found them days ago for healing ointment and poison. He decided to harvest them later. But Shinji helping out and starting. Yeah. We shouldn't avoid a dragon nin like you or your teammates. And even the black spider nin. I have a better question to ask. Why didn't you two attack me? You had the element of surprise, you easily could have killed me. Naruto asked. Well. Shinji started, but both he and Haku struggled to come up with an answer. You didn't want to cause trouble, all you wanted was to pick herbs peacefully for your friend and even act like normal children. I can see it in your eyes that you never had a good childhood, you were forced to become shinobus early in your childhood despite your wishes. 
Also, I bet you and Zabuza have been on the run for a while, looking for jobs to help you out, and this one is just one of many. In reality, you just want to live peacefully and thus why you didn't want to kill us, for the sake of being able to live in peace for just a few moments. Naruto said, tearing right into the very core of the two shinobis. Don't act like you understand us. You know nothing. At least you have friends and a village to live in, on the other hand Haku and I had no one but ourselves until Zabuza found us on the streets. Shinji yelled angrily. Found on the streets. Naruto repeated. Yes, on the streets. In the Kiri, a hatred for Bloodline users began to surface and then took full bloom after several battles between Bloodline users and the Mist Village. My parents were Bloodline users and died when I was only five as a Kagaya. Shinji growled with a glare before a bone came out his forearm. The Kagaya survivor. Naruto thought. They heard that they're extinct, but unlike the Uzumaki clan, few survivors remain. He noticed he had two dots on his head and his hair is white too. Shinji continued. I had to grow up in an orphanage and as soon as they found out I was a Kekai Genkai user, they kicked me out into the streets. I had to fend for myself for a while until Zabuza found me and this is when I met Haku. Her mother was killed by her own father and husband simply because she had a and he even was about to kill her if it wasn't for Haku's powers. Eventually, we were found by Zabuza who took us in, even when we told him of our bloodlines. He never once hated or feared us like those stupid villagers, and that is why we owe everything to him, and why you would never understand us. Maybe I can't understand you perfectly, but I want to understand both of you, and why I want you to stop this foolishness and come with us. Naruto pleaded, shocking them. Come with you? Haku and Shinji both asked. Yes. The path that you are both on will only lead you to death. Even if you survive this upcoming battle, you will eventually walk into a battle that you will never walk away from, and all this without enjoying the many things in life and even realizing your dreams. Stop this before it's too late and come with us, please. Joined the Hayabusa. Naruto once again pleaded to the two of them. We know that. But we can't. We owe Zabuza and everything, and we can't just abandon him even if we have dreams of our own. Haku replied with a sad smile. We have to go but the next time we meet, we will hold nothing back for the sake of our precious person. Shinji said. Or rather if I'll spare Zabuza as well, if he'll join too. Naruto added that it surprises them. You do? Shinji exclaimed about Naruto's seriousness. Yes, the Hayabusa could use someone like him with Suita Ninjutsu. Naruto replied. That way, the Kiri's hunter Nin will never hunt him down or if the two of you will not know about your Kekai Genkai. That made Haku and Shinji never thought someone was serious. Naruto wants them to join its ranks, as if he did so, so that they can't be shunned anymore. We'll do that, Naruto-san. Thank you. Haku appreciated and then both vanished into thin air. Naruto, who the hell were you talking to? Ryu asked as he walked into the clearing. Since he recovered from his lower back. The two accomplices of Zabuza. They came here to pick up some herbs for him, and so I talked to them. Naruto answered. Why didn't you alert any of us? Ryu asked. Because they're not bad people and they weren't for a fight. In fact, I asked them to come with us back home to join the Hayabusa village and also Zabuza as well. Naruto said. Really? So why? Ryu asked, surprised. I just don't want anyone else to die because of Gatu's greed and selfishness. Naruto replied. You're talking about Inari's stepdad, right? Ryu asked, getting a nod from his future brother-in-law. Ayan gave us details about what happened to him before she heard it from Tazuna-san after bringing Sakura to the team. Days later when the Konohan in Mina Sakura trained with skills and chakra until Naruto and Sakura return from training before Sasuke is attempting to spy on Naruto's training. But the blonde did knock him out. As Ayan gave them the briefing to Team Akuma and Tenshi about what happened to this land after Gato's ruled Nami no Kuni in the state from Tazuna. Yeah, his dad was killed by Gatu's men and caused the child to withdraw into a state of anger, but that's not the only reason why I wanted them to come with us. Naruto explained as he reminisced of the story of Kaiza, Inari's hero who was humiliated and killed by Gatu because the man dared to stand up against the greedy businessman. What's the reason? Ryu asked intrigued. Because they remind me of myself when I was little. Naruto said and then started to walk away. Um, I see what you mean. Anyway, we prepared for anything. Ryu said. Naruto nodded. As that, and they're off. Later tonight, Naruto brought Sakura back to Tazuna's house with another intense training session. Until the Ichiha attempt to come in, he got his training, seriously. Until Kurunai came in. Oh, you're back, Sakura. So how was your training? Kurunai persisted to teach Sakura Jinjutsu. Her chakra control is impressive. Also she needs to improve her to jutsu as well. It's fine. Naruto-kun did help me with my new training regiment with my unique chakra control. Sakura explained. That made Sasuke curious of what kind of regiment she was learning, he will find out more. Kurunai frowned about it. 
But the best to see it for what it was, as she gazed at Naruto. What sort of training? It's classified. Naruto replied. Why not? Kurinai asked. Let's just say, the power of my blow has no equal. Naruto replied. That made Kurinai frown. She can't tell what she meant. Right until Sasuke prepared for another demand, until Naruto will extract his hidden blade before he senses him, until. Why do you guys bother to try so hard? No matter how hard you train, you're still no match for Gato's men. No matter what glorious claims you make or how hard you work, the weak will only end up getting killed. Inari shouted at the group during dinner, his eyes burning with hatred, looking at the Konoha ninja gathered around the dinner table, before Naruto returned Sakura to their team until Inari's outburst. Hearing Inari's words, Kakashi lose his reading, and Kurinai quickly lost a grin on her face, Hinata stared intently at him, Sakura's mouth thinned into a small line, but immediately the atmosphere turned tense when Naruto looked at the boy, matching his glare with an icy gaze. What is your problem, kid? Kiba asked. Why do we bother trying so hard? No matter what we do, we're gonna get killed by Gato's men. Are you an idiot? Naruto whispered in a cold tone, his icy gaze intensifying with every second passing. Everyone was unable to speak, never had any of them seen the blonde act like this. Inari was able to find his voice to retort, though it was in a shaky tone. I told you that it's hopeless. K. Kaiza was my hero, he told me that heroes exist and that you would be able to follow your dreams if you worked hard enough. But he died, Gato killed him. He was the hero of the wave, the person I dreamed of being. If Gato killed him, you guys aren't going to be able to beat him. Inari was sniffling now, rubbing his eyes as tears made their way down his cheeks. There are no heroes. Naruto replied that it caused Inari to be shocked. We maybe became heroes, we're trained ninjas. For your information, Gato is nothing but a coward for using money to buy everything he desires. There is nothing more to it when he hires mercenaries. Does that make him powerful? Just shut up. Inari snapped, just looking at you makes me sick. You don't know anything about this country. Always laughing and playing around, you don't know what it's like to suffer and be treated like dirt. You know nothing of what anyone here has ever dealt with. Naruto, who kept his cool up until now, couldn't take it anymore even from a child. Shut up. This got Nari frightened, as he grabbed him by collar and lifted him up, that made the Konoha ninja see how fast he goes. Kakashi sudden felt a deja vu before, when his sensei was alive. So fast. Team 7 and 8 thought, minus Kakashi and Sakura. Plus a jealous Ichiha seeing his speed. What kind of power is that? Ichiha sneered. That looks like. A disbelieving Kakashi seeing that speed before. Naruto said to Inari with an angry expression, until seeing his eyes became golden slits and tints of red that made the boy more frightened. You think you know what suffering is, kid? What you've been through was simple everyday bad luck. You think you know everything about me? Well you don't. You think it's easy to assume you know people just by the way they act? You're just a person who knows nothing about what it's really like to go through hell. You've gone through it like I have, only then you can say what real suffering is like. Until then a whiny little coward like you has no place to judge someone like me. He looked at Inari with mixed emotions of anger, rage, and pain. Sakura went to him looking upset. Naruto-kun. You went too far. Naruto scoffed at his girlfriend, feeling he did nothing wrong, then tossed him into the floor that landed on his side and left before he got madder. Until the Konoha team seeing Naruto's eyes changed. What kind of ninjutsu is that? The genin wondered. Those eyes are just like. It can't be. Kakashi thought seeing those eyes before. Naruto-kun. She said with concern, until she felt a shoulder touch then seeing Aan appeared. Aan-san. Aan spoke with concern. Let him go Sakura, he'll be alright. Kakashi was surprised to see Aan come around. Aan-san, when did you? I've followed him whenever I want to be with him as his backup. Aan replied, getting a nod from Kakashi, he never noticed Aan was following him and Sakura. They heard everything. Both Team 7 and 8 watched Naruto leave in a huff before he left, until Aan stepped in, while Inari just whimpered trying not to accept what Naruto said about him. Then Aan of course she'll follow him if something goes wrong. Until before that, Aan spoke in. He had unlikely then Naruto comes when got his burden since Joe-sama brought him in. That surprises the Jinins, with Kakashi looking at Aan with disbelief and fear. Joe, as in Joe Hayabusa, the Shiori Rick, White Dragon. That made the Kanoha Jinins curious, until Kiba spoke. Who's Johei Abusa? Until Kurinai answered. I'd heard of him. He is a S-class ninja with a flea on side order and was the only ninja capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Yandame Sama. That surprises the genin minus Akura. Including self-proclaimed elite with his teeth gritted about someone like him became the strongest. Sensei's right. Sakura stepped in to get anyone's attention. 
S rank like Kishina Sama and even Sanadi Sama were shinobi in the highest rank in the bingo book, that means anyone can kill us all, without even trying not even Kakashi Sensei would stand a chance against Johei Abusa, and as Kurunai Sensei said that guy makes any shinobi to run away or fled in fear, and Jiraiya Sama or Kishina Sama is a cage level shinobi, plus everyone knows that shinobi from S rank on up in the bingo book you don't mess with, Sakura pulled out a book on her pouch. This is the bingo book, guys. Where did you get that, Sakura-san? Hinata asked to see this book in Sakura's hand. I brought it with me, it was given by someone. Sakura replied, before she was secretly trained by Jiraiya himself. After the training he's given the results of being a medical nin, if Jiraiya needs to find Tsunade and needs to know about Naruto. Makes sense. Any fresh out Genin needs to bring information for future uses. Shino's comment made Sakura not in agreement. Sakura opened it up and flipped through the pages till she got a Kakashi haddock, explained. Genin like me, Sasuke, Sai and teammate like you guys wouldn't even be considered bingo book material, Kakashi sensei however is look here he's listed as an A rank shinobi in A section. Hiba went to her, as the Rosette gave the book to him, and looking at the entree, showed a picture of Kakashi below the picture read out loud. Hiba couldn't believe that there was a picture and description of Team 7 sensei when he saw left eye kept covered. Does left eye kept covered mean a Sharingan? Sakura nodded and replied. Yes, it was implanted to the non-Achiha user and was given by his teammate that he is also an Achiha. That made Sasuke not understand from the information of how he got his clan's bloodline. Sakura continued. It means that whoever fraud him and lived then had added his status to the bingo book, doesn't know what his left eye looks like or why it's covered. As Sakura flipped some pages before she took the book from Kiba, then next was Johei Abusa and read it out loud. Everyone's eyes widened that Shiroi Ryu is the most powerful ninja in Hayabusa clan head, until Hinata heard the flea on sight asked. What does flea on sight mean? Also before the information was announced that made Sasuke severed his spine to remind of his brother slaughtering his clan. Bakashi explained. It means those that have flea on sight status you're to run away if you see him when facing Joe would be suicide, very few ever get the flea on sight status, my sensei Minato Namikas, Kishina Yuzumaki, Hanzo of the Salamander and Joe Hayabusa have that status. Wait. You mean that those dragon nin were completely no pushovers? Kiba said that Kakashi gave Kiba a nod as he slumped his shoulders. Those guys are the real deal. They are the real shinobi. As Ian spoke, the dog boy gazed at her, terrifying. That's correct, Inuzuka. We are the most experienced shinobi in Hayabusa when we were trained by my family members instead of a ninja academy. That only made Kiba speechless for he heard it from Kakashi during the fight against Zabuza. As Kiba looked down to Akamaru and advised. Remind me not to piss her or any of those girls, Akamaru. Of course. Akamaru barked and agreed. But you better. Comments amusingly as she turns to them before asking with a curious look. So. Did you know what happened to your village this time? That of course made the Kanohan in silent for the statement with tense. After what happened to their village was a totally complete mess, the kids disowned their parents for ignoring their late Yandame's wish. The kids were considered orphans, but few of them were left to the fire capital or taken by the fire daimyo samurais to separate them. The fire daimyo announced for giving the village a single B and or A rank missions in a month each when he gave 20 of the high rank missions to the Hayabusa village, the funds, and everything. And also they took many high ranks in the library on the shinobi side. The years have passed since the Kikbi attack, basically that they still haven't fully recovered from damage in the state. Without the currency to pay to repair the village to rebuild it. Even the so-called Kikbi festival as well is now cancelled permanently, so many tourists didn't go to Kanoha after the retribution from the announcement. The village won't be the same and peaceful anymore, also Kanahagakur no Sato won't be the strongest shinobi village as well. The village will now be the 100% easy target for Iwagakur or Kumagakur. As Kakashi heard, what if his sensei's son was alive the whole time? He completely upset Sandame for lying Kashina. After he heard Naruto was taken by Johei Abusa and his family and his team. As the copycat was supposed to keep an eye on him anytime for anything to happen to him when he was in Anbu. After he heard he was taken by the same Johei Abusa and his dragon nin to his home. And that includes his heritage. But many of his colleagues never let go of their hatred due to the deaths of their loved ones who were now suspended and had their chakra sealed and they learned. By using. Level 6 protocol. The level 6 protocol was used for prisoners who were too dangerous to be left unscathed before their trial. So they had most of their abilities sealed or directly removed. Now Kanoha will be the weakest, they are nothing but retards, without their Jinch Kriki, their military power and economic system. Until several incidents involving the children of their parents disowned by the kids. The parents tried to call them out with pleas and protests, but that only ended up by stabbing one of their eyes, suffering from blood loss or losing half of their sight. 
even they refuse to listen to their Hokage for their reason for lying and even lose respect for him. The sins of the villagers were completely downfall after the retribution. And even they refused to enroll in the ninja academy, but only a few of them, civilian or clan members. Now they lost the new generation to increase their strength before their strength reduced due to abuse and disregard. After the announcement from Fire Daimyo, many of the kids started to drift away from their parents because of the news that they told any of them to play or befriend the heir of Yuzunami clan. Until their 100% from the kids had remained or leave Konoha, 65% of the kids disowned them to depart to the fire capital, 40% departed from the village, and 25% left from the house as an orphan now, due to having listened to them. 30% remained in the village if they joined the shinobi corps, 9% enrolled to join, and 21% denied to join if they took forced labor jobs. 5% were staying with their parents for this reason. Until they went to the orphanage that owned by Sakura's parents to plead and refused and ignored to listen after the previous matron publicly executed that disregard their late Yandame's wish and includes half of the villagers and their former employees and comrades and or even every single one who had hurt Naruto was to be punished in front of everyone and they were whipped ruthlessly for their actions. None were spared despite the pleas the people had given out during the whippings, which went on for well over a week and had their family assets taken away to give to Naruto upon his departure to the Hayabusa. Every Konoha shinobi seen the condition of their village is just like Nami. Their children, like their former parents, were poor, feeding out of garbage cans and doing just about anything they could to survive. Now it's just like Naruto that he was forced to feed out of garbage cans. Also many of them for high rank shinobi were devoted and then forced to take 24-7 duty in the gate entrance and take numerous D rank or 1C rank missions. Leaving 20 or less junins remaining, they did regard the late Yandame's dying wish. But 15% committed suicide if any of them disregard their late Hokage's wish. As for Kurinai. She is the only rookie jonin when she got promoted after several shinins tried to enter the exams to promote their former ranks again, even many of them suspended. Along with Chunins were devoted back into the start as a Genin or Eternal Genin, they would have to participate in upcoming Chunin exams if they wished to earn their former rank once again. After the retribution, they closed down their business-like shops or stores and send them to the prison for 10 years of forced labor from the Hokage's orders that given by Kishina, the wreckage and the fire daimyo, then stripped their shops clean before many villagers had witnessed it, they're now replaced with the shinobi side only, the civilians were no right to speak to the shinobi, before the civilian council were very upset about it, the restaurants and groceries are now owned by the Akimichi clan. Also resources that they owned, with many of the villagers were forced labor, including the kids from the orphanage to work too. The poisons, herbs and medicine owned by Yamanaka and Nara clan. The weapons shops and forgery were owned by the Higurashi. With the shinobi side trusting two of only civilian councils that the rest tried to bribe them out of, their daughter is one a shinobi. The orphanage is owned by Haruno. They entrusted the shinobi side, which made the certain dark purple-haired banshee irritated. It's unfair for the Haruno family to own the orphanage. Now the orphanages had 30% from the children were staying. Now the shinobi side had reclaimed and owned academy now, since it was the civilian council's fault for pushing their children to become like this when they want to increase their strength, but without the funds that they paid half worth of money to the Hayabusa village and include they spoiled one Sasuke. Itcha. They can't believe that Kanoha is crippled from this state with bad shape. Even they disregard the dying wish of their beloved Yandame Hokage. Three years later many villagers were forced to labor any of them, then slept in their prison cell with their inmates for 10 years. As for the hospital. Naruto had numerous reports of his condition. How many nurses or doctors who refused to treat Naruto are now fired and tortured or forced labor within 10 years, leaving 20 or less employees from there in regard to Yandame's late wish. But, without the slug princess Tsunade due to her depression from her past, let's hope she'll explode when she will demolish Konoha, she is a walking time bomb. If Yureya told her. Now many of the patients were completely full from the state. With a certain someone, each of their attacks was recorded in these files, since the leader of the hospital was a friend of the certain whisker boy. She was very protective of him and hid his report away, so no one could find it. Now she is the new head of the hospital after their previous head were imprisoned before Tsunade left. And even the sister of a burnt pink hair man and also the friend of Kashina, also the last living student of Tsunade. Without a drought, back to the bridge builder's place, Tazuna knew what happened to Konoha is just like his village, with Kakashi a little bit hesitant to speak in to answer Aan's question, a bit nervous. The everything is fine, as serious. Things are quite normal. He said with a nervously chuckled. Aan frowned, suspicious about it, and she was told by Kashina about Konoha's punishment and downfall. So, I take it that it's the worst. Well. If you say so. Aan replied with a slight tone, then disappeared with Shunshin, leaving everyone silent.
Out in the forest, Naruto drew his rick in taking any frustration he had out on some trees. Soon after an hour of training he stood surrounded by fallen trees that had been cut out, panting with his body covered in sweat. There I needed that. He finally calmed down. It's better. A voice came in, which made Naruto smile to turn his attention to see Aan come in as she tosses the bottle of water before catching it, then drinks it. How are you feeling? Better. Naruto replies, crunches the container, and is a bit disappointed. I know I was a little harsh on that kid, but I guess sometimes being harsh is the only way to get through to someone as stubborn as he was. This kid needs to grow up. Aan stated. No matter how much he suffered for the loss of his stepfather Tazuna-san told me everything. He rested on a log before sheathed his rickon with Aan joined in. Well. As a matter of fact. Sooner or later, we'll be prepared. Until Aan flinches when she wants Naruto to know with a sly face. That reminds me. What? As Aan was about to answer and said. Well. About Konoha. What Naruto gained was interesting. Let's hear it. Next day early 4.45 am, at the campsite of the Rickonin group, early in the morning. As Naruto and Aan geared up to prepare to kill Gat, then followed with Tsuki and Ryu, lastly Kasumi and Mamiji. Now with Naruto strapped to Rickon, Dragon Sword on his backside and Shiken no Rickon on his belt, able to use dual wield, adjusting one of his arm guards along with the hidden blades, good thing the smith's able to create a second, so two blades, Aan had her fumicotichus on her back of her waist. With Ryu and Tsuki's tent, Ryu had Shinken no Rickon, Divine Dragon Sword, on his backside, strapped. And Tsuki tightened Akarashi strapped on her backside too, then her cottages on her thighs on both sides. With Kasumi and Mamiji prepared as well. The tension brunette strapped her Wakizashi, the Hikari no Hanana, the flower root of the light. And the brunette maiden strapped her Tenric, Heavenly Dragon, Najinata on her back. Now they are now outside their tents with their briefing before placing calm links. As Naruto announced. Alright. This is it. Now let's see if we need to get everything ready. I agreed, well Kanohanin was around. Ryu stated. And also they had the copy Katarichiha that he hadn't awoken his Sharingan, yet. That made the girls and Naruto not agree with Ryu. So what will we do when we have the anti genjutsu seals that Sakura-sen gave us? Kasumi wondered for some ideas. That only made Aan tensed for she didn't not realize one thing that was also from the Heibusa village. I think I know. That made everyone look at Aan when Mamiji asked. What is it, Aan-san? We would have to use that, since we haven't used it when we're trained. Aan answered, that made their eyes widen from everyone. Tsuki's eyes widened for what Aan was saying, then realized. You mean. Yup. Aan replied. Lamiji spoke for what Aan concluded. Wait. You're telling us that. We haven't used it first in battle. Aan replied, that made Naruto smile. Aan-chan. You're a genius. Naruto praised his angel. That made Aan smile brightly. Ni-chan's right. Kasumi agreed. We didn't use it in battle, it's our village's secret arts. So Sharingan no Kakashi or the Achiha will not able to learn our secrets by using their Sharingan to copy them. Even Sakura-chan's to Jutsu. Naruto added that getting a nod from Kasumi. So. Let's settle. Ryu declared. We will split up for sure. I agreed, Ryu. Naruto replied simply. Me and Aan will remain here heading to Tazuna's house. Knowing that the midget will send two or more goons to kidnap his daughter and grandson to use it as a bargain chip. And the rest of us will assist Konohan in. Ryu added, getting a nod from Naruto confirmed. As the blonde turns to his future brother-in-law. Ryu. I will put you as my right hand man in charge of this team. Naruto declared. And then. Wait for the spider nins to appear. That made Ryu and the girl surprised minus Aan and Tsuki. Mamiji asked. Are you sure, Naruto-kun? I'm serious. Naruto replied. And they maintain. Myself and Aan-chan were each of us as a leader of Team Akuma Tenshi. But we will give you back up until it's clear. That made his team not agree, until Aan exclaimed. Alright, it's now or never, and we will get our job done. And move out. As the Reknin group disappeared via Shunshin. Of Kanoha group, the Kashi and Team 7 arrived at the bridge, only to gasp in shock as Tazuna's workers were lying on the ground. With Team Tenshi and Akuma on their backs, minus their leaders, Naruto and Aan. They are waiting for Gato and the Spider Nins to arrive. What happened here? Tazuna asked around. Those guys were monsters. One of the workers who was laying on the ground said, it can't be. Kakashi thought, just before a thick mist appeared to cover the bridge. Kakashi and Kurinai nodded, before turning to the genin. Just as Naruto informed them. Everyone, stay frosty. Hinata, can you use your Byakugan? Kurinai informed them. Hinata nodded and activated it. She focused as the mist thickened even more. It's hard because of the chakra in the mist. But I think there are. At least five of them I can see. She said, Team, they're coming. Protect Azuna-san. He yelled. The two groups formed around the bridge builder in the defensive pose. 
Bakashi sensei, this is his Kuridakur no Jutsu, isn't it? Sakura asked, but got no answer. They were all waiting for Zabuza to show himself. And then an evil and familiar laugh echoed through the mist. Sorry to keep you waiting, Kakashi, Kurinai. And you're still carrying those kids. Zabuza's voice sounded as Sasuke began to tremble. He's shaking again, how pitiful. Zabuza mocked. Within a second of that remark, the group was surrounded by seven water clones. Sasuke smirked. I'm shaking with excitement. Zabuza frowned and asked. Where is that dragon nin? I want a rematch for humiliating me. Who cares for those lowlife? I will take you on. Sasuke said. I'm afraid you are not interested in me, brat. I want the dragon nin rematch. Zabuza stated. Which made Sasuke growl to deny the challenge. Later to Zuna's home, Tsunami screamed out as she was thrown from her home by one of Gato's mercenaries, two of them had quickly run up and grabbed her by her arms, not caring how she felt, and a third emerged carrying her son by the back of his t-shirt. She then heard one of them say, the boss said we only need the woman, so what should we do with this little shrimp here? But before any of them could even say a word the one holding the child was struck in the head by an unknown object that was preceded by a loud bang, his comrades watched in shock as his body hit the ground, headless. Until they saw Naruto and Aan appear. The rest were terrifying because they did not know the dragon nin was still around. Aan Grabbed Tsunami and Inari inside. Naruto ordered. Getting a nod in Shunshin and grabbing Tsunami and grabbing Inari inside the house. Why you little? With interruption, a blur appeared behind the mercs as he slowly sheathed his dragon sword then with a click. Then a complete silence with the wind blowing in the dock. Until Naruto almost sheathed his sword closed, slowly, and Click. The merc's blood sprayed from sword wounds on the thugs as each of them fell over dead in bloody puddles. Naruto walks towards the front door and opens it to see Tsunami hug her son with Aan behind her. Are you alright? Naruto asked, which got attention from Tsunami and Inari. Stay hidden and be sure you guys remain. As Naruto was about to leave he headed to the bridge before summoning two cage bunshin. Aan-chan, let's go. Aan nods understanding as they are about to depart until Inari called. Wait. Betting them to turn attention. As Inari said. I'm. I'm sorry about yesterday. I was a coward for letting Ka Santa get kidnapped, it will be like Kaiza did. It's alright, Inari. You did have to do it. Naruto replied. But stay here and my clones will protect you too. Inari nods as Naruto and Aan disappear with a gust of wind. Inari remained standing and declared. I want to fight too. As Inari went inside and armed himself before asking his mother. Chapter 9. Wave Part 2. End of Gatton's Terror. With Naruto and Aan, when the two dragon in heading towards the bridge. As they jumped through trees. Seems I was right. Zabuza was being double crossed. Naruto exclaimed. I know, Naruto kun. Aan replied. We better get to the bridge. And otherwise, the spider ninja would arrive. So they jumped faster to get to the bridge. At the incomplete bridge time skip. Ha! Ah. So the big bad demon of the mist has been defeated by a bunch of Konoha, with most of them being mere brats. I should have known your reputation didn't match up to your skills. You are all hype Zabuza. A little baby demon thinking he has the biggest stick to swing. Gato mocked as he had appeared with his army of bandits behind him and all itching for a fight to earn their cash. But swords and spears etc. There are 400 men with him. So you were going to backstab us? The rumors were true. Zabuza snarled as he had been told by Haku and Shinji about the dragon nin they met in the forest region and about what Gato did regarding weakened shinobi after a fight. In front of Zabuza was Kakashi, who had been ready to hit the man with a rakiri, and Kurunai using behind him with her kunai in hand under his throat and the other on the man's wrist, holding the man's giant sword. His injuries had been extensive with the two Jounin teaming up against him, while Haku and Shinji did battle with the six Jounin not that far off. Sakura was pretty rough against Shinji. So what if they are? Ninjas are expensive. I shouldn't have to pay for a few of you when buying in bulk and cheap is a much better investment. Especially if the ninjas in question are too damn weak to fight back against my boys here and too stupid to see a trap when it is staring them right in the face. Besides, a missing nin such as yourself is a liability and the fact you even went to me for a job was a mistake on your part. Gato countered with a grin on his face while looking at the downed form of Haku, who had been pinned down by the combined strength of the six genin and sneered at her for breaking his arm at their little hideaway. Also Shinji slowly stood, weakening after the fight against the Kanoha nin. But speaking of swords, there were also armed with axe with dot sights, or dual mags, or a cog scopes, MP4KS, UMP45s, AK-102, it's now loaded with 5.56x45 mm NATO rounds in MGS4, with any attachments like dot sight or cogs. Along with sidearms like M9s and Glocks. What are those things? Kiba asked. Listen guys, some dragon nin told me about those. Sakura advised. Since she was told by Naruto or Ryu about those weapons. 
Why? Kiva wondered. It's completely familiar to us. Whatever you do, don't get hit by those weapons. No matter what or your life will be gone before you know it. Sakura said while she glared. Everyone looked at the strange way those men held the gun in their hands. Their hand on some kind of trigger while there was a small hole in the opening of it. While they holding it in both hands. Sakura, what is it? Can you tell us? Shino asked, and this was what Sakura was afraid of, her fellow Kanohinin's lack of knowledge about this. It was too different for the men the outside of the elemental nations that they wouldn't know what was dangerous and what wasn't. It's called a gun, everyone, and just like a kunai, it really will kill you if it hits the right spot. Sakura said while Kakashi narrowed his eyes. Sakura took that to heart immediately. So needless to say, but she was more than ready. Along with everyone, Sasuke heard about a certain weapon that might be useful for himself. If I got those weapons. Then I need some time to figure out how it works. Until they heard someone through the mist. Not as bad as yours. I fear. Naruto replied with the mist clearing fully and was seen on the edge of the side railing of the bridge with Rikken in his hands, with the Konoha ninja getting tense at the side of him. Along with Aan. Who are you? Gato asked with Naruto looking at him calmly and got off the side of the bridge railing before walking toward the tiny little man. As Naruto snapped his fingers as Ryu, Suki, Kasumi and Mamiji arrived, Gato was shocked because he did not expect more backup arrived. Those spider nin were right after all. Gato was irritated. You were after my head. That's right, Gato. Your reign of terror is over. Naruto said. Ha. You don't scare me. I got my bodyguards to take care of you. Gators mocked as the spider nins appeared, their group in 200. Armed with swords and claws. You and your team keep those kids and their senses safe. Naruto ordered. Hi, Naruto-kun. Ayan replied. Good thing Naruto and his team showed up but he wasn't alone, Tenshi was also there. As until Sakura stepped in before eating a soldier pill. Kakashi wondered about this. Until Sakura dispelled her, that caused Kakashi and Kurinai to be shocked and surprised to see the real Sakura. Along with Sasuke, Sai and teammate about their fellow genin. Now they were all wearing their battle gear. Naruto charged in with his riken and began to cut down the mercs. He was doing fine until he encountered one of the spider nins. He jumped and kicked the spider in the head. The spider nin countered by throwing an exploding shuriken at him. Naruto caught it and threw it into the water. This gave the spider nin a chance to pull out his weapon. Both dragon and spider nins were in heated combat and everyone who wasn't fighting watched in awe. Now Naruto will attack the armed mercs before sheathing his riken. As he took out the shiken no riken, fang of the dragon god, on his right hip with his right hand. As he dashed them at high speed. He was slowly approaching them with shiken no riken in his hand. The five of them decided to open fire at one. Naruto saw the bullets flying to him very clearly, so he dodges some and deflects some with his sword. Then he charged forward and muttered. Hide Mitsurugi. But that he charged at one of the mercs with ridiculous speed and used Ryukansen. Tsumuji to drill a hole in mercenary's body, killing him. Then he felt a shot from behind and saw another was shooting at him. He jumped up high in the air, then used Ryutsusen. Zan stabbed Poncho in his forehead killing him instantly. After that he rushed to the direction of another merc and used Soryuden to cut him in half. The other two mercs were scared of Naruto's skill such they decided to retreat. But Naruto used Shukuchi and appeared in front of the in a blink of an eye. Naruto charged at the first merc and used Haiden Yujin Zan to cut and blow the merc away because of the force of the attack. As for the last decided to take out a grenade that they carries explosives to throw at Naruto, but he was too late as Naruto used Hiryusen to shoot a Rikjin sword from its sheath at huge speed and force. This strike forced the last mercenary to drop the grenade and detonate himself. Naruto turned back when the grenade exploded. He has the same cold expression. Sakura went into her fighting stance. She cut down many of the merc with no problem, that is until she fought one of the spider clan. She uppercut him into the air where she met him with a devastating kick to the stomach. As the nin fell to the ground she grabbed him and started to spin him around. As they fell the speed of the spin increased until they reached the floor, she let go and he hit the floor full force killing him. She was about to go on with the attack when another spider nin came and attacked her. She was sent flying but quickly recovered. Until Sakura rolled eyes and saw another spider in that performed a kamikaze attack. As the Rosette closed her eyes and focus her mind and body. But the scene changing into a view of his eyes that the camera moves to the right side that stops her left eye. Then her eye snaps open with a quick zoom that changes the scene into a white screen. Until a kanjus appeared in each letter and complete sequence. I am invincible. Sakura began his chant. My shadow skills are unmatched. Sakura raised his fist. The power of my blow has no equal. Then he raised his fist in the air that his fist engulfed with silver light. Now Sakura is in the air by jumping high, performing a forward somersault. Karuta Rick Kasapo. Karuta style annihilation techniques. But her leg is engulfed with wide energy and a dive kick at the spider nin. Sword. 
until the spider nin got cut into half by Sakura, now she was regretting herself for taking the first kills. Which made Kurenai understand about the hint. Tsuki fighting against mercs were armed with firearms. As she deflected them with her mother's sword, Aka Rashi. As she releases small crescent-shaped wind blades at the mercs they barely have all struck by the attack. Blood spurts from their injuries and some lose their limbs or are killed instantly. As she spins her sword that kills them. Until she felt five mercs aim their firearms at her as Tsuki quickly grabs the fallen merc and before they fire those guns and then she uses that body as a shield, now the barrage of bullets hits the body. As the mercs stopped firing they were shocked to see Tsuki using their fallen comrade as a shield. Then Tsuki sheathed her sword, then dropped the body and waved her hands around as if she were performing a spell, which was exactly what her clan's Keke Genkai was. As she was surrounded by fire circling with kanjis floating around her. Their ninpo was a variant on ninjutsu but more like senjutsu, considered to be ninja magic by many. By tapping into and manipulating natural energy and spiritual energy, every dragon nin can create a unique nature type that cannot be copied by normal ninjas so easily. For example, the ninpo he conjured was a fire release but a unique one. It harnessed and conjured dragon flames. It was known as the art of the flame dragon. Other ninja known to use their own variants of ninpo are the black spider clan however. Dean Ryu no jutsu. Art of flame dragon inferno, Tsuki spoke in her native language activating her flames as five large fireballs directed towards the remaining mercenaries, setting the area they hit on fire. The mercenaries all soon fell over, screaming in agony as they soon silenced and died. As Tsuki drew her nadachi and saw two spider nins charging straight at her. Ryu was fighting with precision and power, he would take out four or more mercs with one attack. He jumped up and did four front flips, with his sword extended moving forward, as he finished a rotation he would take out four merc and one spider nin. When he landed he was hit by four legs into the air. He quickly recovered and used that attack to use his ninpo attack, as he waved and gestured his hands. Ayakuriduchi no jutsu. Art of Inazuma 100 Thunder Hammers, which created an electric storm around his body, after which the buildup would break free, so he jumped and sent tentacles of electricity down at the enemies killing them instantly. Dean Tenshi was next to Kanoha Nin, Mina Sakura when she joined the fight, as a backup if they were needed. Their job was to collect information which they did. That is what their team was created for, it was a behind-the-scenes part, and Team Akuma were the main actors which they played beautifully. Beside them were the Kanoha. Kura and I couldn't believe how ruthless these teenagers were. Bakashi was right. They are ruthless. She said, as she turned to Ayan. Excuse me, Ayan san Is this how a true shinobi is liked? That's right, that is our way of the ninja. Ayan answered. But Sasuke on the other hand looking at the strange technique in interest, he tried to copy it with his Sharingan, but to his frustration, it couldn't. What's with those, and why can't I copy it? He thought angrily. Also Sakura as well. He was unable to do so. So if he will demand her to do so after this. And even Naruto's. The height Mitsurugi. Of Kakashi, on the other hand, refusing to copy the dragon nin skills, he was distracted to see a certain blonde dragon ninja killing those mercs and spider nins. Naruto was having the time of his life never having been challenged with fighting with the spider nin. It was obvious that he was the leader of this squad. He moved to hit the spider nin, but he countered with his sword. Both swords locked together trying to gain superiority over the other. Both fighters were evenly matched, but the spider nin elbowed Naruto in the side, making him lose his balance, and the sword came down hitting him in the arm, but Naruto did not scream he was used to the sting of the blade. He slowly removed the blade from his arm and charged the spider nin, which was now unarmed. He couldn't do anything to defend himself, he thought he had beaten Naruto because he had hit his main arm, but soon found out that his offhand was just as effective as his main. Naruto sliced through the spider nin's head vertically. The last thing the spider nin saw was Naruto split in two before he fell to the ground dead. Naruto using the Hyde Mitsurugi style was cutting the mercs down like they were nothing. Sakura was using her style, slicing the merc as if they were cattle at a slaughterhouse. Rai using his father's sword and Suki using her mother's sword were fighting the enemy up close and personal. They weren't getting as many kills as their teammates, but their kills were still pretty high. Zabuza and Kakashi were having the time of their lives. It had been a long time since these two had a good battle. The battle lasted a good 10 hours, Sasuke was furiously about they had to kill, he had hardly ever entered the battle and had not killed anyone yet. He has become more jealous during their encounter and meeting. The mate was faring far better than originally thought. Hinata had killed at least 140 mercs by herself. At the end of it all there were only 200 men left and Gato who had been captured as he tried to leave the battlefield. The fight itself lasted for a good 18 hours, and everyone was in awe as one team of three teenagers, plus Sakura, killed over 600 mercs and nins, with Gato being terrified that his men and bodyguards were killed. As Naruto glanced at Gato, he almost ran away. 
as took out his father's kunai, a three-pronged kunai. Shocked by Kakashi, he recognized the kunai. It can't be. That's. Kakashi was about Naruto holding one of his senseis. As he swiftly tossed the kunai straight at Gato, before the midget saw it, then ran as fast as he could before he could get on his yacht. Until the kunai was only a few feet in its range. And then. All sound, Edo saw a shadowing figure in front of him in the air, telling that someone prepared to get himself killed, as he heard a voice in the cold. As Gato turned in slow mode, eyes widened to see Naruto cocked his right arm, then a blade came out his gauntlet. But it's too late to plead and. Stab. Naruto stabbed him in the back, on his heart, as Gato is kneeled down. Then the blonde dragon nin removes the blade, then it slides down. The reign of tyrant is over. Naruto declared to dead Gato, as he drew his rick in and. Slash. He cuts Gato's neck clean through his shoulders. As he's head rolling down on the ground. As Naruto picked his head and showed it to Tizuna. Which made the old coot shed a tear of joyfulness. As the merc saw the horror of their meal ticket was now dead, so they dropped their weapons and fled towards the yacht. So until Ryu quickly grabbed onto the mercs. And you had to tell us, where is Gato's hideout? Ryu said to the merc while strangling, which made the merc terrifying for him. Alright, alright. I'll tell you where Gato's hideout. Good. Ryu said, as he lifted him up and tied him up. As they managed to walk away with little and no injuries, with one of the mercs in tow, well except for Naruto whose arms were still bleeding from the stab wound. Sakura ran to his side to nurse the wound, along with Aan and Kasumi also went to his side to help. Naruto you idiot, how many times have I told you not to overdo it, but do you ever listen to me? Aan scolded him. And don't do that, as well. Sakura added. I know Aan-chan, Sakura-chan. I know. He replied with his eyes rolled. Good. Aan said. But that's what I love it about you though. She gave him a small kiss on the lips. Causes Sakura and the girlfriends of Naruto, Mamiji and Kasumi admitted. I can help him. Sakura said, as she formed a single hand seal and her hand started to glow and place them on his arms. You too, Ryu-kun. Tsuki said. Yeah, after all. You still own me for my back cramp. Rai replied, causing Tsuki to be embarrassed for what she had forgotten. As Naruto glanced at those guns lying there, he called. Kasumi-chan. Yes. Kasumi asked. Can you hold Gato's head? Naruto insisted. Why? She asked. Me, Ryu and Aan-chan will confiscate those guns Gato had gotten. Naruto answered, which made Ryu and the rest of the team tense about those weapons Gato had brought to the black market. So without hesitation, with a nod from Kasumi, she took his head by the hair to hold it. And me? Mamiji asked. You will accompany Sakura-chan to treat the wounded. Naruto answered. Hi. They replied, as Naruto handed the tyrant's head to Kasumi, then Mamiji and Sakura went to Konoha. Naruto got up and walked over along with Aan and Ryu, and the blonde created 100 cage bunshin and took out a large black and white scroll via a small storage scroll and laid it in the ground before they took the guns and sealed them. Sasuke saw this and demanded it. What do you all think you're doing? Naruto replied, ignoring looking at him. We're confiscated these weapons. Sasuke walked over to the guns, a Alaska or pistol, Naruto and his team had taken and reached for one, either an assault rifle or an SMG, as if he was slammed by one of Naruto's clones. Give me one of those weapons. As in Ichiha I have the right to them. Sasuke is furious, struggling. Naruto who had just finished pulling the last guns and replied. No. All the guns are engulfed with smoke, as they are now on the large storage scroll. As he rolled it and created a lock seal to prevent anyone from falling in wrong hands. Now Sasuke was completely mad for those guns. As the clone disappeared, the breeding brat stood. You'll pay. Sasuke or charged straight in blind rage and took out his kunai. Sakura and five of the dragon bins were not too impressed by the Ichiha's behavior. Big. Mistake. They thought when Sasuke was about to kill him. Until. Naruto flashed and punched Sasuke toward his next target as he flashed again. Sasuke was a pinball stuck in a world of hurt. A punch to the face, another to the ribs, a knee to the groin, another to the face, one to the back, an uppercut to the jaw, a kick to the knee, a punch to the shoulder joint, another to the other knee, one more to the other shoulder and finally a clothesline dropping him to the ground battered, bruised and having trouble breathing. Ryu, Suki, Mamiji, Kasumi were told about how they bashed Sasuke in a bloody pulp. Sakura and Aan looked at him with pride. Kakashi and Kurenai were disappointed about how Sasuke let his anger get to him. Kiba was completely stunned by how brutal those dragon nin were. Hinata, on the other hand, was completely nervous. Shino, on the other hand, had witnessed that brutal fight. Hey. A voice shouted and everyone looked to where it came from and saw Inari, Tsunami and good people of the wave with weapons in their hands. Are we late? Yeah, you were a kid. Naruto said to Inari with a smirk on his face. And look what we got. He looked at Kasumi with a nod, signaling that the brunette Kinoichi held Gato high above her so that everyone could see it. 
Soon the people of the wave started as Gata Rain finally ended. The wave was finally free, and it's all because of the group of heroes of the dragon. Thanks for listening. I do hope you enjoy it. If you want the next part of this video. Turn on that bell notification. Like subscribe and comment down below. And also check out the others videos. I have created and enjoyed it. See you guys next video.